Hi, my name is Pratik Naren and in this tutorial we will be quickly revisiting many fundamental concepts associated with data structures like arrays, dynamic arrays, linked list, stack, queue, hash map, priority queue and much more. Not just that, we will be also exploring Java's collection framework to use these data structures in solving problems and building real software. We will do many hands-on examples that will solidify your understanding of these concepts. But before we get started, make sure to check out free masterclasses on Scalar's event page to learn from the best industry leading experts. The link is in the description below. Also make sure you hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. All right, so let's begin with the tutorial. Let us start by revisiting the concept of a data set. A data structure is a meaningful way of arranging and storing data inside the memory of the computer that is your RAM. Okay, we are not talking about your physical memory. We are talking about your volatile memory in which your algorithm will execute and it will do some certain operations like insertion, deletion, searching and removal of data. We have different data structures and they are optimized for different kind of operations that we can do and different kind of orderings we can do on that data, right? So some of the data structures you might have heard about arrays, stacks, queues, hash tables, trees and graphs. Every data structure has its own uh, properties, own way of ordering data, own way of implementing these operations. We'll try to understand how these data structures are different and how we can use them in Java as well. Broadly speaking, they are divided into two categories. We have linear data structures. We have non-linear data structures. There is one more category, I would say we have associative data structures in which we store data in the form of key value pairs. For example, your hash maps. We will talk about hash maps later in this course. Those linear data structures, they can be of fixed size, like a fixed size array, or they can be dynamic. That means they can grow and shrink in size. For example, your array list, your link list, your stack, your queue. In non-linear data structures, we might have data structures which have a hierarchical structure. For example, your trees also have data structures which have network like data structure. For example, this is a very high level overview of how data structures are classified. But let us start by revisiting the importance of data structures in our real life. So suppose you go to a grocery store and you find everything is disorganized. Then it would become very difficult for you to search for a given item. But if your items are organized across racks and categories, you will easily find a particular item that you're looking for, right? So keeping data organized makes certain operations like your searching faster, right? Similarly, if you go to tickets and if there is no queue, then it would be very unfair for the people to wait randomly, right? But if people are organized on the basis of their priority, the person who is coming first and he's getting the uh, queue ticket first, then it is called as FIFO ordering, right? Similarly, in data, we might require FIFO ordering. So Q is a data structure that provides us with this kind of a ordering, right? And let us look at one more example. Sometimes I go to a restaurant and I say, okay, I want to order a burger. Right? Then I quickly get an answer that the burger cost is rupees 100. What is happening for every item? There is a value attached to it, right? So for every key, there is a value, right? So the data can might be stored in the form of key value pairs. And this is where some other data such as like hash maps come into the picture, right? Another example could be that if I'm on my system and I'm locating certain files, right? I know that, okay, in this folder, I have kept this kind of a data in this folder. I've kept my PDFs in this folder, in this drive, I've kept my pictures, right? So what is your file system? The file system is a tree like structure. You start with your, my computer, you go to your drive, then you go to certain folders and you find the files that you're looking for, right? You do not organize this data in the form of hierarchy and if so I'll search the whole computer, it would be very inefficient for you and you will spend a lot of time searching for a given file, right? So the file system is also an example of a tree like data structure. So that means we use data structures a lot in our daily life in building software applications. So in real world also the meaningful structuring of items helps businesses operate efficiently. We saw the example of grocery store. So similarly, data structures allow us to execute certain operations like insertion, deletion, searching updates on the data very efficiently. And that this data is stored inside the memory of the computer. Now, depending on the problem that we are trying to solve, we select a suitable data structure that fulfills our requirements. 
this is the goal of this video in this lecture we are going to understand how according to different requirements what data structure we will use and we will look at its implementation using java collections framework right now you might ask okay that's data structure what is an algorithm then algorithm is the main logic it is the step by step unambiguous set of instructions for solving a problem right we can define algorithms for real life scenarios like making a pack of noodles you might say okay take a pan put two cups of water inside it boil something something that list of instructions is an algorithm to make a pack of noodles or maybe something complex like if we want to play a ludo game or if i want to make an algorithm that suggests the best photo out of a set of photos we can devise an algorithm for that as well. so in real world from every uh, every deterministic action for example your washing machine a self driving car all the actions your machines are taking that can also be expressed using an algorithm right in the software world all the apps that you are using photo editing app scrolling instagram browsing netflix uh, in a cargo hub sorting of shipments detecting collisions in games transferring money through uapi ordering food there is an algorithm behind every action that we perform so that is why it is very important for us to learn data structures and algorithms right and when we combine data structures along with the algorithms we build products that can solve real life problem that is an importance of data structures and algorithms i will start with arrays let us start with the array which is the simplest and the most widely used data structure so i am hoping most of you have must have worked with an array what is an array array is a linear collection of elements of the same type so this is true for java other languages like python they also support heterogeneous arrays that means you can put different number different types of data for example integer string float inside one array arrays are used to store multiple values in a single variable so let's say this is a container which is linear that means it will occupy linear block of memory for example if this address is 104 and this bucket takes four uh, four bytes then the next address will be 108 next address will be 112 right so it is a linear block of memory right? and this whole block of memory has a single name right and each element if i want to access it can be accessed using an index the indexing starts with 0 so i can say okay i want to put something at array of 0 then i will say array of 0 it, it is 4 if i want to overwrite it i will say okay array of uh, 3 it's going to be 20 so i can just overwrite this data and it will keep 20 here right each array location is accessed using an index the indexing starts from 0 that is what we have just seen it so you have the array name followed by the index this is how you access the ith location inside an array right now uh, let us look at some examples of an arrays for example if i want to create an array of strings in which i'm calling the variable as bill payments so i have uh define three strings electricity mobile and credit card right and i have an array of numbers i have defined four numbers here i have int followed by square brackets followed by name of the array this is a very simple way of creating an array but you can also create an array of fixed size where you have not given your data right in the previous scenario we have not defined the size size will depend upon how many um items we have initialized in this list right so you can directly initialize or you can first create a fixed size block you can say okay i want an array that is able to hold five integers we'll use the new keyword followed by the data type and followed by the size so what happens it creates an array so if i talk about java the variable arr it most likely it goes into your dark memory and the actual array that we have this this is created in the deep memory right arr we call as a object reference arr is holding the address of this array arr is going to hold 104 arr is in the stack whereas this actual object it is in the deep memory now we are updating the data at the ith index we are actually storing 10 20 30 40 50 and 50 here this is how you create an array and all the array objects they have a length property added to it so if you say okay this is a cars area and i want to say cars dot length this will give me okay how many objects are stored in this array or what is the size of this array this will give me four right the size of this array 
and using the length property i can also iterate over the arrays right so i can say okay let me go over every index from 0 till cars dot length that means i'm iterating from 0 1 2 3 the length is 4 so i'm iterating over these indices and i'll say okay let me print every car i will print the ith object right that is one way of iterating using the length property you can get the size other ways you can use a for each loop or also called as enhanced for loop you can say okay for every string value that is there inside my um, cars array i want to go over that value and i want to print it that is another way of iterating over the complete array object then let's talk about the advantages of arrays they are very simple and they are very easy to use the insertion is really fast at the end of the array because if you keep a variable that okay these positions are filled i want to put something here you can simply say array of i equal to value so that value will get stored here so you can insert at the end of the array very fast and array element can be accessed in a constant time so if you want to get this element you can simply say okay give me the jth element so you can access any random element any random index in just order one time that is an advantage of an array but they also have certain disadvantages the thing is arrays have fixed size so once you create an array okay new int of some size 10 you cannot say i will make it 15 or i will make it 20 they have a fixed size they cannot grow in memory once they are allocated insertion in the middle requires shifting of the elements if you have inserted something let's say one two four six eight and you say okay i want to insert three what you will have to do you will have to shift these elements to the right then you can insert three in the middle so it's going to take order of n time for doing the insertion right and second thing is since array requires a linear memory block such blocks might not be available if the array size is big suppose this is your heap memory and suppose certain portions of the heap memory they are already used up right and suppose you want to create a very big array which might go like this now it is possible that such a linear block of memory is not available but this amount of memory is available in the heap in chunks right so you might say okay some memory is available here some memory is available here some memory is available here that is where linked list might perform better because linked list does not need big linear chunk of the memory whereas array requires a big linear chunk of the memory right so for big arrays it could be a disadvantage that such a linear block could not be present in the memory now arrays are used a lot in the real world for example this is a ui from a shopping website where i have to display these components right? the type of bill payments now i can say okay each bill payment is a string so i have a fixed size array of bill payments in which i have defined all the categories right now you might say okay uh, this looks very simple in actual world it might be a bit more complicated yes it can be what may happen is that each item is not just a string but it is a um, something more complex let me call this as a payment category what i can do i can define a class called as payment category which hold three things maybe the category id which is not displayed the category name and the image of the category right the url of the image of the category right? so i can hold all these things inside a class and then i can create an array of uh, the following class i can say okay i'm creating an array where each item is of the type payment category right so i'm creating an array of objects of the type payment category right? i have initialized this array that is going to contain 14 items and i i need to create these objects as well i need to say okay the bill payments of zero it is going to hold new payment category and using the constructor i've initialized these values okay the payment category is one the name is electricity and some url so instead of creating an array of primitive data types such as integer or float you can also create an array of complex data types such as payment categories in this example right secondly there are two dimensional arrays as well which are also used a lot especially in games and puzzles right so here is an example of tic-tac-toe where we might need a board right? or here is an example of Sudoku game where might we might need a two dimensional array to represent the state of the game right so it's a nine cross nine array so i've created this array right and i can also create a list of players it's going to be a 1d array but the data type is now a player right each player might have a name it might have a score might have certain uh, methods associated with it right 
it's an array of pairs right that is also how arrays can be used another use case could be that array can also be part of a data member of a class for example you have an enemy object the enemy has certain bullets inside it like certain number of bullets the enemy can fire i can create an array of bullets where each bullet is of the type bullet and I have created it when the enemy is created. For example, I want this enemy to have exactly six, six bullets when this enemy is created. I can do something like this. Okay? And when you're firing the bullet, maybe a particular bullet might get deactivated. Something like this can also be possible where your array is a data member of a particular class. This can also happen. Right? Another example could be uh, the, your uh, images. Right? So when you deal with images, you know, each image is made up of a matrix of pixels. Okay. Of the size rows into columns. So you might have heard about an HD image. So that is 1920 by 1080. That simply means that we have these many pixels in this image and each pixel is actually made up of three numbers, a component of red, component of green and a component of blue. So that means each pixel itself is an array of numbers right if i look at an image the image is actually a three-dimensional array of rows comma columns into three right where each pixel is actually going to store three numbers right? when we do with work with images in python we often see the arrays are three-dimensional okay another example that when you're building a uh, software components for example a tool like photoshop right you will say okay there is this grid where every item is a tool. So I can say, okay, tool toolbox. This is new tool. And in every index, I'm creating a new tool, right? Marquee tool is a type of a tool. Move tool is a type of a tool, right? I can also do something like this. They are used a lot in building real life software. And that is the importance of arrays, right? Now we'll look at some code demo to work with arrays. Now we are going to look at some code of an arrays, especially how do we perform an operation like sorting on arrays, which comes very ha handy in solving a lot of problems. Okay. So I have uh, an array of numbers and I want to use a method called as sort, right? So in java.util package, there is a class called arrays, right? So this class contains methods that will work on a array that we have created, right? Arrays.sort is one such method. We want to use this method to sort our numbers array. Let's see if I uh, go and run this code. So I just need to call this function F1. So my array is created. The array will get sorted and we are going to output this array. Right? Another such method is arrays dot to string. I can convert this array into a string like representation that I can print directly. So let us just go and run this main method. So now you see the data that you're getting is in a sorted order. Let us look at one more example. Let's say I have an array of strings and I want to sort these strings. Again, what I can do, I can use arrays.sort method, which is again an inbuilt method inside java.util. And I just need to pass the array object to this method. It's going to sort these objects. And let us call our function f2 and let us run this code. Now, what do I see? I see output apple banana grape lemon and orange right now how two strings are compared let us talk a little bit about comparisons as well now comparing numbers is easy i can compare as 5 less than 13 the answer is yes right? but if i have a string called as let's say uh, s1 that is abc and i have string s2 let's say i call it as abe right? now are they equal or are they not equal? how do we compare by default, inside the string class, there is a method called as compare to. If I say s1 dot compare to, you see there is a suggestion coming out and I say, okay, let me compare it with the string s2 and let me uh, show you the output of what this comparison function is going to be done. Right? Now, why I'm teaching you is this is very important because we also want to write custom comparisons for our objects. I'm getting an output that is minus. Basically, how sorting function works is internally calls the compare to method. When you use 
arrays a dot sort and you give um, some array of objects to sort right so what it does it calls the compare to method of that object so string basically it is calling the compare to method of this object so i'm saying s1 which is abc i want to compare it with another string abe now this compare to method it's going to produce three types of outputs one is a negative output one is zero and another is positive so negative output simply means that my first number is smaller first object is smaller that means it will come first in the list positive number means my second object is smaller that means it will come first in the list and zero means the two objects they are actually equal if if i get a negative output which i'm getting in this case that means abc is smaller than abe let us also see how this minus 2 is actually coming right so when you compare uh, abc with abe right so you compare a with a they are equal so you move to the next position you go with b b and b they are equal you move to the next position now you compare c and d right now suppose c has some ask i value right so maybe this is uh, this was 97 98 99 right and this is 97 98 99 100 101 right the ask a value of e could be 101 so when you take this difference right, i think a is, a is actually 90 not 97 so whatever the ask a value is right you will take the difference if you subtract c from e you will get a difference of mine that basically tells the sorting function that i will place abc first and then i will place ab the sorted order so compare to function is responsible for defining the sorting order when i'm sorting these fruits you see apple banana grape lemon and orange they are coming in their dictionary order right because a string knows a compare to function is present inside it right then i say okay i want to i want to reverse this order right what you can do is one simple way of doing it is that you supply a custom comparator called as collection sort reverse order that is exactly going to reverse the default output okay by default you are getting this output if you specify this it's going to reverse the default output if i run this code now you will see i will get orange first followed by lemon grape banana and apple that is one thing that you can use to uh, convert your ascending array into a descending that is one way of doing it so now you might ask then why we are studying this compare to method or where do we need it let us try to understand that as well this was very simple this was an array of integers or an array of strings right now you might say that i have a custom object i i have let's say a class called as employee where my employee has a name age and salary right and i want to create an array of uh, employees so i have a array of employees the array of custom objects and i want to sort them now if you uh, sort them right and if you do not tell java that okay i do not know how do we how do i compare to employees most likely you are going to get an error right now arrays dot sort can also accept employees but given that you define a method called as compare to inside the employee class okay. in the string class it is an inbuilt method but in the employee class which we have written we have to define how do i compare to employees for example i have an employee e1 i want to call the compare to method and supply it some another employee e2 right so when you say okay i am sorting a list of employees right this is an array of employees so it will say okay I'm going to compare this employee with some other employee. So I will say employee i dot compare to some other employee that is employee j. Right? So the sort function is internally going to call this method called compare to. Right? Now this method is not there. What we have to do? We have to define this method inside our employee. I have my employee class, and here I'm going to define my compare to method. How it will get called? It will get called internally. So employee i getting compared to with some other employee j, right? Now it is up to you. How do you compare two employees, right? Some other employee j, right? EMP. 
Now look at this. How do I write this method? So basically what I'm doing, I'm saying if the two employees have the same age, I will compare them according to their salary. I'm saying salary one minus salary two. So if the first employee salary is 100 and second employee salary is let's say 60, 100 minus 60, it's going to produce a positive number. That means the second employee will come first. The person with the lesser salary will come first. Or if the age is not equal, I'm saying age minus employee dot age. So this is the age of the first employee and this is the age of the second employee. For example, if the first employee is 50 years old, the second employee is 40 years old. 50 minus 40, it's also going to produce a positive number. That means the second employee, it is smaller in age, right? So what this sort function is going to do, what this compare function is going to do, it's simply going to compare the two employees based upon their age. If their ages are equal, it's going to compare according to their salary. People with the less age and less salary, they are given priority. They will come first in the output. So let us run this code and see what do we uh, really get, right? Okay, one more thing is that uh, we have to, so whenever you're creating this class, we have to tell that it implements the comparable interface, right? Why? Because the sort function ex expects that you will implement a compare to method. This compare to method is coming from the comparable interface, right? So we'll discuss the concept of interface very shortly, but you should know that. Uh, you have to say this class implements the comparable interface for the employee in which we have an abstract method compared to and we have defined this method in the current employee class right the body must be given here so what what is happening now uh, let me show you the output let's run this one we are sorting an array of objects right so i'm saying let me print employees. So now I'm getting 6,025. This is salary and age. Uh, I'm getting 12,025. That means higher salary, same age. Then right? I'm getting uh, 8,045. According to my logic, the first preference is on age. Employees are sorted first on their age, 25, 25, 45 and 56. Then they are sorted on their salary if the age is same. So Jam, uh, Jamin and Arin, they have the same age. So the person with less salary, it's going to come first. So you can do, you can make any logic, like depending upon the situation. And this compare to method will tell the sort function, how do I actually sort? So I'm hoping that this is clear. So one way is use the default sort function, but it does not work for the custom object, right? Then what you can do, you can write the compare to method. And now there is one more scenario in which you might not want to go this way. You might want to go, go with the comparator way, right? Let me discuss that as well. So let us discuss one, one more way of sorting using comparator. Now I'm going to tell you why it could be important. Now suppose you have maybe a list of strings. If let's say ABC or let's say some fruits, apple, mango, guava and orange and you want to say okay i want to sort my fruits i want to say okay um arrays dot sort i want to sort fruits but i want to sort fruits maybe according to the dictionary order i want to use the default comparison or maybe i want to sort fruits uh, according to their length i'm not writing writing the proper code but what i'm trying to tell you is that if I want to sort fruits according to their length, I will have to go inside the string class. And inside the string class, I will have to change the compare to method. Do you think changing the compare to method inside the string class, which is implemented in the Java library will be a good thing? The answer is no. We cannot go and uh, make changes in the library, right? That is one reason we will not use the default compare to method. Or we need some other way to do the sorting so that we have the flexibility right another option could be another reason could be that uh i might have a if else like this if the condition is this 
I want to sort according to some criteria. If there is some other condition, then I have to use some other criteria for sorting. Right? I might have something like this. Then also I will have to say that okay, go with the first way. If your if condition is true, go with the second way. If your second condition is true. something of this sort. What I'm going to tell you is that in such scenarios where either you have conditional sorting or you will have to uh, use your you cannot go and change the library compared to method for a for that particular class there is third way of doing the sorting so that way is called as comparator i'll show you an example of using a comparator right in this case i am creating an array list of integers so array list we will study very shortly it's just like a array but it's dynamic in size it can grow and shrink it. So it is part of collections framework we will study so the teach the the demo that we, i'm going to do here is also applicable for arrays dot sort method what we have done is we have created a dynamic array in which i have added few numbers what i want to do is instead of sorting these numbers directly right i know 10 is less than 22 that's okay but what i want to do i want to sort these numbers based upon their sum of their digits you might say okay how do i override such a comparison in such scenario there is this third way that i'm going to uh, teach you it is called as sorting using comparator right what we can do we can we still need to call the sort method so if it is an array object you will use arrays dot sort but if it is an array list which is part of your collections framework you will use collections dot sort in this sort method you need to give your array list object that is a that that we have given right? And now we have to say that okay, I'm creating a new comparator object. It's an anonymous object. We are not giving it any. And in this object, we have to override the compare method. Right. So I'll just uh, write this part again once. You will see uh, if you're using IntelliJ, it will come using the auto complete feature. I create a new comparator object, and in this, it automatically creates a method called as public int compare note that it is not compared to this method it's going to accept two objects that you want to compare and you want to tell how do i compare these two objects okay so if there are simple strings so integer o1 integer o2 so let's say first object a is 10 b is 20 right? if you simply return a minus b that will simply compare these strings based upon their values that means okay 10 minus 20 sorry o1 minus o2 first object minus second object i can do that that will say okay 10 minus 20 it's a negative number that means 10 will come first but if i do it other way if i say uh, i will negate this entire comparison that means i'm doing o2 minus o1 that means this list will be sorted in the descending order but suppose if i want to do based upon the sum of their digits okay for example this is 10 so sum is 1 plus 0 that is 1 2 plus 2 that is 4 4 plus 1 5 4 plus 0 that is 4 35 3 plus 5 8 5 plus 1 that is 6 i want to sort according to this what i can do i can convert an integer into its sum right what i have done i have written a function called as get sum given an integer x I want to get the sum right so this is very easy you know how to find the sum of an integer when i'm making a comparison what i will do else okay i'll get the sum of first integer object i'll say get sum of a and i will subtract get sum of a is my object o1 and b is my object o2 if i do this what's going to happen so numbers whose sum is lesser right so i'll just comment this code out i'll show you the output i'll show you the output let us run this code once right this comparator is telling the sort function that now you have to compare the objects using the following criteria okay so I, i've printed it, it twice now if you look carefully one plus zero is one this is four this is four this is five this is six and this is eight now you look carefully at these numbers they are sorted according to their sum that is something that you can do right 
you can do the same thing with strings as well you can do the same thing with employee as well you do not want to uh, implement the compare to method inside the employee class you can use a comparator or you want that on the top of it i need another comparison based upon certain condition right if employees are uh, near their performance period i want to compare according to their salaries not according to their age right? so you can have that comparator gives you another option to do the sorting right you might say okay this looks uh, little tricky is there a shorter easy easier way to do it the answer is yes so what we can do we can use something called as a lambda function as well i'll just tell you in a very short way what is a lambda function it's a one line function it's an anonymous function so in java what do you have to do you have to write the inputs that you need to compare in these round brackets for example if i'm comparing two objects a and b right? and with an arrow you have to write the output of the comparison now if you want to compare a and b in this case what is the output i'm saying okay get sum of a minus get sum of b that is what we are doing in the compare function as well that thing you put it here and this becomes a lambda function and it will do the trick for you right so you can just say that okay i don't want to write the compare method i just want to use this value that is the output and use these numbers that are my inputs given these two inputs i want to return this output from the comparison this will also work and if i show you if i comment this code out this lambda function will also do the same sorting thing that we want to do let us sort them and let's see what do we get we are still getting the same out that is another way of doing the sort so hopefully now you have understood the three different ways of doing sort and that's all for sorting and we'll start with the collections framework next let's talk about java collections framework now so java collections framework is a framework in java that provides us with set of classes interfaces to manipulate organize and perform operations on data without writing your own data structures from scratch so it provides you with library implementation of data structures and their associated methods that can do anything that you will ever need to do right that means we will be using inbuilt data structures because they come very handy when you are solving problems or you are building real life software so these data structures are also highly optimized and they will of course save a lot of development time so you don't need to write your own hash table you don't need to write your own linked list right so this is what is a standard practice we will most of the times we would be using the library implement just to summarize once again what do we have we have set of interfaces we'll see we have implementation classes the classes that actually implement those interfaces and we have also algorithms okay so i showed you the examples of uh, Arrays dot sort method, collection dot sort method. Similarly, we have methods for searching like binary search available in the Java collections. So you can just go and look at what all those methods are. But for now, what I will be doing, I will be doing a quick demo of interface versus a class, so that you can really understand how these interfaces and classes are being organized inside the Java collections, right? let us jump into a small code demo to understand the concept of interface versus a class in this uh, example what i have done i have defined an interface called as a payment method. Okay. so what is an interface an interface specifies what a class must do and not how that means we do not have the implementation of the pay method we do not know how to make the payment but we are saying there must be something called as a pay if it is a payment method any payment method that we have must implement a pay method inside it so it is a blueprint for for the class interface methods are abstract by default so they they don't have any code inside now suppose i have i'm going to create payment method called as debit card so debit card is a class which implements payment method that means now debit card must define a pay method it's so for now i'm just saying that debit card pay method prints paying via debit card similarly i have one more class called credit card which also implements the payment method 
I have one more uh, class called UPI, which also implements the payment. All these classes they have the pay method, and they are implementing the payment method. They are different ways of creating the payment method. Execution of each payment method would be different. Okay, a credit card might have a different mechanism. A UPI might have a different mechanism of making the payment. Debit card will have a different mechanism of making the payment. Why we are doing this? Let us try to understand. Now suppose uh, we have method called as make payment, and this method can accept any payment method. Right? I am not hard coding here. I am not saying that I will only accept debit card DC. I will not accept debit card. I can accept any payment method. One thing is we need a, a general structure. We need a general data type that can hold all payment methods. Okay. and here i am going to call pm dot pay so now why this method will work so let me show you how do you create objects of it so i can say okay debit card dc this is equal to new debit card and i say okay uh, i am creating a debit card then i can call dc dot pay so this will work i am creating a debit card object dc dot pay will actually work right so i am uh, not calling this method as of now but what i can do is I can call the make payment method and I can pass it the debit card object. Why? Because debit card object implements the payment method interface. A better way to do it is suppose you have like some code here. You say DC dot pay. Suppose uh, your debit card is not working or the debit card service is down or there is some issue and you want to make it change it to the credit card. Okay, you want to say, okay, no, I want to try credit card. Now, if you do this, this is going to give you a problem because a debit card data type cannot hold a credit card, right? But what we can do is we can use a more general data type that is payment method. Payment method is PM. I can say, okay, on the left side, I'll have a payment method which is implemented by a credit card, right? So, payment method is a more general data type. So, this is a good design practice as well. So this data type we will keep it more generic and this is a specific class that provides implementation of methods defined in this class. This is a specific class. Now this could be credit card, this could be debit card, this could be UPI, right? And I can pass the this object PM to any method make payment, right? Now it does not care whether it I'm going to call the pay method of debit card, credit card, UPI. Whatever is the object passed, it will call uh, the pay method of that object. So that means with minimum change in code, we can achieve this general uh, general behavior, right? So any payment method object will work inside the make payment method. If I go and run this code, I will show you what's going to happen. It will say, okay, I'm going to make a payment using a credit card, paying via credit card. But if I say, okay, no, I will make it UPI. So without changing your make payment method, you have just changed this object. It will pay via UPI, right? I'm going to run this code now. Paying via UPI. That means this uh, object reference can hold any object. Like any object which implements the payment method interface. That is a quick revision about interfaces and classes in Java and collections framework heavily uses this concept of interfaces and classes a lot. So let us look at how this is implemented in the collection framework as well. There are so many components inside collection framework. There are interfaces, there are classes, there are child interfaces, there are child classes and the hierarchy is a bit complex. So what I've done is I've drawn a simplified diagram so that you can understand how these components are related so on the top we have something called as a collection interface okay so collection is a interface inside collections framework there are three more interfaces which are child interfaces of the collection interface so they, they are list set and queue they all extend the collection interface okay queue extends collection set extends collection and list also extends collection that means some methods are there in collection 
and list adds some additional methods which are specific to the list set adds more methods which are specific to the set queue adds more methods which are specific for the queue like behavior and then there are implementation classes which actually implement a list so array list implements a list the other way the array list is going to implement a list a link list is also going to implement a list stack is also going to implement a list vector is also going to implement a list so a vector is a concurrent data structure that means um, if there if you need to work if need you need to share this data structure across multiple threads then vector is the synchronized data structure okay, so we are not going to do concurrent data structures in this tutorial so i will leave vector at the moment similarly hash set implements the methods of the set link list implements linked hash set implements methods of the set and tree set also implements methods of the set right now what is the difference the way these methods internally work that is different okay a tree set might use something like a self balancing binary search tree whereas hash set might use the concept of a hash table to store the data right so the implementation of methods is different and their time complexities they are also different right? so for queue we have three implementations we have array deck which is a doubly ended queue we have a linked list which is like your uh, which serves as your fifo linked list and there is a priority queue which again internally uses a heap like data structure to give priority to the elements which should come first right so we have interfaces and we have classes that implement those interfaces the ones that are in the orange they are the classes the ones which are in yellow they are the interfaces right so i hope you understood this simple hierarchy now you might be wondering where is hash map hash map is not a part of collection interface it is not a subtype of a collection interface it has been kept separately and it behaves differently from the rest of the collection types so that means uh, the map will be treated differently so map is a interface that we will look and hash map tree map and linked hash map they are the implementations for the map interface right we will use one of these implementations if you want to build a something like a map which can store key value pairs so we'll understand the differences between these implementations as we go through this tutorial right so let me uh, tell you a little more about collection interface the collection interface it it's a general interface it represents a group of objects which are known as elements right so it's it's simply grouping different objects and it is used to pass around collections of objects where maximum generality is required okay you just want a group of objects you don't want to use specific priority queue method or specific queue method or you don't want to use specific hash map method right so you just want some general methods that i should be able to add into the collection i should be able to remove from the collection i should be able to delete from the collection right for example you have a collection of string now this collection again it might be implemented using a linked list it might be implemented using a set it might be implemented using a array list we don't know right so we have to provide one way implement or represent this group of strings right so let me show you a code demo here so i have collection of string s1 now this interface uh, collection is an interface so i need a class to implement it right so okay this collection will be stored using a array list so i am adding something into the array list right i am saying s1 dot add hello s1 dot add world right now you might ask where is this add method defined so i will tell you the collection interface contains method that performs basic operation okay so such as size every data structure you need to get its size every data structure should know whether it is empty or not every data structure should know whether a particular object is present inside it or not every data structure should support that i want to add some element i want to remove some element i need a iterator right also contains methods that operate on entire collections such as add all given another collection can i add all the elements of the, this collection into the current collection yes i can right remove all retain all clear right these are general methods that are defined in the collection interface that means all the implementation classes will have to define these methods let me show you uh, something here so let us say i create one more collection 
and this collection is implemented using a hash set now in this hash set i am adding two uh, strings a b c and d right now this add function is going to behave differently from this add function because this add function is implemented by the array list but this add function is implemented by the hash set so if i print s1 and s2 i would be able to see okay there are two group of elements okay if i just run this code i'll see okay i have a collection s1 and i have a collection s2 now suppose i want to add all elements of s1 into s2 can we do that of course i can do that because the collection interface gives me methods like add all so s1 dot add i can give any collection here i can give list i can give array list i can give queue right so i can say okay uh, in my hash set i want to add all elements of array list that is s1 so i can pass another collection into my add all method the method is add all right so it's a general method any collection can be passed to right this is what it means right method is add all that's correct so let's go and run this code now if i see abcd it's here i will also see hello world is also there so you can see all elements of s1 they got added into s2 right all these general methods they are defined in the collection inter okay i hope you are understanding it so that is at the top right now why we are learning this because we want to use this data structures to solve problems efficiently it is so powerful that we can do lot of things for example we can create a list in which we can keep adding to we just saw an example of array list we can search items very quickly inside a hash map we can sort a list of students by using a comparator right we have just seen comparators we can also find topmost ordered items using a priority queue we can filter out duplicate elements using a hash set we can build a rate limiting algorithm using a queue right we can do lot of stuff using the collection framework and that is why we are learning it now next we will dive into specific classes and the first class that we will start is array list so let us talk about array list so array list is like a dynamic array for storing elements it's an array but with no size limit that means if an array gets full it will grow in size and it can accommodate more elements till you have memory available inside your heap right so array list class uh, it's a dynamic array it maintains the relative insertion order so if you add element it will always get added at the end so that means it will get the same order as insertion we can add or remove elements even we can search for elements and it implements linear search that means it will take linear time to search it so in java it implements the list interface so we saw that list is a interface and array list is a implementation of the list interface all the methods that are available in the list interface are implemented by array list right so now how it is going to work internally so i'll give you a quick idea so internally it uses a fixed size array only right so it starts with some fixed size array so in java the default size is 10 so by default it will create a new array of size 10 and as soon as the array gets full it will double the size of the original now that doubling cannot happen in the same place suppose th this array was full right what it will do it will create a new linear array suppose this size was 10 it will create a new array of size 20 and it will copy all these elements into the new array and then you will have some extra buckets for new elements once this gets full it will again delete the previous array it will create a new array of double the size copy elements here and delete this array as well this is how it happens copy the elements from the old array in the new array and delete the old this is how this array actually works that means the doubling of the array list is a expensive operation and we should reduce the frequency of this doubling how do we do that so if you know you are going to store 1000 elements create an array list of initial size 1000 if if you by chance exceed 1000 the doubling will happen the array size will become 2000 right so it's good idea to start with the sum initial size that is equal to your requirement in java this doubling procedure is lit little different it says okay i'll maintain something called as a load factor this load factor is i think around 0.7 that means if 70% of your array is full the doubling will get triggered so we will not wait till uh, filling of 100% of the array if 70% of the array gets full 
the doubling gets uh, the doubling function it's it's triggered okay so after adding the seventh element if the initial size was 10 a new array is created with a capacity of 20 so there are two things when you talk about size of the array list it tells you how many elements are currently stored in the array list so if you use the size method it's not the capacity capacity is generally more than the size right so capacity is how how much space has been allocated internally whereas size is the number of elements that we have stored in the array list right so what are the features it is dynamic in size it can grow and shrink in size secondly it is ordered it preserves the order of elements third it is index space just like an array you have indices array list also have indices if you want to access a particular element okay i want to get this ith element you do not write array of i instead you write array list dot get i give me the ith element so get is a method that we, you will use to access any ith element so this also works in order one time right indexing is zero based so another property you need to know is it is object based array list can only store object data types that means it cannot be used with primitive data types so you cannot create an array list of int float etc then you might be wondering how do we uh, create an array list of integers for that you have to use wrapper classes in java the wrapper class for int is called as integer so you will always create an array list of the data type integer not as int and secondly it is not synchronized that means it's not a concurrent data structure if you need if concurrence is important for your application you have to use vector which is the synchronized version of array list right so array list operations are not thread safe and multiple threads should not operate on the same array list so this is a basic data success tutorial if you want to learn about advanced concepts we will cover it in some other video right so what are the operations we can get any element using the get function we can add any element using the add function we can also add more elements using the add all function so i give you a list i want to add it i can use add all right so i can give some element x that can be added insertion and deletion in the middle it's going to take order of n time so if you insert something in the middle right you want to say okay i want to add something in between it will require shifting of remaining elements that means that will take order of n time searching takes order n time so by default if you use the contains method it's going to do linear search right but if you know the array list is sorted then you can use your own binary search method or the binary search provided by the library function you can use that as well that searching will take log n time if your array list is already sorted right now let us look at basic syntax how we can create an array list array list uh, this is you have to define what kind of object you want to store here right and then you say okay i want to create a new array list object right so this is how we do it for example you can create an array list of strings right? and you say it's a new array list you can create an array list of integer right i told you it does not work with primitive data type so you have to use other upper classes okay so in general i would uh, make this left data type to be of the list type because array list is a type of a list right and as a good design principle it is preferred that we make this data type more general as possible so we can say okay the list uh, we are creating an object of the type list the implementation is given by new array list this is a more recommended thing to do right than doing array list right this you will learn in the design principle right so we'll create an object of the type list which which is implemented using the array list class right so this is what we will do right uh, so we can also use the constructor to give an initial capacity right so you can pass a number here that will tell me okay i want an array list whose initial size is 50 it is not going to be 10 so by default the initial capacity of the array list would be 50. that means until this array list is not full or it's not 70 percent full the doubling will not execute if you know that you are going to work with 10,000 elements, create an array list of size 10,000 or 11,000 so that your doubling does not happen again and again because it's an expensive operation. We can also initialize array list using an another list. Okay, so you can give another list. For example, here we have a list of strings which is storing foo and bar, and I'm going to initialize an array list with another list. That is also 
possible so we have seen three ways the default constructor a constructor with the initial capacity and a constructor that accepts another list collection to initialize this array list right now one more cool thing about array list is we can also store objects of various types in this array list why so if you want to create an array list which can store objects of multiple different data types then don't parameterize the instance so you if you see here i have not specified any specific data type here that means this array list can store different object data types so i can add an integer right so i'm saying array list dot add integer dot value of one now you might ask why i cannot do this array list dot add one because it is of the type int right so i need to type cast this into integer data type integer dot value of is a method that creates an integer object out of this one right string dot value of scalar so this is optional we can simply say array list dot add scalar so it's it's going to add a string object inside my array list right if i show you in the demo i have created an array list here i say okay array list dot add integer dot value of one this is going to add an integer and then array list dot add scalar so i'm storing an integer object and a string object inside the same array list right so this is also possible right so you see the output here right let us talk about some more methods of array list so predefined methods include lot of methods so there are methods for adding objects so if i simply call the add method it will add at the end of the list there is a add method which also accepts an index and an ob object it will insert into a specific index of the list right there is a add all method it will uh, add another list in another collection into this list right so we can also add another collection at a particular index in this list so let us look at uh, the add methods first so i can say i want to create an array list so list of its integers i call it as list and this is equal to new array list So you can see we have imported the list interface and we have imported the array list class now inside this list i need to add some numbers i can say add one add two add four so let me show you and if i print this list i see i get one two four i have added these numbers okay now what i can do i can add at a particular index as well i can say okay i want to add at a certain index so either i give a integer or i give a int followed by an integer so i can say okay add at index 2 the element is 15 if i do it it will do insertion in the middle of the list that is also possible so you can see i get 15 which is now present at index 2 so by default it is uh, like the first parameter is is the index the second parameter is the value that i am going to insert right that is the add function i can create another list as well i can say okay um, i need another list list 2 and i can say list 2 dot add 15 and i can or let's say this is 25 i can also add all elements of list 1 in list 2 so i can say list 2 dot add uh, list so i can pass another collection here so add all so i need to call the add all method and this will also work and i can print list 2 as well you can see i am uh, having 25 here followed by all ele elements of list 1 that is how do we use the add method next we will look at look at the remove method so now remove method is it's actually a overloaded method if you look at uh, we have we can pass an object we can also pass an index now this becomes tricky especially if you are working with integers right if i say okay i want to remove something i want to say uh, list 2 dot remove 1 now what does it mean am i removing the index or am i removing the value 1 right so uh, or let me just say list dot remove 1 so if i talk about first list and i want to remove 1 from it so let me show you it will actually remove the index because when you are passing one simply like this it's going to assume it is of the data type int right so if you look here right? so when i pass int data type it removes the index 
at the at, at the following index it will remove so that means it will remove the element 2 from list 1 but if i want to remove the value that is 1 what will i have to do i have to convert that into an integer object right so i have to say list dot remove integer dot value of 1 that means remove 1 as a uh, object so if i remove both let's say so that means 1 and 2 both will get removed let me show you the output i'll print system s out uh, list show me what you're going to remove right so now you can see the output that both 1 and 2 they got removed and we got 15 and 4 so similarly you have a remove all method which will accept another collection it will remove all elements from that collection from the given collection clear will remove all elements from the list contains will tell me whether a particular element is present or not so i can check that okay if list contains 15 do something right so contains is, is is your linear search so s out uh yes 15 is present something like this so you can use the contains method with almost every collection let me run this and you can see that we are getting 15 is present okay so there are more methods uh there is a get method so if you want to read a particular index you want to say okay show me what is present at uh, the zeroth index you can say s out or you can maybe you want to iterate over the entire array list you can say for int i equal to zero i less than list dot size or list two dot size i plus plus i want to get the elements at each index you can say s out list two dot get i this will give you the elements at given ith index so get function is used to access the ith element so let me run this and you can see we are able to iterate over all the elements in this list so just like get there is another method that is called set so if you want to update a particular index you want to say okay i want to make this zeroth element as 50 so you can say okay list to dot set zeroth element make it 50 this will up work and now your zeroth element will be 50 you need to give the index and the object that is get, that you need to store here this is the set function there are more methods i won't be able to cover all the methods but we have covered like most of the important methods there is a method called to array if you want to get an array from an array list you can use this and there is a method called as size which we have just seen there is also a method called trim to size that means if we have if you want to reduce the current size right like if you want to reduce the capacity to the current size we can use this method trim to size right these are some of the important methods uh, associated with uh, array list there is also index of returns the index of the first occurrence of the specified element in the array list or minus one if it does not contain the element so contains is going to give you boolean present or not index of is going to give you at what index it is present or not right now we'll look at some more ways to iterate on the array list let's do a quick demo so we have seen a for loop we can also use a for each loop so i can say for every uh, integer x in my list two i want to access it and i want to print it so i can say okay s out list to dot get i that is my another way of iterating and printing so sorry i will not do this else okay let me print this number x let me run this code there is one more way that i can also iterate on the list using an iterator right so you can see we are getting uh, all the elements that is 1 2 15 4 and 50 is also there right so we are starting from 50 here and we are getting all these elements okay so iterator is one more way to traverse on 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 a java collection all java collections they they support iterators so what you can do you can create a iterator object by calling list dot iterator this iterator has a method called as has next which tells me whether i can access the next element in the collection not or not right if your collection has finished your has next will give you okay there is no other element right so i can say while it dot has next if there is an element present i can access it so i can say okay s out it dot next this will give me the next element in the collections this is another way 
using which I can iterate on given collection, right? So iterator is coming from the java.util uh, package only, right? So this will also print all the elements present in this at list. Let us quickly run the code and see. We are getting the same output uh, using iterator as well. So we I iterated on list one, so which is 15 and four. Again, I iterated using iterator, which is 15 comma four. That is what I am getting by iterating on my list. That's all for array list. I hope you understood the methods of array list and how it works. Now let us jump into linked list. So linked list is also a linear data structure in which elements are represented as objects and stored in non-continuous memory. For example, if this is your heap memory and you have some data, maybe one is stored here, two is stored here, three is stored here, four is stored here. They might form a chain like structure and where each object is referring to the is holding the address of the next object in the chain. This is called as a single linked list where each object knows the address of the next node, but it does not know anything about the previous nodes. If you arrive at three, you can only go to four. If you arrive at four, you can only go in the forward direction. Let us talk about linked list little more. So we don't have to specify the size of the linked list. It's a dynamic data structure. As you add more data, more objects get created in the memory and they become part of the chain and size is changing automatically as the data is added or removed. So you don't need any fixed size array to initialize it. Right now let's talk about the implementation. As I just talked about each node in a linked list, it's, it's going to hold data. It is also going to hold the address of the next node. And if it is a doubly linked list, it is also going to hold the address of the previous node. The nodes are not stored in a continuous memory location. They are linked to each other with the help of next and previous pointers okay so this is something we'll go into the detail when we talk about uh when we do a tutorial on linked list but for now we just want to see how to use the inbuilt linked list class and understand its advantages and when to use it right so in java the default implementation provides us with a doubly linked list so a doubly linked list each node stores three things the object or the data the next node's address and the previous node's address so at two you know where is the next node located and where is the previous node located at three, you know, where is the next node located and where is the previous node located. So, you know, all the three things at each node inside a linked list. That is what a doubly linked list is, right? And creating a doubly linked list is fairly simple. So you just need to use the linked list class provided by the java.util package and the data type, what kind of data you want to store in this linked list and it will create a linked list for you, right? Now let's talk about the features of the linked list. The biggest feature is we can use the non-continuous memory. So if you don't have a linear block available, we can still create a big chain by utilizing the non-continuous blocks of the memory. It is a dynamic data structure. There is no need to pre-allocate the memory and hence it re results in efficient utilization of the uh, memory as well. Right. And insertion and deletion at the ends of the linked list are performed in constant time. Now this is a very big advantage. So if you have an array and you want to insert something at the beginning, you would see that I will have to shift the entire array. Then I can insert a zero here, right? But in case of a linked list, this time, which is order n in an array inserting at the beginning, it's going to be very fast. Suppose you have one, two, three, four, five. You already know this node. Okay. And you say, I want to insert a zero here. So you create a new node and you say, okay, head should point here and zero should point here. This can be done in order one time. Similarly, the last node is uh, referred by a tail pointer. If you want to create something at tail, you can simply add six here and your tail will move here, right? So if it is a doubly linked list, insertion and deletion both at the both ends can be just done in order one time. This is a very, very big advantage of linked list and concatenation of two linked list is much more efficient in terms of space and time. So if you want to merge two array lists, you will have to copy all the data, right? But if you want to merge two lists, let's have another list, seven, eight, and nine. In that case, merging is also very easy. You just need to connect this node with this one, which is again going to take order one time. Concatenation is also very fast in case of a linked list, right? So let's talk about uh, the differences between the operations, right? So random access. Now that means if I want to get any ith element, this is very fast in array, right? So I know I can get, uh, I can do array dot get i, 
this works in order one but if you want to get some uh, ith element inside the linked list there is no direct way you have to iterate it it's in the worst case it will be order of n insertion and deletion at the beginning in case of linked list as i told you it's order one in an array it's going to be order n because you have to do the shifting insertion and deletion at the end so if it is a doubly linked list uh and we are maintaining the tail pointer we can do it in order one time as well and uh, in array it is also order one so this this can be made order one right it depends upon the implement insertion and deletion from the random location so of course this inserting deleting something from the middle both in array and a linked list will take order of n time right? so i hope you understood the basics of a linked list now let's look at the implementation so i have this code in which we said okay we are creating a list which is using a new array list object so instead of now using array list i can simply replace it with with linked list and since both array list and linked list implement the list interface so all the methods that we saw uh, with this list they will also work with linked list as well right so i need to import this class let me just type linked list and this will get imported so import java.util.link so this is also there right? if i run this code as it is the same array list code it will work all the methods that we used on array list will also work on linked list as well right? now apart from it there are some additional methods as well which are provided by linked list for example adding something at the beginning of the list so that method is not there in array list we can use that method for example i can say uh, this dot add first i can say okay in the beginning you add an element that is zero you might be saying okay we are getting an error here at first there is nothing like this now why we why we are uh, getting this error because add first is not a method inside the list inter okay so what happens is your list says that okay you must implement an add method whereas your linked list class which implements your list interface right it says okay i will implement the add method i will also implement the add first method that means you cannot call add first method on on a list kind of a variable right it, it is of the type list what i need to do i need to say okay the object that i am now creating is exactly a linked list okay if i make it linked list you can see add first will work because you can easily add in the beginning of a linked list so i can say okay maybe add uh, minus 20 here and show me this list so i am running the code and you can see minus 20 is there it's added in the beginning of the list so we have more methods let's look at some more methods all right so just to save time i'll quickly uh, go through all of these methods so there is a add method which we saw on the list this is also there add all is also there add all we have seen right now add first i just show you showed you the demo it adds uh, the desired element in the beginning of the list similarly there is a add last method it will add at the end of the list so it will work same as your uh, add method there is a clear method which is fine there is a clone method creates a shallow copy there is a contains method element present or not right uh, then popular methods are get i want to get particular element works in a linear time get first get the first element get last get the last element index of you can use right now there is also a method called as offer right this method is used to add at a specified element at the tail of the list now you might be asking what is the difference between add versus offer so let us discuss this as well for that you need to go to the java linked list class right so i'm look uh, java linked list the oracle docs right so if i look look here what is happening uh, the linked list class it, it actually implements uh, not just your uh, list interface it also implements your deck interface it also implements your queue interface that means all the methods of the queue all the methods of deck they should be available as a part of linked list so what is deck a deck is a doubly ended link uh, it's a doubly ended uh, queue so that means you can do push and pop that means you can add from the rear end add for, remove from the rear end and you can also do push and pop that means you can add from the front side and also remove from the 
front side of the queue that means insertion and deletion can happen at the both ends of the queue now in order to uh, implement this deck interface or the queue interface let us look at what all methods are there in the deck interface inside the deck interface you see there are methods you want to insert something at the beginning there is a add first method that should be implemented by that class you want to remove something the remove first should be there you want to get something get first should be there right similarly uh, for the last element add last remove last and get last should be there now there are two versions of the same method one is add first one is offer first right what is the difference between add first and offer first so the difference is written here so what they are saying is that both methods are provided to insert remove and examine the element each of these methods exist in two forms one throws an exception if the operation fails the other returns a special value basically your offer method it returns like true or false or null if your operation fails right whereas add first will throw an exception so it again depends upon your use case how you want to use this method if you are working in an environment where your capacity of the data structure is restricted and you are trying to insert something and your data structure is already full so what do you want should i should it return false that i cannot execute this operation or should it throw an exception so if you want to throw an exception go with the add first method if you want to handle it using a value like true false or null you will have to go with the offer first method so because linkless implements the queue and the deck interface which needs these methods hence you will see there are many methods which are doing the sa almost same work right between add and offer there is a difference of the return type should you not the return type but how do you handle the failure case right so you are going to return a, something like true false or should i throw an exception right so that is offer and we have offer first we have offer last right then there is a method peak so peak means to look i want to look at the element so if you simply call peak it will show you the first element of the linked list the head of the linked list peak first fetches the head of the linked list so peak and peak first they are same peak last show me the last element right then there is a method poll poll means i want to uh, fetch the first element of the linked list so it it will return the first element and remove it right poll first is also same remove the first element or it it's going to return null if the list is empty then there is poll last it will remove and give you the last element of the linked list or it will give you null if the linked list is empty right there is a method called pop as well linked list can also be used as a star so in star we generally call removing the last element as pop right and push is also there if you want to some push something in the star i can say okay i am pushing something so it will push something into the linked list if i say pop it will remove the last inserted element from the link list similarly the the remove method is there right remove first is there remove last is there set is there you want to update a particular element and two string is there that means if i want to print a link list it will call the two string method and each element is separated by a comma and it is enclosed in square bracket when whenever we are printing this when whenever we we are using system dot out dot print list what is happening internally it is using the two string method of the list object to give us list which looks like this okay this is coming from the uh, two string method so i hope you really got an idea on what all methods you can use on a linked list so many methods are there so mainly you need to remember that you can work on both ends you can work on the front side you can work on the rear end and you can also insert in the middle search in the middle but insertion and deletion at the ends it is fast in the middle it's difficult random access it's difficult it's going to take order of n time compared to an array so that's all i'll see you in the next data structure let's talk about stack stack is a very simple and easy to use data structure so just like arrays and linked list it is also a linear data structure that is used for storing data and it looks very much like a real life stack such as a stack of books a stack of plates and uh, let's see so it's kind of an ordered list in which insertion and deletion are done only at one end for example if you have items coming in 1 2 3 and you push them items into a stack so one will go then on the top of it two two will go and three will go and if you start popping items three will come first then two will come and then one will come 
so it's also called as last in first out data structure the element which is inserted at the last is the first one to get removed for example if you keep a stack of books you put a c++ book then you put a java book and then you put a python book python book is the one that you can pick first followed by java book followed by c++ book last in first out property stack has so internally if you want to uh, see how it is implemented you can use a fixed size array you can also use a dynamic array you can also use a linked list to implement a stack and how it is different from arrays arrays allows random access you can get any ith element but in case of stack of books you can only access the topmost element so uh, in a way there is a limited access possible and only topmost element is directly available in case of a stack stacks are generally dynamic in nature that means we don't have a fixed size and size can be increased or decreased depending upon the push and the pop operations that we are doing right so the container that you are using can be a fixed size array as well but in general it would be dynamic such as a dynamic array or a linked list so the operations on stack they are very simple you can push an element into the stack you can pop something from the stack and you can peek peek means you can look at the topmost element. let us look at a code demo to understand these operations well so in java we have a stack class which is uh, which also implements your uh, list interface but on the top of it stack has its own methods as well so let's look at a demo right so like i have created a stack object stack of string called books and in this i can push something so i can say books dot push right now you see there is a add method as well the add method is coming from the list interface or i can simply call push method which is specifically implemented by the stack class so i can say okay let me push c plus plus let me push java and let me push python let me just create three books and push it that's okay python now if i print the stack i can say okay show me what elements do we have i call it as books let's run the code and suppose if i want to see the topmost element the topmost element will be what it should be a uh, python right i want to look at the topmost element so i can simply call peak right so i can say okay uh, s out books dot peak that will give me python and if i want to remove it i can call the pop method i can say books dot pop that is going to remove the topmost element and now if i do peak i will see java next s out books dot and apart from these methods we also we, we can run a loop like we can say okay uh, while the stack is not empty i want to uh, stack dot sorry books dot is empty while this is not empty i want to keep on popping elements i want to remove them so i can say s out um, books dot peak and i want to pop everything books dot this is one way to iterate on the stack you have to remove all the elements and uh, yeah so i hope you are able to understand this example so we are able to remove all elements we first removed python then we removed java and then we removed plus plus as well that's all about stack a very simple data structure right and hopefully you will be able to use it let us talk about queue a queue again is a very simple data structure uh, it's just like a real life queue the sequence of object waiting to be served in the sequential order starting from the beginning of the queue so in general queue maintains a fifo kind of ordering but we also have something called as a priority queue which is little different for example a fifo queue would mean a queue of cars at a toll booth cars are coming in to get their ticket or people are standing in a line to buy their tickets what happens in general people enter from the rear end of the queue and they leave from the front side of the queue once they get the ticket so adding something in, into the queue it's called as n queue removing something from the queue is called as dq someone has been removed from the queue so insertion as i discussed it happens at the rear end of the queue whereas deletion happens at the front end of the queue last in uh last out the person who is entering in the last is the last one to come out or you can say it's a fifo first in first out the person who is coming first is the first one to come out right 
the front of the queue is returned using a peak operation so if you want to say okay i want to see who is at the front the, the most libraries they have a peak method like in java we have a peak method to see what element is at the front of the queue right and similarly there are methods like offer to add something at the end of the queue and if you want to remove something from the front side it's called as pole right we'll look at three methods offer adding something at the rear end polling removing something from the front side and peaking means looking what is at the front okay so peak only gives you the element whereas pole removes an element from the queue right so these are three methods that we will discuss if you want to implement a queue at your own end you can use a fixed size array uh, also known as a circular uh, array to implement the queue you can also use a dynamic array or also you can use a linked list so there are limitations of queue data structures a queue is not readily be searchable you cannot go inside the queue and search so you might have to maintain another queue to store the dequeued elements okay so you have to empty the entire queue if you want to search for something and uh, traversal of course we cannot traverse that is the same thing so you have to again remove all the elements to do the traversal and in this process queue becomes empty so these are limitations of the queue so operations you want to add something so the equivalent java method it is called as offer i want to add something into the queue you want to remove something the java method it, it is called as poll and if you want to look who is there standing at the front the method is called as p let us look at the queue methods in our code demo and if i talk about uh, what are the methods there in java right so if, if i told you that queue is a interface in java right so this interface is implemented by three different classes one is called array deck which stands for doubly ended queue we can use linked list which we will be using to implement our p4 queue and there is also something called as priority queue which we will also study very soon right we'll go with the linked list wala implementation right the methods that i told you they are insert remove and examine Ex examine is like peak right now again i told you there are two two versions that java provides one set of methods that throws exception so if you use okay i want to add something into the queue there is a add method or if you want to do the same functionality you can also use the offer method the offer method returns a special value whether your operation was successful or not add method might throw an uh, exception if your add operation fails because of some reason okay similarly remove throws an exception if your operation fails poll will not throw an exception element you you are looking for an element maybe at the empty queue right it can throw an exception peak will not throw an this is how these methods are designed so i will be uh, going with these methods okay in the implementation let me jump into the code and let's quickly create a queue right well it's okay i want to create a queue of integers i call it as queue and i say okay the queue implementation so queue is an interface the implementation is provided by the linked list so we'll be using linked list for this queue right so we also need to imp uh, import it now how do i do it i can say queue dot add some numbers let's say 1 2 3 and 4 let me just copy this now if i say okay i want to see who is at the front of the queue or let's just print the entire queue let's uh, run this code and simultaneously let's see who is at the front of the queue so i can say s out queue dot p show me who is standing at the front i will see one is standing at the front so one came first right now if i remove this I say okay. I want to remove one. I can say q dot um, pole, and then I can say show me the entire queue and also show me the front element. I can say q dot. Just like stack, you can also use a while loop to empty all the elements of the queue. So after removing one, the queue is two, three, four, and if I look at the front element, the front element is now. So you can put a loop like this while your queue is not empty. You can keep on removing the elements from the queue. That is all about queue. I hope you really understood uh, how to use queue in Java.
So next in line is the DEC data structure. So it stands for doubly ended queue and it's pronounced as DEC. So it is again a linear data structure that allows insertion and deletion at the both ends. Okay, so you, you can do insert here. You can say, okay, I can expand in this side or I can also expand in this side. Maybe I insert five, maybe I insert 12 or I can remove from both ends of the queue. It's a queue that supports insertion and deletion at both ends. So basically, Internally, we can use a linked list to implement it. And Java also provides a special class called as array deck, which implements the deck, right? So if I look at the hierarchy, so we start with the collection interface. We have seen the queue interface extends the collection interface. It adds some more methods into the collection. Then there is also a deck interface, which I've not shown earlier in the diagram and the array deck is a implementation of the deck interface right array deck is implementing the class that implements the deck interface which is extending the queue interface okay so this is what you it's a good to know thing not mandatory right array deck and linked list are commonly used deck implementation if it is a doubly linked list you can see it is very easy to expand something on both the ends right so you can simply add something here as well and your tail will move right you can add something here as well your head will move right so it's pretty easy to use linked list but eredic internal implementation is little more complicated so i'll discuss few more points about eredic it is an implementation of the deck interface that uses a resizable array to store its element and deck is a subtype of queue interface that we have just discussed best thing about eredic classes it provides constant time performance for inserting and removing elements from both the ends of the queue now this is very tricky right in an array we cannot do constant time insertion and deletion at both the ends we can do only at one end right but in deck in array deck it uses an internally some complicated mechanism so that we can remove and insert from both the ends of the queue and these operations can be done in order one time from both the ends right this is a very powerful feature of array deck that we must know right talking about the operations right if you want to add something at the beginning you can say add first okay or you can use a method called as offer first these are two methods which are doing the same work there is a minute difference if due to let's say capacity limitation you don't have men memory or you're restricting the size of the queue and you're trying to add some element then add first will throw an exception will throw an exception just like other add methods we have discussed the offer method will return false that okay i could not return this element i could not add this element similarly we have remove first and poll first methods so remove will throw an exception poll will return true or false get first will throw an exception peak will tell me whether the element like if i could not get that element it will throw an exception Peak will tell me null. I could not remove that element. That might happen, right? There is add first. There is add last. Offer last. Remove last. Poll last. Get last. Peak. Last. Now, if you ask me what methods I would be using, I would be using offer first, poll first, peak first. So, if you want to do operations at this end, you want to add something, use offer first. If you want to remove something from the front use poll first and if you want to look at what is this element you can use peak first right same operations if you want to do at this end what you will do you will say offer last i want to add something here i want to remove something from here i will say poll last and i want to see something what is this last element so i can say peak show me the last element this tech so that is about the operations of now let us look at a code demo for deck so let us create a array deck object you can say array deck of let's say integer deck equals to array deck and in this deck i can add elements i can say uh, offer so there is a offer method as well offer first is there offer last is there 
seconds okay let me show you offer first let's say 12 tech dot offer first let's say 15 tech dot offer offer last let's say 20 tech dot offer let's say 30 let me show you what in what order the elements have been inserted s out i will say deck and let's run this code I'm getting 15, 12, 20, and 30. So first I had 12 offer first. I said in the beginning I want to add something. 15 gets added here. Then I say offer last 20. So 20 gets added here. Then I said offer 30. Offer is actually behaving like offer last. Offer and offer last, they are doing the same work. This is how your deck is getting created. Similarly, if you want to remove something, you can call the poll method. So you can say S out deck dot poll last give me the last element s out tech dot poll first give me the first element and uh, if you want to see now what is the new first element you can just call peak so you can say s out tech dot peak first show me the new first element and s out show me the new last element peak last let us run the code and see so this is our deck now i say uh, give me the last element so it removes 30 it's gone give me the first element it removes 15 it is gone show me the first element the first element is 12 show me the last element the last element that is how easy it is to work with deck and i hope you understood the concept let us talk about priority queues Priority queue is a special type of queue in which each element is associated with a priority value. For example, if uh, people are standing in a queue and you might want to give priority to the senior citizens, maybe age is a criteria in which people will get their tickets. Okay, Senior people will get their ticket first, young people will get their tickets later. So basically elements that we are going to serve in the queue, they will be served according to a certain priority. Higher priority elements are going to be removed and it is up to you how do you define the priority okay maybe a big number has a more priority or maybe a lower number has a more priority we can have a max priority queue we have a min priority queue we can insert like people can join the queue right but maybe this is 16 years this is 20 years and this is maybe uh four years right now if i say okay i want to remove someone i'll remove the person with the maximum i'll remove person 20 right so this will get removed so people can join the queue but when i'm going to remove people the people with the higher priority will get out first right so the underlying data structure for a priority queue it's a heap we can have a mini or a maxi i will not be able to dive into the details of heap at this point we'll be looking at how do we use the java priority so the operations that are supported we can insert something inserting in a queue it's called as a offer right I can offer some data inside the queue. I can look at, if I want to see who is standing at the front of the queue that is called as peak. And if I want to perform deletion, I want to remove someone right, from the queue that, that is called as poll. We'll be looking at these methods right? and insertion and deletion. They are login methods looking who is at the front, the order one method, right? So let us do a quick code, code demo as well. So we have, uh, how to work with the queue this is the code for a queue a priority queue also is a class that implements the queue interface okay so right now it was a fifo queue now i'm going to change it to a priority queue right so rest everything will change so if you want to add add method will also work but if you want to use the offer method i can use the offer method as well. i can say queue dot offer some numbers uh, 10 We'll change the data later. I have 10, 0, 8, maybe 7, and let's say uh, 9. Right now, if I say okay, I want to print the entire queue. Let's see what output do we really get. Okay, so I'm getting this output 0, 7, 8, 10, and 9. Now I want to look at what is the first element. I'm in this case the lowest element it's getting priority right so you see zero is coming 
at the front of the queue rest of the queue is not actually sorted only the uh, priority element it comes to the front of the queue right so zero is there if i say okay i want to look at this element so this element is zero and i want to remove this element so it removes zero and now what is the next lowest element in the queue that is seven so seven comes to the front of queue if i make it 17 then the next lowest would be eight right so let's let me run it once again now i have zero nine eight seventeen and ten the lowest element it is at the front right then I, if i remove zero the next lowest is actually eight so that comes to the front so if i remove that element or if i look at what is that element i get that element eight. using the peak operation you can see the element using the pole operation you can remove the priority element now you might ask if i want to reverse the order okay uh, so in that case you can pass one more par com comparator so i can say okay comparator dot reverse order this is exactly going to reverse the comparison a min priority queue becomes a max priority queue in this case the highest element it's going to get a priority right so now you look at 17 is standing at the front if we remove 17 10 is standing at the front and there is no specific order for rest of the elements that is unpredictable we are only worried about the element at the front should be either the min element or the max element this is about priority queue in java let us talk about a set interface now so what is a set mathematically it is a collection of elements that cannot contain duplicate elements okay uh, so set in java it models the mathematical set abstraction now the set interface that we have seen it contains only the methods inherited from the collection so that means there are no additional methods inside the set interface all the methods are inherited from the collection but it adds the restriction that the duplicate elements are prohibited everything all the methods which are there in collection right the same methods are there in set except the condition that duplicate elements cannot be present there are three classes in java that provide the implementation of set there is hash set there is link set linked hash set and there is preset so let us try to understand the differences between the three implement so as i discussed there is hash set tree set and linked hash set so hash set stores the elements in, inside a hash table it is the best performing implementation however it makes no guarantees regarding the order of iteration you say okay i inserted 10 20 15 18 inside the set and if you start uh, iterating over the elements you are not guaranteed to get any order you might get 20 18 10 and 15 so the elements will come out in any random order right so it does not ensure any kind of ordering on the hash set the internal data structure is a hash table and there is a linked hash set so it is implemented again as a hash table and along with the hash table we maintain a linked list so that means these elements are going inside the hash table but also we uh, like chain them together so that we are able to maintain the order of insertion so it has implemented a hash table with a link list running through it so it combines the features of hash table and a link list and orders its elements based upon the order in which they were inserted so basically it maintains the insertion order okay so it's going to give you the features of the hash set along with the ordering that is maintained there is one more thing that is called tree set it stores elements in a red black tree so red black tree is a self balancing binary search tree which is a height balanced tree and it orders its elements based upon their values and it is subsequently slower than the hash set basically whenever we talk about bst right and it is a height balanced bst so if you have to do an insertion searching inside in such a tree where the tree height is log n so it's going to take uh, all the methods like inserting data finding data they are going to take order of log n time inside a preset whereas on hash set and linked hash set the time complexity is going to be order one on average right so basically the advantage of tree set is that it keeps your data sorted linked hash set keeps the same order as input hash set it is the fastest and it is the but it does not give us any guarantees on the order so these are three different implementations of set in java let us look at the code demo for uh, hash set okay if i want to create a set let's a set of integers 
is this is equal to new hash set right now i want to do something on this let us import as well right java dot util dot set the import has been done let us add few numbers into it it's a set dot add uh sorry s dot add some numbers it's a 10 s dot add 20 s dot add 18 and s dot add let's say 18, right and s dot add 40. So i've added few numbers so let me display s s out the set let us run this code and see what do we get so i'm getting 18 20 40 10 and 15 you see the order is random there is no fixed order 18 20 40 10 15 so it's it's kind of a random order right if i want to add like if i add a duplicate element once again so if i say okay add 10 once again and if i run this code you will see this it will not store the duplicate elements only one 10 is stored even if i added one once again the duplicates get filtered out so no duplicates are, al are allowed in the set right? suppose i want to remove an element so i can say s dot remove 40 right? this will remove 40 from the set and uh, what is not there right? and suppose if i want to check if a particular element is present or not so if i can say s dot contains uh some number 20 so you can say yes it is present or i can simply say uh just do s out whether 20 is present or not so s out s dot contains so it will give me true or false whether this element is present or not so i will get a true here right so 20 is present these are the three fundamental methods add remove and contains and if you remember these are the methods they were part of collection interface as well we can use these methods on any uh any data structure that we have seen so far right and all of them they inherit from the uh, collection interface uh there are few more methods we, which we have with the collection interface is empty we can check size how many elements are there in the set clear remove all elements from the set and uh We'll also see how do we use set with custom objects so let me first first show you the size method how many elements are there in this set so currently we have four elements so this method will uh, tell me okay there are four methods but okay. uh, there are four elements inside it now we have worked with a set of integers now, sometimes we might have to work with a set of a complex class maybe a set of books set of students a set of uh, payment ids or set of debit cards right anything anything can come here so data type can be anything so let us see how do we implement set with a custom data type and what will change okay before we uh, discuss the custom set there is one more thing so we just discussed that okay we can use a hash set class in java but we can also use linked hash set and we can also use tree set so i'll comment this out and i'll show you two more examples instead of creating a hash set i can create linked hash set in java and if i use this you will see i will be able to maintain the same order as insertion in this set so if i remove 40 i will get 10 20 18 and 15 so this for this follows the order of insertion right and if i use something like a tree set that is slower because it uses a self balancing binary search trees doing add and remove it's going to take log in time on a tree set but it's going to maintain elements in a sorted order so let's see that as well now the elements are sorted in the set because we are using a tree set so i hope you are able to understand the differences between hash set link set and tree set now we will move into a set with a custom class set of custom objects let's see that now let us discuss how do we use set with a custom class now suppose you want to create a set of books what I have done, I have defined a book class in which book has three properties ISBN, name and price as the attributes of a book. What I am doing, I want to create a set in which every item is of the type book. Now let us uh, insert few books in, into this hash set. I can say books.add. Let's say I want to create a new book. Each book should have a name, a ISBN which is a unique code and let's say the price of the book. And let me say, okay, I'm going to add few more books. And here I make the name as let's say Java. ISBN is two. And let's say I change the price, right? 
Now, if I let's say go and run this code, let us see how many um, books we will have. So, s out um, books dot size and let's say s out books. I also want to see what are the books that the set is stored. So, I am storing three books and you can see C++ book is getting stored twice right? and Java book is coming once. Now, why, why is this happening? Why it is not able to filter out that these two books are really same? The reason is we are creating this object using new, right? So for the set to know whether these two objects are same or no, there is no way, right? So we are creating a new object that will treat that these, these are two different objects created at two different memory locations. Maybe this is 1056, this is 2080. So for, for set, these two books are different because they are two different objects in the memory, right? We need a way to tell this set that, okay, you should consider these two objects as same. In order to do that, one thing we need to do is we need to define so internally it is using uh, the concept of hashing, right? So it's going to compute the hash code for an object. You have to tell me how do I compute the hash code? So for that, I need to uh, override a method which is called as hash code. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to override a method called as hash code. In this case, if I want to compute the hash code of a book, maybe I want to say, okay, compute it only on the basis of ISBN. ISBN is a unique number. So let me do it once again now. Let's see if something changes or not. So again, it is not changing. So when I'm hashing the books, Although the books are getting hashed on the basis of ISBN, still the set does not know whether the two books are equal or not. So what happened? We uh, computed the hash code for this book, inserted it into the set. This book went into the set. We again computed hash code for this book. It also went into the set. Two objects, they can have the same hash code. That is okay. And uh, the thing is, I need a way to tell the set, consider these two objects are equal. So maybe, I want to say that uh, so I need to uh, provide a method that is called as equals method. Okay. So let's see how do we write this method. So there is a pretty standard template to do it. So whether two objects are equal or not. So whenever you're inserting a new object, let's say you're inserting this object into your hash set, it's going to compare that whether such an object is present or not. So why, at what location it's going to compare, it's going to uh, compute the hash code and it's going to check whether we have uh, something at that location or not. So suppose C++ was there, some other book Python was there. Suppose they two, two had the same hash code. So it's going to compare whether these two are equal or not, whether these two are equal or not. So this concept will be a little more clear if you understand the technique of separate chaining. Right? Different objects, they can have a same hash code if they have the same ISBN or the hash function is producing the same value for two different numbers as well. It can happen, right? But what we need to do is we need to tell that, okay, the two objects are equal if their ISBN is same. Right? So what I will do is, uh, what I have done here is I'm saying that, okay, um, you're, I'm giving you an object. So I say, okay, book B1, compare this object equal to B2. They're, they're two, uh, these two objects are equal in like two, three scenarios. I'll discuss what are those scenarios. Suppose I create a book B1 which is equal to new book. And I say, okay, B2 is a book which is equal to B1. So in this case, what is happening? I have just one book object, both B1 and B2, they are pointing to same, right? If, B, I, if I make any change in B1, it will also affect in B2. So what I'm doing that if this is equal to O, that means if the current object and the other objects, they're referring to the same memory, that means they're equal, right? If O is null, if one of the object is null, they cannot be equal. Or if the two objects, they belong to the different class. So suppose if I compare a book with a student, they can never be an equal. I am returning false. Otherwise, any given object, I typecast this into book class. And then I compare that is the ISBN of my book is equal to the ISBN of other book. If this is the case, consider the two book objects to be equal. If I add this equals method, my hash set will come to know that, okay, these two books, they have the same ISBN. I will not insert them again. Even if I, now, now look, I have only two books, okay. And C++ is stored only once. Now, even if I change the name of this book, I say, okay, this is C++ version two, and the price has been increased to 120. 
will hash that store this book the answer is no because it is only going to compare on the basis of isbn if isbn is same i will not again store this book right but if you want okay the two books are equal if their name is same if their price is same if their isbn is same then in the equals method you can have two more conditions along with the isbn that i should match all the three parameters for the comparison the equals method is important so you need to override this method to tell the set in what scenario you should consider two objects as equal so i hope you are getting it and uh, that's all for this implement let us talk about the final data structure that is a map a map contains values on the basis of a key that means it contains information in the form of key value pairs just like a restaurant menu whenever you go to a restaurant you say okay i want to have a burger and you immediately get to know the burger is 50 i want to have a pizza the pizza is 200 i want to have a coke the coke is let's say 70 there is a key there is a value associated a map contains unique keys that means i cannot have a burger twice in my menu okay a map is useful if you have to search update or delete elements on the basis of key so we do not ask okay what item is after burger or what item is coming before pizza the ordering is not that important to us what is important that given a key what is the value associated with that item and i want to okay coke is out of stock so i want to delete this key value pair or something new has come up i want to insert that key value pair right? for operations like these map is a very good useful powerful data structure and most of these operations they run in order one on average so search is order one on average update is order one on average delete is order one on average so very powerful data structure now uh, let us uh, talk a bit more about map java platform contains three general purpose implementations one is your hash map another is your tree map another is your linked hash map so the behavior and the performance is same as the way hash set tree set and link set work right so hash map internally uses a hash table it's the technique called separate chaining that is used to implement a hash map so to understand hash map we'll do a separate video where we'll dive into the internals of a hash map tree map is like a self balancing binary search tree and linked hash map is your hash table and it also maintains a linked list of the elements in which uh, like it changes the elements through the linked list as well uh, in the order in which they were inserted so it's more complex than a hash map map does not allow duplicate keys just like a hash set we do, cannot have duplicate elements but we can have duplicate values for example burger can cost 50 noodles can also cost 50 the value can be duplicated but the key must be different right hash map and linked hash map they allow null keys and values but tree map does not allow null key or a value right tree map you cannot store a null key a map cannot be traversed so you cannot directly iterate on the map so you need to convert it into set using key set or entry this we will look into the code demo talking a bit more about uh, the hierarchy in java there is a map interface okay and hash map is an implementation for the map interface right? there is a linked hash map which builds on the top of your hash map class right hash map is a class linked hash map is also a class tree map is a class that implements your sorted map interface sorted map interface is again an a uh, child interface of map right it it kind of extends that map here ordering is important right you get the uh, keys in a sorted order here you get keys in the order in which they were inserted and hash map it is the fastest here you don't get any ordering on the key this is the difference between the implementation also uh, the operations are order one here on average the operations on tree map they are order of log n on average why because it is using a self-balancing binary search tree okay? okay so here i have implemented a map object by using the hash map class right so i've created a map called as menu and i'm going to add certain items in so i can say menu dot add it say uh, the item is dosa and the price is 200 menu dot add let's say the item is burger the price is 50 we are getting a error here so the method is called as put hash map we don't have the add method because it does not inherit the collection interface okay i told you map is separate from um, map interface is not uh, it's not a child interface for of collections interface okay, so it has method called put it does not have a method called add I can put key value pairs like this. I can say menu dot put 
noodles and maybe some price and here i can say s out show me the menu let's see if we get something here so let's see what do we get if i run this code in the meanwhile i will write down some more methods i can see there are i can see the uh, list of key value pairs that are stored inside this map i can also remove something i can say menu dot remove i give burger i just need to give the key the burger will get removed from the map i can also search that if my menu contains some item like dosa i can say contains key this is the method and i can check whether it is present so you can say yes the out uh, s out dosa found so you can do this as well but after removing burger we have two items noodles and dosa in our map right so dosa is there so dosa found it's get it, it gets printed now let us also talk about how we can iterate on the map there are multiple ways right so what we can do is okay i just uh, written the three ways to iterate so that we can save some time so the way one is i can do i can create an object of the type map dot entry and this object is uh, iterating over uh, all so map menu dot entry set is a method that gives me the list of key value pairs where each key value pair is considered as a entry right i'm saying okay give me all the entries and given any entry i want to get the key and i want to get the value so that is one way so you are printing the first entry the second entry and then the third entry that is one way another way is if you want to just get the keys of the map you can say okay menu dot key set so it will give me all the keys like dosa burger noodles and you are iterating over these keys those keys are things then you can say okay i want to iterate over the values that are 250 70 i just want to iterate over these values so you can call the method called menu dot values and it will give you a set of values and you can iterate over this set using a for each loop and for every value you can print it i'll just run this code and show you the output you can see i am able to iterate over the uh, uh, keys i am able to iterate over the values and i am also able to iterate over uh, key value pairs right so this is coming from this loop right? and apart from it there are some more functions which can come handy so you can i would suggest can try those methods is empty whether the map is empty or not size how many elements we have here clear out everything in the map right this is clear method is helpful if you are working with multiple test cases every time you have to load new items and discard the previous items from the hash maps instead of destroying the object and creating a new object it's better to clear out everything from the previous map so then there is get or default if the key is found you want to return some value uh, you want to return the value or if the key is not present you want to return some default value this is something you can use so for example i can say menu dot get uh let's say uh pizza so pizza i have not inserted if the pizza is not there i can say the default value is let's say zero that means um in this case i will get an answer that is zero s out this value right what i'm getting i'm getting zero that means pizza is not present the default value if the item is not present i think the default value for that item is zero i can also say uh, i want to put pizza if it is not there so menu dot put if absent i can say okay it will first check if the item is not there if pizza is not there put pizza inside the map and put the value of pizza as 200 if i go and run this now it will first insert pizza because it's not there so it's basically using the put method with a condition now if if i inquire about give me the price of pizza now the pizza is present because we have added it and i'm getting the pizza price as that's all for map right and now what you can do is you can also have a custom uh, class here you can also have something more complex here for example list of integers list of books key can be of any type value can be of any type but if you're using a custom key again you will have to overwrite your hash code method and the equals method this we did in the case of hash set as well one more thing we can do is if you um, want to replace this with a linked hash map you can do that everything will remain same and your ordering will also be maintained and you can also uh, replace it with a tree map if you want everything will remain same except the internal structure will be now 
uh, it will be using a self balancing uh, BST line. So you can also do a tree map kind of a stuff here. We need to import it. Uh, tree map. Map is important. the code will work fine. Except now the elements will be sorted according to their um, keys, right? Let us begin by revisiting the concept of an array. Array is a very simple data structure that represents a linear collection of elements of the same type, right? So the concept of array is there in across all languages. In Python, it is called as list. In C++ and Java, it is called as an array, right? And most of the time, it is of the same type. But in Python, the arrays can also store elements of the different type. So arrays are used to store multiple values inside a single variable. I say, okay, this is a container. The name of the container is just one variable, but it is going to hold multiple values. Right? Instead of declaring separate variables for each value, we just create one variable. Now this helps us because suppose you want to store 100 integers, you will not create 100 variables. Instead, you will create one array. And in this array, you will have multiple buckets. Each bucket is referenced by an index. Okay. If you want to store something at this position, indexing always starts from zero, right? We will say, okay, array of zero, I want to store the number four. At this position, if I want to store something or I want to update something, I will say, okay, array of one should store five or it should be 15. Right? So I can update the value anytime I want, right? So this is the syntax, right? So the variable name is array. And how do I create it? So if I want to create an array of integers, I will say int followed by square brackets followed by arr followed by here we will see there are a few different ways one is we can use new keyword to allocate some memory or we can directly give the values which we, which we want to initialize the array with right so let us jump in directly into the code and see uh, various ways to create an array and work with them so first of all i'll say okay i want to create an array so this time I'm just initializing it with some random numbers. I'm not using the new syntax. We will do that as well. This creates an array. If you do S out ARR, let us understand what happens behind the scenes in the memory. If you do this, right? So let me go and run this code. I will see some, some kind of address in Java. It is called as object reference. So I see this number. Now what is happening? If you uh, dive a little bit into uh, what is happening in the memory, right? When your program is executing your RAM memory is divided into, into two parts. One is your stack memory and one is your heap memory. Both of these memories have their uh, different properties. Any function that you're calling, it goes into stack and it creates a stack frame out of it. right? And when you're creating this something like this, you say, okay, uh, I'm doing index this that is equal to 20. When you create a primitive variable like this, X is a bucket it is created here and it is storing 20. But when you create an object, Java array is an object. Right? The actual object it is created in the heap. So your 1, 4, 6, 8, 9, it is created in the heap. And the address of this object, whatever is this address, 264, right? So 264 is stored in a variable which is there in the stack. And this is storing 264. That means the variable in the stack frame is pointing to the array object. So we call this ARR as a, this is a object reference. This ARR is not the array itself. It is referring to the array, right? So this is how it is created, uh, behind the memory, right? Now, when you're going to print ARR, it's not going to, uh, print the contents of the array. Instead, it is going to print, um, what is stored in ARR, right? If you want, okay, I want to print the contents of this array, right? So what I will do, I will say, okay. I need a way to iterate on this array and convert everything uh, and print everything, right? There is an inbuilt function that we can use. So there is a different class. Okay. It's, there is a class called as arrays and it is part of java.util. So arrays class has certain helper methods to work with these kinds of arrays. In this, these methods, we have to pass the array object and get a, get our work done. So one such method is to string. I, I will give you some kind of array and you want, I want you to convert this into a string like representation that can be printed using system dot out dot intelligence. So let me give this array. And now if I show you what is the output, let's see. So now I'm getting this array. So I'm hoping that you're able to understand why this is working, right? Now what could be the logic behind this two string? 
it is doing nothing but it is doing a traversal on the array using a for loop and it is adding everything into a string so it says okay i'll start the string with the square brackets then i will add the zeroth element then i will append the first element and so on something like this it is doing but what is happening it is simply iterating over the array so if i talk about how much time it will take it will first take order of n time to iterate over all the elements of the array okay so let us look at one more method uh, in this array so let me create one more array let me call it call it as uh, some array let me call it as array 2 this is equal to new int so i'm saying okay let me create an array this time i'm not going to define you the uh, give you the data but i'm simply giving you size of the array that okay i want an array that should be able to hold 10 numbers uh, one thing you can do is you can manually initialize uh, every index you can say array of 0 should be 8 or let's say i want to fill 5 in every position right uh, one way is you put a loop and update every index right? or you uh, read input that we will see very soon but there is one more method if you want to initialize an array with a particular number so that method is called as arrays dot fill look at this there is a fill method and you can say okay i want to fill this array with a number that is 12 so you need to pass the array object that is array 2 and maybe the value that you want to fill maybe i want to fill with the number 13 now if i show you the output i can say s out uh, array 2 but i have to first convert it into a string so that i can print it arrays dot to string that is array 2 let me print the second array can you guess what the output would be the first element would be 8 which i have overwritten okay, so this is updating the zeroth element and rest all the elements will be 13 this is what we are getting right the fill method is going to fill this array with 13 at each position and so on and first zeroth index i am updating as 8 so i get 8 followed by all 13s that is another method present in arrays class if arrays dot to string arrays dot fill one more method that is coming into my mind it is very popular we need it often this method is called as arrays dot sort that is also present in this arrays class so i can say okay let me sort this array i want to put all these numbers into ascending order so i say 1 14 um, 81 so i just randomize the numbers so that after sorting i can see they are actually in the sorted order if I run this code now, you will see this array, it's going to be in the sorted order. So you see, the array is got, uh, getting sorted. So internally, it uses something like a quick sort kind of an algorithm. And the running time complexity of the sort method, it is order of and log n. Okay, so this is something that you should. Okay, so let us look at one more uh, fundamental thing in arrays, that is reversal. So there are uh, three ways to tra or two ways to traverse the array. One is that I can find out the length of the array, and then I can go over every index. If I talk about this array, I know there are five elements. So the indices are zero, one, two, three, four. So uh, array object has a property called as length. So if I say okay, I want to see the length of the array. So s out uh, array length. I can say this is given by length attribute of the array object so i can say array dot length this will give me okay this particular array has five elements so and if i have to iterate i can say okay for i equal to zero the index starting from zero i less than array dot length i plus plus and what i will do i will say s out array of i this is going to print the ith element of the array and we are doing it for all indices less than 5 we do not go till 5 but we go till less than 5 because the indices start from 0 and they go till n minus 1 so this is n the last index will be n minus the other way is you can also use uh, enhanced for loop also known as for each loop right so you can say okay for every integer x that is present in this array i want to print that x in this case x is not your uh, index but x is the value that that is contained in this array 
if it is like 1, 6, 9, 14 and 81. So in the first iteration, x will take the value 1. The next iteration, it will take the value 6. Then it will take the value 9. Then it will take 14 and then it will take 81. If I simply print the value of x, it will again give me uh, the contents of. These are two ways to iterate on the array. So if you want to iterate on some part of the array, better go with the for loop. If you know that, okay, I want to uh, iterate over all the values, then the for each loop is a more simpler syntax. Okay, But the first loop is more powerful because you can start at any point, start at any index and you can stop at any index. So let's run this code and see that we are able to iterate on this. Okay, so we can see uh, we are able to iterate 1, 6, 9, 14 and 81. This is coming from the for loop and 1, 6, 9, 14 and 81. This is coming from the for each loop that we have written. Okay, let us look at another way of building an array. Many problems will require you to reading n numbers and storing them and working with them. So for example, a very simple use case is we have to read n numbers and we want to print them in reverse. So without storing them, we cannot print them in reverse. That means we will need an array to do it. So how do we read n numbers? So it's very simple. First of all, we need a scanner in Java. So scanner is used to uh, scanner object is used to read something from the command. Okay. Second, so okay. First, tell me how many numbers are there. The method is called as next. Once you know n, you can say okay, I'm going to create an array. How do we create an array? Let's say I want an integer array and I can say this is new. Here I define uh, what is the size of this array. This will create an array of size n. Now I want to read this array. Again, it is pretty simple. I will read the 0th index, 1st index, 2nd index up to n minus 1th index. It's okay, i less than n, i plus b. And in every iteration, I can say okay, array of i is going to hold n value that will read from the user. I can say scanner.next. Scanner.next int will pick one number from the command, put it in the ith bucket. In Once I am done, I want to print them in reverse. Printing is easy. So, how do we print it? I can say, okay, I can start from the last index that is n minus. I can go till the first index that is 0, i minus. So, I just need to reverse the loop that I am uh, using to iterate over the array. And I can simply uh, iterate it in the reverse direction. So system dot out dot print ln array of i. Let us go and run this code and see. Suppose I want to uh, read five numbers and print them. So let's say the numbers are uh, 10, 20, 30, 40. So you can see I'm able to print 50, 40, 30, 20. And so what happened? I created an array of size n. Then I stored numbers. I said, okay, go over index zero and read one number from the command line. So it, it read 10, it stored it here. Then I becomes one. It is reading one number again, scanner dot next int, the next integer in the line. It is reading, it is storing here and so on. So 30, 40, 50. Then what I did, I iterated from the last index, which is n minus one till zero. In this direction, I iterated and I printed array of i. This will print my array in the reverse order. The next thing I want to talk about arrays is array of objects. Okay. We have seen how do we create an array of primitive data types like integer. Similarly, you can make a prim, uh, array of float, array of boolean, right? Primitive data types you can work with. But what is an object? So complex data types like strings. String is an object. Okay, you can also have a user defined class and you want to store uh, objects of that class in your array. So let us see how that actually happens at the memory level and also at the syntax level, right? So suppose I have uh, I have a book class. I'll just uh, delete this method. In this book class, I have defined three attributes of the book. One is ISBN, which is your unique book code, a name, and a price. And I also have a constructor to create a book object. Right? If I want to simply create one book object, how I will do it? I will say, okay, I want a book B. This is equal to new book. In this new book, I want to pass the name of the book, and ISBN and a price. I say, okay, these are the three attribute or uh, three values that I'm going to initialize this book with. So this just creates one book object. But what we really want, we want to create an array of book. How do we do it? We say, okay, book followed by square brackets. 
that is the data type of the array then you have to give a variable name i say okay the name of the array is called as books let's keep it intuitive and followed by new book suppose i want to store three books in an array right? this is going to be three now what it's going to do right so as i discussed in an integer array your memory is going to get divided into two parts one is your start memory which your main is getting called and we have a variable called as books which is going to refer to an array that is capable of holding three now this is this position is books of zero this is books of one and this is books of one. now how do i put a book here so one option is that okay i have created a book object b already so b is a book so b is also created here b is pointing to a book that is a c++ book c++ book has some address let's say 104 b is storing this value 104 now i want to put this book inside this array so i cannot like physically i i cannot say okay this object will go inside this box in the heap no this is now not how it happens the way to do it is you will have to say that books of zero it is going to hold b books of zero is going to hold b that simply means that whatever is the value in stored in b it is also stored in here so this value is one zero that what does it mean so it simply means that books of zero is referring to the c++ object c++ book object that is present in the heap this is how it is getting stored in case of array of integers it is different in case of array of integers you say okay uh, array of zero this is equal to five the number is directly stored here right but when you say books of zero this is equal to b uh, books of zero is holding the address of this book object you might say okay this this might be the reason um, because we have created a b reference variable and then we are copying that value even if you do something like this you say okay uh, books of one should be equal to new book and let's say this is a java book uh, with code 2 and price is let's say uh, 200 and let's say books of 2 is a new book which is let's say a python book and uh, code is let's say three the price is let's say 150 something like this let's say we have right? now books of zero books of one books of two what is happening when you're doing this statement so this is even doing the same work just that this new book object is getting directly stored inside books of one so that simply means so whenever you use new book it creates a book object in the heap memory right it's not going to create inside the array so java book is created somewhere in the heap maybe this location is 216 and this address is getting copied here so this is going to be 216 that means books of 1 is going to refer to this java object and when i say books of 2 this is equal to new book so again a new book object will be created in the heap let's say this is python and uh, it has some address let's say 780 so 780 will get copied here now you want to say okay i want to really verify this is how it is stored let me show you um, by doing an s out right if I say s out uh, books, what I'm going to get? I'm going to get the address of the whole array. Maybe this uh, books array is created at a location that is 200. I'm going to get this 200. But now you might say, okay, no, I don't want to print this. I want to print this entire array. If I say s out uh, arrays dot to string, basically I want to I uh, traverse on this books array. And I want to print it. Let me show you this output. What output and do we really get? Okay, let me run this one. Now you see what we are getting here is the address is the value that is stored in this books variable. And what we are getting here, these are the three addresses stored in this array, which are referring to the three books that we have. This this is C. Java and Python, three objects, their addresses are stored in the books array. And this is what we are getting. Right? You might say, I want to print the content. I actually want to print the object. I don't want to print the print an address. How do I do that? Right? The reason is Java does not know how do we print this book. Okay. How do we actually go to a location and print that object? So in order to do this, there is a uh, method called as two string that is present in uh, 
inbuilt classes okay for example when you print strings string has a two string uh, or if you print like some object right so many objects have their own two string method what we have to do uh we have to go inside the book class which is this and we have to say okay i want a two string method right? public string two string so this method should return a string so it is automatically giving me a recommendation that there is a default template in which i will concatenate these three properties of the book which looks good to me so i will just click ok and it will create a method for me right so when i want to say okay i want to convert this book into a string internally it is going to call uh, the two string method of book right which method i will tell you right let us go to array of objects when are you saying arrays dot two string it is going to iterate on each book and it is going to convert that book object into the string like representation if the two string method is overwritten right so we have overwritten that method so what we will get we will get the contents of the book let's run this code now once again and see what do we get now now you can see i'm getting a book that is the c plus plus book then the java book and then the python book you might ask okay can we do something uh, more on this object the answer is yes maybe you want to uh, sort this array of books right so do you think arrays dot sort will work want to sort this array of books will it work i might get an error okay so i am really uh, getting an error here why because the sort function does not know how do i compare two book objects okay so how do i do it uh, there are three ways that i have discussed in my previous video in which i have discussed java collections one is using a compare to method one is using a comparator and one is using lambda function so i'll give you a quick uh, way to do it which is using the lambda function in this video by so what i need to do i need to define one line function in which I will say okay how do i compare two book objects okay. the two inputs let's say book b1 and b2 so they can be any two books the sorting algorithm is going to pass book objects to this function followed by an arrow followed by i should return a number which is negative zero or positive right so if i return a number that is negative it simply means that my first book is smaller right okay and if i return a number that is positive that means my um, first book is bigger right i i need some way to convert these two books into the numeric values for example i want to sort these books according to their price so let's say i am comparing uh, c++ and java if i return 100 minus 150 what it, what does it return it returns a negative number that means the c++ book is smaller than the python book something like that let me show you if i say uh, i want to compare two book objects b1 and b2 and in return i will say that compare on basis on the basis of their price so i will return a number b1 dot price minus b2 dot price this is a shortcut way of writing a comparator right using a lambda function so i am comparing two books if the first book price is let's say 50 and second book price is 100 so this expression will return a negative number that means the first book is smaller and hence it will be placed first in the list right let me go and run this and we will see what happens so i'm getting now the c++ book followed by okay i, I forgot to print this after sorting right before sorting it is c++ java and python let us see what happens after doing the sorting right I'm getting C++ the least price then I'm getting the python book which is 150 price and then I'm getting the java book which is having a price of 200 okay so I hope you are really understanding how we are uh, doing the comparison and uh, we can uh, tell the sort function this is the parameter on which I want to do the sorting right so if you want to write more complex comparisons like multiple if else conditions then you have to uh, go with the comparator way of uh comparing the two books okay so that is how you work with array of objects and uh, i hope these concepts are clear
let us move on to the next concept that is how do we pass arrays to functions and what happens internally in the memory so let us discuss this concept for example uh, let's say i have a variable called as uh, money which is let's say i have 100 rupees and let's say i have a function called as uh, double money right so i say okay i will get some money and i want to double it so i can say okay money equals to twice of money and uh, that's it now i call this method i call the method called as double money and i give it money right and now i can say okay let me so let me call it as public void i'm not going to return anything public static void double money I, i've just i have i have a single variable right so basically what i'm trying to tell you is i have this money variable i pass it to a method called as double money which should which people might think that it's going to double it but let's see what do we really get if i print money here what do you think what output you can expect here let me go and run this code the output will be still 100 the money is not going to change so i'm still getting 100 so let us understand what is happening behind the scenes so this main function created in your stack memory this is your stack memory and there is a variable called as money and when you make a function call another function is called that is your double money and in this function you have another variable called as money it, it exists in a different scope it in a different part of the memory this money was 100 so when you call this function this money is getting copied here right copy right passed by value the value that is here it is getting passed here we are passing this value 100 and here you say money equal to twice of money you say okay i'll make it double i will uh, make it 200 now this function call is over it does not return anything this stack frame is destroyed and you are back here now when you print this money what you are going to get you are going to get just 100 now let us repeat this experiment in 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 a case instead of having one variable let's have a array object so i say okay i have uh, multiple friends and they have some money right? so i say friends money it's a integer array and let's say a friend has 100 200 and 300 and i create one more function called double money which is going to accept a money array or friends money right whatever you want to call it as in this case i iterate over this array for int i equal to 0 i less than money dot length i plus plus and i say money of i should be twice of uh, money of and again i do not do anything right? i do not return anything now i again call this function i call double money and i give friends money which is an array right? now what do you think will my array get doubled will my money in this array will it get doubled the answer is yes it will so let us see how and why it's going to happen so if i print friends money and if i show you the output now okay i have to use the method arrays dot to string so that i can actually print the contents of the array so code java dot util dot now this money is actually getting 200 400 you might think it is not doubling for the prim primitive data type but it is doubling for the array primitive behind the scenes what is happening we have already seen now let us see what is happening when you are passing an array so you have your stack memory okay, i told you the array is created in the heap memory your 100 200 and 300 they are created here right and they have some address let's say the address is uh, 556 this is the location at which the array is created when you called your main function it got created in the stack your variable friends money it is also created here what is this variable holding it is holding the address of the array so it is holding 556 now when you call this function double money you are passing the variable the object reference friends money to it okay so we are calling this function double money and it has a variable called as money in which 
what is the value that is getting copied it is not the array that is co getting copied it is the value inside this uh, function variable friends money it is getting copied right so in java everything is passed by value okay but in case of array what is the value that is getting passed it is not the array object it is the address that is getting passed you have 556 five, getting copied here right when you say okay money i equal to twice of money so this money is also referring to the same array when you access the ith location using this address you eventually end up here you say okay money of i should be twice of money you make it double make it 400 you make it 600 now this function is over this is uh this call is gone this link is also gone and when you come back again here and you try to access the friends money array the actual array has been changed right okay so although it appears like a uh, pass by reference but the concept is still called as pass by value in java okay but for the objects that are stored in the heap okay so objects in the heap when you pass them to a function their address is being passed okay that is something that you should know and now i hope you are able to understand what happens when you pass an array to a function to change the array the actual array will get changed okay if you want to create a copy of the array so you have to use some methods like clone or what right so that is how arrays are passed to a function now let us move on to two dimensional arrays okay so many uh, real life problems for example games and puzzles like tic tac toe they might require you to store data in the form form of a 2d matrix now if you want to store data in the form of a 2d matrix you need a two dimensional array right you can also have a three dimensional four dimensional n dimensional array right so how do we create such an array so i'll show you few ways to create these kind of arrays so first i need to define the data type and uh, in this case it's a 2d array so i will have to use these square brackets two times i'll tell you the reason why and then one way i can directly give the data right now if you look at this array it has three rows and four columns so it is like one two three and 400 this is like one object then i have four five six and 100 this is like another object and then i have seven eight nine and 100 seven eight nine and 100 this is like another object now how they are stored internally in the memory let us discuss for java a 2d array is nothing but it's a 1d array in which each each row or each uh, each row is like one object right so can i say it's a 1d array in of objects where each object itself is a one dimension so in the memory there is no 2d array created internally it's going to use a 1d array where i can say the zero row this this element is my array of zero array of zero itself is an array that is what i'm trying to tell here array of zero is of the type int square brackets that means array of zero represents 1d array array of zero is going to hold the address of another 1d array let's say this address is some something that address will be present here if i say array of one that is also going to hold the address of another array and array of two it's also going to hold the address of another array. this is array of one and this this is exactly how it is stored right and where is your arr the arr is here this variable it is in the stack memory and these arrays these four arrays they are in the okay so this i am saying this is a object a 2d array is nothing but it's a 1d array of objects 1d array of objects where each object is also an array so this treat it like this way right so treat it like this is one book this is another book this is another book right each row is one object now you might say okay prove me this is how it is stored so let us uh, go and do a s out let me show you uh, i can say arrays dot to string i want to print this array i give arr right and again i will import java dot util dot so if i make this import and i call this method arrays dot to string now what i am hoping to get will i get the contents of the array or will i get the, these addresses let us see what do we really get will i need to run this one. look at this i am getting three addresses 
what are these three addresses these are the three addresses of these three row objects that we have created this is 264 this is stored here this is 30c this is this is the address 30c and this is 1970 1197 this is the address of another and you might ask okay if i want to print a 2d array using a true two string method can i do that or should i iterate over this array i will tell you you can do both okay, so you can use an inbuilt method to print this entire array you can also iterate over this array let us first look at an inbuilt method if if you have a structure like this right, so you have to you just don't need to iterate over these values but instead you need to say okay uh, i also need to iterate the objects they are referring to right so basically it's kind of a recursive structure right so this is referring to some object this might also be referring to some some other object right so i want to go deep inside this structure and iterate over all the values right in order to do an iteration like this what i have to do i have to use a method called as arrays dot deep to string iterate deeply inside these structures and then print this array so i call this method right arrays dot deep to string what will happen it will go inside those arrays those rows as well and it will print them right if i go and run this code you can see this is the output that i am getting right so i hope you are able to understand the difference okay now how this 2d array is stored just a quick recap this array this arr is a 1d array which is holding three rows in it so three rows each row is a 1d array object containing four numbers so now let us do one more thing let us write a method called as print that is going to iterate on this 2d array right? so sometimes we have to manually use a for loop to iterate over a 2d array let's see how we can do it so public void uh, public static void let's say traverse input is a 2d array so i will create a reference variable arr right? how do i iterate if i simply say see s out arr dot length can you guess what is this length going to be what is the length of this array this array is holding three items this length is giving me the number of rows i have if you want to figure out how many rows i have in this array these are the number of rows how many columns i have in this that is nothing but the number of elements in each array is the number of columns so i can say if it is a fixed size array rows cross columns the rows will be nothing but uh, the number of rows will be nothing but array dot length how many columns i will have that is nothing but array of zero dot length the number of elements in the first array if this is same across like all the arrays the, the number of columns i know right so how do i iterate iteration is pretty easy i can say i equal to zero i less than the number of rows i plus plus and then i can say okay for j equal to zero j less than the number of columns j plus plus s out array of ij so let's see uh what does it really mean so if i have an array like this let's say one two three four five six seven eight nine this is one object another object this is another object array of zero right i iterate over rows i is zero so array of zero is fixed if i go over zero one two these are the row numbers for each row number i say okay i trade over the columns array of i gives me this then using this j gives me the column so array of 0 0 gives me 1 array of 0 1 gives me 2 array of 0 2 gives me this number so j is going along this direction i is changing across rows right so what i'm going i'm going over each ith object and then i'm using a j to traverse the elements of that particular row this is how we generally do the traversal right you can also do it other way around so i am iterating across the rows you can also iterate across the columns by changing the order of these okay if i show you the output i'll say okay I'll, i'm going to print them in the same line and after my row is finished i'm going to give a new line so i can say s out print ln so now if i call this method that is going to be traverse and i give this array 
I will see an output which looks like a 2D array. Right? Let us go and run this code. And you can see it. I am able to iterate over all the rows. And for each row, I'm able to iterate over uh, all the columns of that particular row or all the numbers in that particular. So I hope traversal is clear to you. Now, some of you might ask that, okay, can we do uh, some kind of sorting on this 2D array? Maybe I want to compare each row with some other row. Okay, so I want to do sorting uh, across the rows. I want to sort rows. And you might have a different criteria. You might say, okay, I want to sort on the basis of first element, or I might want to consider the sum of all elements right so how do i do that so it's very easy so consider each row as one object and i want to compare this with other objects right what i can do i can use arrays dot sort method it will assume that i'm going to give you a 1d array that's okay so it's going to and this this is actually a 1d array okay although the syntax is 2d array but java considers this as one element of the array this has another element of the array and this has another element of it. suppose if i want to sort according to their sum right what i have to do i'll say okay fine i will give you two objects what are the data types of these two objects these two objects are arrays i have int square brackets object one int square brackets object two and in return i, I want to uh, get their sum so i can say okay i can create some method called as get sum int public static int get sum given a 1d array i want to find the sum of that array i give some array i want to find the sum of that i want to sort these rows according to their sum so basically the row which has a higher sum should come at the end of this array how do i do it first let's write a helper function to get the sum so for now i can say uh, int sum equals to zero for int value inside this array. I can say sum equal to sum plus val, and I can return this. Finding the sum is pretty easy. Now here in my lambda expression, I can say okay, I am going to compare on the basis of sum of these arrays. So array one, which is my object one, minus get sum of array two, which is my object two. That's it. And if I do this, and now I want to show you the output, I can again print this array after doing the sorting. And let us see what do we really get. Now, if you look carefully, I'm getting this array first, which has the least sum. This array has a higher sum, and this array has even the highest sum. Why? Because I'm I have a very big element, 400. You can verify. So what I have done, I have written a a lambda function that is comparing two rows any like internally it will call some logic to compare two rows okay so it is comparing two rows according to their sum if you want to compare on the basis of first element or the last element that 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 can also be done so if i do this once again here i can say okay uh o1 dot get last element how do i get it can say okay o1 dot nth minus one that is giving me the last element and o2 of o2 dot length i'm saying okay let us compare on the basis of last element in that case this array will come first then this array will come and then this array will come if i go and run the code once again let's see what do we really get okay so i'm getting 10 100 and 400 that is how powerful these lambda functions are. They can also work with 2D arrays, but now you are not going to compare. Uh, you are going to come. You are going to treat each row as one object. Okay, that is something that you must learn. So we have seen how do we work with a 2D array, but we have not seen how do we take input a 2D array of size n cross m and read it from the user. Okay, so let us do that as well. First of all, I'll create a scanner. So that we can read numbers from the user. So scanner sc this is equal to new scanner. And uh, let's read how many rows we want to create. So number of rows is scanner dot next end, and number of columns is also going to be scanner dot. So I'm going to create a 2D array of size 
n cross m. So how do I do it? Pretty simple. So I define variable arr which is of the type int square bracket square bracket. This is equal to new int, and here I define the number of rows, which is n, and the number of columns, which is m. Once I do this, Java will create an array in which I have let's say n equal to three and m is four. So it's going to link these like that. Internally, this is how they will get created. Now, what I want to do, I want to read numbers and put put them here. I want to show okay, 1, 2, 3 is the first row, 5, 6, 7, 8 is the another row. How do I do it? I have to go to the zeroth index. Then I have to iterate over uh, from j equal to 0 till j equal to 3. 0, 1, 2, 3. Then I have to go to this index, read this array. I have to go to this index, read this array. Let's see how we can do it. I can say for int i equal to 0, i less than n, i plus plus. Then for each row, I need to read the elements j equal to 0 j less than m j plus plus and array of i comma j so in the ith row the jth cell i want to read a number scanner dot extent fine this is it it's once this is done i have read all the elements now what i need to do i need to print so i can say okay s out arrays dot uh, deep to string and I will give it I need to import java dot util dot so let us run this code and see are we able to read an array from the user or not let's say I, I want to have three rows and four columns I need to give data let's say I'll give 12 elements 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and so yes, I am able to create an array with three rows and four columns. And you can see first row, second row, and the third row. So this is how exactly we get a two-dimensional array, and this is how the memory representation of 2D array looks like. This is my variable arr. Okay. So let's move on to Jack Derry next. So we have seen how do we work with a 2D array, but we have not seen how do we take input a 2D array of size n cross m and read it from the user. Okay. So let us do that as well. First of all, I'll create a scanner so that we can read numbers from the user. So scanner SC, this is equal to new scanner. And uh, Let's read how many rows we want to create. Number of rows is scanner.nextint and number of columns is also going to be scanner. So I'm going to create a 2D array of size n cross m. So how do I do it? Pretty simple. So I define variable arr, which is of the type int square bracket square bracket. This is equal to new int, and here I define the number of rows, which is n, and the number of columns, which is m. Once I do this, Java will create an array in which I have let's say n equal to 3 and m is 4. So it's going to link these like that. Internally, this is how they will get created. Now, what I want to do, I want to read numbers and put put them here. I want to show okay, 1, 2, 3 is the first row, 5, 6, 7, 8 is the another row. How do I do it? I have to go to the zeroth index. Then I have to iterate over uh, from j equal to 0 till j equal to 3. 0, 1, 2, 3. Then I have to go to this index, read this array. I have to go to this index, read this array. Let's see how we can do it. I can say for int i equal to 0, i less than n, i plus plus. Then for each row, I need to read the elements j equal to 0, j less than m, j plus plus. And array of i, comma j. So in the ith row, the jth cell. I want to read a number and a dot extent fine this is it it's once this is done I have read all the elements now what I need to do I need to print so I can say okay s out arrays dot uh, deep to string and I will give it I need to import java dot util dot 
so let us run this code and see are we able to read an array from the user or not let's say i i want to have three rows and four columns now i need to give data let's say i'll give 12 elements 1 2 3 4 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 19 20 21 22 23 24 So yes, I am able to create an array with three rows and four columns, and you can see first row, second row, and the third row. So this is how exactly we get a two-dimensional array, and this is how the memory representation of 2D array looks like. This is my variable ARR. Okay, so let's move on to jagged array next. Let us discuss what is a jagged array, right? A jagged array is an array with variable number of columns. Variable number of columns in. Now, how this is possible? Let's see. Let's see an example. Let's say I have three columns in one row. In another row, I have let's say four columns, and in another row, I have just two columns. Can we create such an array? The answer is yes. Why? Because when you create a 2D array in Java, each bucket is referring to a array object. now each array object is independent of the previous object that we have created what i am saying is we, we are creating three different objects for three different rows and each object can have its different length for example this length is 2 this length is 4 and this length is 3 let's see how we can create an array like this now it's again a 2d array which looks like this 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 so in this case we don't have Fixed number of columns in each row. Number of columns are variable in each row. How do I do it? So let's see. I'll start by creating a scanner. Equal to new scanners is dot in. Now I'm just going to read the number of rows from the user. I say scanner dot next. Once I know the number of rows, I can initialize my array. I can say int square bracket square bracket. Arr. This is equal to new int. And here I just define the number of rows. Is okay. I need r number of rows. How many columns are there? I will tell you later. What does this code do? It creates an arr that points to an array that is going that will hold that will hold these array objects, but they will be created later. It's only going to create an array with r number of buckets inside. Okay, these these will be created later. This part we will do next try. now what i need to do i need to iterate over each bucket i equal to 0 i less than r i plus p now i am going to ask okay tell me how many columns you are going to uh, have in this row so i will ask the user so i can accept a uh, columns in current row how many columns so i will ask the user to tell me number of columns in the current row you can also output here s out uh, columns in current row tell me how many columns will have in the current row and then you can say s out uh, data in the current row maybe if i says i have to uh, three columns then i will run a loop three times to read those numbers so i'll say okay for int i equal or int j equal to 0 j less than uh, columns in the current row j plus plus now the thing is where should i store this data Uh, this array object is not yet created first i have to create an array object here in which i should be able to store data how do i do it i said find this array of i array of i is this bucket it should a uh, point to a new 1d array in which i can hold these many uh, these many numbers that is equal to columns in the current so this line of code will actually create this array And suppose this address is now seven zero two. So this is stored here seven, and this link is established. Now I can read data and I can store it. And this thing we will repeat for every row. I'm iterating over these buckets now, and I'm going to say okay, read the next number and store it here. So I can say uh, array of i comma j. This is equal to scanner dot that's it and in the next iteration we move on to the next row 
and we do the same work in we, we ask how many columns you have in the next row it says okay i have four columns so i create an array of size four and i link it here using this line and then i again read it okay i read these let me show you uh, by running this code that we can actually create a jacked array s out arrays dot uh, deep to string and i can give array here and again i have to import java dot ut so let's go and run this okay, i want to create an array with three rows now i have to tell me how many columns in the current row i say okay four columns and then I have to tell me what are the four numbers in that. So let's say one, two, three, four. Then in the next row, how many columns? Maybe just three columns. And the numbers are seven, eight, nine. Then in the next row, let's say two columns. The numbers are let's say ten and twenty. What do I see? I see a jagged array. Four columns, three columns, and two columns. This is how we can create an array in which every row has variable number of elements and this is called as a jagged array now we are going to look at dynamic arrays so far the arrays we have created they had a fixed size once you create an array of size n you cannot add more than n elements into it that is where dynamic arrays come into picture for example you are building a to-do list where you can keep on adding tasks every day and uh, you might be removing some old task as well so you do not know how many elements you would be storing in your list so you need something like a dynamic array in that case in java dynamic array is provided by the library uh, as a part of java collections framework the class is called as array list we will also see how this class internally works but before that we will look at a demo of using array list okay an array list is a dynamic array for storing elements it's like an array but with no size limit it also maintains the insertion order that means keep on adding elements and they will get added at the end of this array right so if i say okay i want to add six I want to add seven i want to add 12 they will keep on adding in this at the end of the array we can add elements we can also remove elements and it implements the list interface in java so we can use all the methods of the list interface here so list interface is part of collections framework and i've done a detailed video on collections framework link you can find in the description also you can uh, watch that video if you want to learn about more about the collections framework and various data structures present inside the java collections framework now how th this array list is implemented let us talk about how this array is actually dynamic how does it grow and shrink one way of implementing the array list is start with a some fixed size array so i guess in java this fixed size array is having a default size of 10 so whenever you say okay i want to uh, create an array list it will give you space for 10 elements but as soon as this gets full right you say okay i have used all the elements right what it will do it will double itself now you cannot double in the same memory because this memory might be occupied by some other data structure or some other part of the program what it does it looks for new memory in the heap where it creates an array of the double size and it's going to copy the old data into the new array so let's say this data was one two three four up to ten so it's going to copy all this data in the new array and then the remaining elements the remaining 10 boxes are available for putting some new data right once this gets full again you have to do the same thing again so double the old array by creating a new array copy the data from the old array and you have to delete the old array so in java the deletion is done by the garbage collector for example if this is my old array and i say old arr equal to null what does it mean no one is referring to this array this object becomes eligible for garbage collection right? okay so in other languages like c plus plus you have to use the delete keyword but but in java the garbage collector takes care of objects that no one is referring to so first let us first look at the demo right so to be precise in java uh, so java maintains something called as a load factor right? load factor is what percentage of your array is currently filled right so if i say okay if my load factor goes more than 0.7 that means if i have space for 10 elements 
and I put eight elements in this array, right? That means it is the time to double the array, right? So right now I was doing it full capacity, but you can also do it early. If your 70% of the array is full, right? So that is your current size upon your capacity. If this percentage exceeds 0 0.7, so Java triggers this function that doubles this array. So it creates a new array, copies the data here, and you have more space available for storing um, new elements. Okay. So ideally, if you know that, okay, I'm building an application in which I will require space for around 1000 elements. So it is better to initialize your array list with the initial capacity of 1000 so that your doubling does not happen again and again. And if you, okay, I need maybe uh, 1100 elements. So take a safer limit, okay. And you took, okay, I created an array with 1000 elements. That is fine. It will double one time. So from 1000, it will become 2000, right? In 2000, you can easily store 1100 elements. So basically, you should have a rough idea of the range, how many elements you would be needed. And accordingly, you can initialize a array list so that your repeated doubling operation can be minimized. And doubling is an expensive operation. Why? Because it copies all your data into the new array, which is going to take linear time, right? That is how the internals of the array list work, right? So let us also talk about features. Array list is a dynamic data structure and uh, it can grow dynamically. It can also shrink as we remove elements from the list. So again, there is certain criteria. Okay. When 20% of the list is occupied, I, I might shrink it to the half, something like this. We can have a conditional condition on shrinking as well. Just like we have a condition on growing. Second thing is it, it is ordered. It preserves the order in which the elements were added to the list. It is index based. So thus it's, it's an array internally, right? So it, it also has indexing. So if you want to get this element, we will say, okay, array dot get zero. It provides us with a get method and I need to tell, okay, this is the index I need to, um, access, right. And okay. And array list can also store, uh, it can only store object data types. That means it cannot store primitive data types like int. If you want to create an array list of ints, you will have to use the corresponding wrapper classes. Okay. So you have, need to have some idea about wrapper classes. I can create an array list of integer where integer is a wrapper class for int data type, right? It cannot be used for primitive data types. We require a wrapper class in that. And another thing is it is not synchronized. So if you need a concurrent data structure. Then there is a something called as vector, which is a synchronized implementation of array list. Okay. So th this concept is pretty advanced. If you're working with uh, multiple threads and stuff, then you might be using vector. So let us look at a demo of using array list. Before we jump into the code, let us talk a little bit about the kind of operations we can do on an array list. So one uh, common operation that we do is we want to access in ith element. So it is called as random access. That is done using the get function. So I can get any random element in order of one time, which is pretty obvious because internally it is accessing the array. Okay. Then I can add elements. I can add elements at the end of the array list, which will take order of one time, but you can also add elements in the middle of array list, which will require shifting of elements. Okay. Inserting elements in the middle, it's going to take order of end time. Similarly, deleting something from the middle is also going to take order of end time because the remaining elements will have to get shipped. Searching in general, it takes order of end time because it's going to use a linear search, right? But if you have a sorted array list, you can use your own binary search method or you can use collections dot binary search method to search in order of log n, uh, in order of log n time if your array list is sorted. Okay. So how do we create an array list? It's a predefined class in Java collections. I can say, okay, array list of a following type followed by name of the variable followed by new array list. Right? And th this will create an array list with the default size default size in java it is 10 right for example an array list of strings can be created like this and it does not work with primitive data types okay so i told you that you have to use wrapper classes so you will have to say array list of integer if you say array list of int it will not work so you will have to say array list of integer right this is equal to new array list 
that is how you will create a array list object in java next thing is uh, you can also give some default size so basically the array list class has three constructors in in one constructor you can you don't give anything so it it uses a default size of 10 in another constructor it accepts you give me the default size and i will create an array list of that capacity so i'm saying 50 that means it is able to hold 50 objects in this array list and once you reach 50 capacity it will double itself right and there is a third constructor as well in which you can initialize an array list from some other list or from, from some other collection as well right that can also be done for example in this case we have a list of strings and we are initializing the array list using this list that is the third constructor call that is being done right so one more point to note about array list is it allows us to store heterogeneous elements as well for example i can add an integer into it i can also add a string object into it right we can store objects with various uh, types in an array list instance also in this case when you are creating this array list object you don't need to parameterize the instance you don't need to define what kind of data it is going to hold it will hold all types of objects in it right so you can put a string you can put a book you can put a dog anything will work in the same array list. so that is about uh, how do we create an array list now i will show you a quick uh, demo as well so i did this demo in java collections video that i have already done so i have shown you that you can create an array list so the first four lines i show you we are creating an array list in which we have not defined the data type then we are pushing an integer then we are adding a string and then we are going to print it let me just run this code and let me show you the output i need to run this yeah so if you see here i am getting an array list in which one item is an integer object the other item is a string object so we can definitely do this so i'll comment it out then i can say okay uh, create an array list because array list implements an interface so i can say this uh, left hand side data type can be more generic it, it can be it can have list as the data type that is perfectly fine because an array list is an implementation of a list so i can call the add method to come add something at the end i'm saying add one add two add four then i can also use this add method by specifying the index so the add method is overloaded there are two add methods one which adds at the end and one which adds at a, a particular index i'm saying okay at the second index you should add 15 so it becomes like this one two four then at the second index which is zero one two i want to add 15 here it will become one two fifteen and four this is the output that we get right? then i've created another list in which i have added 25 and then i'm using a method called as add all add all is used if you want to add all items present in one list into another list add all will iterate over all items in list one and it will add them into list two so you will see 25 followed by all items that are present in list one are now present in list two so just like add we have a remove method so remove method is also um, there are two remove methods the one remove method which accepts an integer so if i show you something like this list dot remove so you can see one remove method accepts the index and second remove method accepts the object so if you have to give the object of the type integer you have to typecast into the integer data type so i can say okay integer dot value of one it will mean that i'm i want to remove one from this list but if i simply pass one it would mean that i want to remove the element at index one right that is how the remove method works right and if you want to search something then there is a contains method it will tell you okay whether the following integer or following object is present inside this list or not that is your searching method now there is one more method that is called as set so that means i want to update something so if i want to say okay i want to update the zeroth index and this is the object that i want to store at the zeroth index if i do this you will see at the zeroth index instead of 25 now the new element that i have stored it's going to be 50 and apart from it we can iterate over the list 
तो लिस्ट डॉट साइज गिवस मी हाउ मेनी एलिमेंट्स आर देयर इट नॉट द कैपेसिटी बट हाउ मेनी एलिमेंट्स आर करंटली प्रेजेंट दैट विल गिव मी एंड आई कैन यूज द गेट फंक्शन टू गेट द आई एथ एलिमेंट फ्रॉम दिस लिस्ट दैट इज वन वे ऑफ आइट्रेटिंग ओवर एन एरेलिस्ट यू कैन ऑल्सो यूज अ फॉर ईच लूप इफ यू वॉन्ट टू आइट्रेट ओवर द एंटायर लिस्ट एंड थर्ड वे इज यू कैन ऑल्सो यू क्रिएट एन आइट्रेटर ऑब्जेक्ट एंड वाइल आइट्रेटर डॉट हैज नेक्स्ट सो हैज नेक्स्ट टेल्स मी वेदर द नेक्स्ट एलिमेंट इज प्रेजेंट इन द लिस्ट और नॉट वाइल इट हैज एलिमेंट्स कीप ऑन आइट्रेटिंग एंड यू एक्सेस द नेक्स्ट एलिमेंट यूजिंग द नेक्स्ट मैथड सो दैट इज एन अदर वे ऑफ आइट्रेटिंग ओवर द एरेलिस्ट सो यू कैन यूज दिस मैथड्स एंड यू कैन वर्क विद एरेलिस्ट वाइल सॉल्विंग लॉट ऑफ प्रॉब्लम ओके सो दैट इज अबाउट एरेलिस्ट एंड इफ नीडेड यू कैन ऑल्सो रेफर द जावा और एकल डॉक्स to go in more details of these methods. now let us come to the final part of this tutorial so you so far you have worked with arrays you have worked with array list and now i want to show you if you want to build your own dynamic array class okay just for your uh, better understanding of array list suppose you are asked to implement an array list at your own how you would do it what we want to do we want to implement a class called as dynamic array so what what thing we learned first thing is it internally uses an array that means one data member of this class would be an array right then this array would have some size also we will say okay it has some default capacity right this capacity can be provided by the user or we it can have some default value as well so we will look at that right and then if you start putting elements start adding in elements in this array you also need to maintain how much array is full so maybe current size Maybe the current size is three, right? So zero, one, two. If if a next element comes, can I insert it at the current size index? Can I insert it at the third index? Yes, I will insert it at the third index. Let's say the element is four, and I will increment the current size, right? So it is clear that I need one data member that is array, one data member that is current size, one data member that is capacity, and maybe one constant where in which is going to store how much should be my uh, default capacity right? so that i can call it as default so by default the capacity of this array should be so let us create these data members so i have created an array right i have created a capacity i have created current size and i have created a default for which the value is 10 now user says okay i want to create a new dynamic array object how you are going to initialize uh these variables okay so suppose i do not give you any default capacity i will need a constructor right and in the constructor what i will do i will initialize my array equal to the default size okay a default of size 10 i will say okay the capacity variable is also equal to default right so why i need this capacity because capacity can keep on changing if 10 size 10 gets full i will make it 20 if 20 gets full i will make it 40 the capacity will keep on doubling and current size that is going to be zero right because i have not added anything but suppose if the user says okay no i am going to give you uh, the default size of the array then how do i do it so in the constructor i will accept okay you tell me the capacity i will uh, initialize my capacity equal to that capacity and i will create an array of that capacity right and current size is still zero okay so that is how the constructor is getting created so the third constructor in which i get another list and then i create this array i'm not creating that i'm writing a simplified version of an array list right now suppose i want to add something into my array list so how should i do it very simple i will define a method called as add and i uh, will i'm just printing the capacity as of now but i will remove this statement so that we, we can see while running the code So I can say array of current size. This is equal to data. Basically, in the beginning, my current size it is zero, and I get some data. Let's say data is five. So I said fine. Array of zero. This should be equal to five, and I say current size plus plus. So my current size becomes one. So that means next time I will do an insertion here. Again, I get a data that is six. What I do? I put it here, and I increment the current size to two. So the next time my insertion will go here. Now suppose I keep on adding elements, and after some time, my current size becomes equal to the capacity. 
okay so my capacity was 10 and my current size is also 10 that means i have already inserted 10 elements so if something like this happens that okay my current size it's going to be equal to the capacity what should i do i need to double my array so how do, how i am doing it let us try to understand that so let's say i have an array of size of capacity 4 okay i insert one element current size becomes 1 I insert one more element current size becomes 2 i insert one more element current size becomes 3 i insert one more element my current size becomes 4 current size is equal to capacity if this happens and this is my arr what do i do i create a variable called as old array i say okay old array pointing to this arr the old array then i say arr which is the data member of the class it should refer to a new array which has a double capacity it should have double capacity so that is what i do here then i iterate over the old array i iterate over these elements and i say array of i this is equal to old array of i so i copy all these elements here okay fine i do it what should i do i say old array this is equal to null so i break this connection that means no one is pointing to this array now the garbage collector will delete it here the garbage collector will get invoked and of course for the new array we have updated the array property but we have not updated the capacity property so the capacity was still 4 but now the capacity should be i am saying capacity equal to twice of capacity so what what do i do i first check if my array is full i double it and then i can insert data into i say array of current size array of current size is still 4 so 0 one two three four at the fourth index i can put the new data maybe the data is 50 i put it that is how i implement the doubling operation inside my array now suppose i want to remove something so removing is easy right i'm not uh, removing from an empty array so that check you have to uh, either you do not either you put some conditions here or you throw an exception right i'm simply saying okay i want to remove an element I am simply removing the last last element. So this is my current size. I said okay, I'll reduce the current size, and it means okay, I am uh, going one step back. Current size minus minus. So I am removing one element from the array. Right? So the element will stay here, but next time you add something, it will get overwritten. Okay, and if you have to iterate, you will only iterate on uh, on this range. Doing current size minus minus will remove last element as well now there are some more methods we can implement for example if i want to uh, get the ith element that is pretty easy you simply return array of i if i want to get the capacity how many elements my array list can hold i can say return the current capacity i cannot use access this directly because it is a private variable so i have created a getter to return it then if i want to get how many elements i currently have I say okay there is a function called size that i have implemented it is going to return the current size now you can uh, create more methods you can create a method called contains in which you will implement linear search and you will tell whether that element is present or not okay you can Im implement a method called as index of in which uh, you will return the index of the element where it is present so instead of returning a boolean you can return an integer index as well right you can also overload the remove method where you will get a integer value so either you remove the element at that index or you remove that value right so you can do something like that as well right so the internal implementation is a bit more uh, i would say it, it's more robust it is more powerful but this implementation we did so that you get an idea how the doubling operation in an array list is actually working okay how things are happening behind the scenes let us test our class by uh, creating a dynamic array object okay my class that i have defined it is called as dynamic array so i can say uh, dynamic array da this is equal to dynamic array and i want to use some methods inside it now uh, let me say default size is 5 instead of 10 so default capacity is 5 da dot add 1 let me just add uh, 5 elements let me say 1 uh, 2 3 4 5 
Now at this point, I want to see what is the size of the array and what is the capacity of the array. Let us see s out uh, da dot size and s out da dot capacity. Both should be five at this moment. But as soon as I insert the sixth element, the size should be six and the capacity should be. Uh, OK, so both are five at this moment. Let me insert one more element. Let me say da dot add six. And now if I add this element, you will see the doubling operation will get triggered, right? That means the capacity should be now 10. The size should be six. Yes, that is happening. Right? So your array of size five, it got full. And as soon as you add sixth element, it, it doubled itself. That doubling thing is happening, right? You can see here. Now I can uh, also say, okay, I want to add seven. I want to remove the last element and then I want to add eight. That means I added seven. I removed one element. I added it. So seven will get overwritten by eight. And if I want to iterate on this array and see right, what all elements are there. So I can say for int I equal to zero, I less than n. What is n? The number of uh, basically da dot size, the number of elements present i plus plus. And I can say s out, I want to get the ith element. So I can say da dot get ith element. I want to show them in a straight line. I'll do s out here and like this so you can see like 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 now you can also implement a method called as two string which will uh, simply iterate over the array and join all these numbers inside a string so you can use uh, the two string method also to print your dynamic array right so instead of traversing you can Give this as a method inside the dynamic array class as well. So let us begin with linked list. So what is a linked list? A linked list is a linear data structure in which the elements are represented as objects and they are stored in non-continuous memory locations. Okay. So one thing that you need to note about linked list is it's a dynamic data structure, right? So unlike an array where you need to tell, okay, I want an array of size n, you don't need to specify the size of the linked list. Every time you get a data, you create an object, you put the data inside it and you put it in the form of a chain or in, in the form of a linked list, right? So why the name linked list? Because we have a lot of nodes. Okay. Each node is an object in a heap and these nodes are connected with each other, right? How they are connected? So each node is created at some memory. Let's say this address is 205. So the previous node knows that the next node is present at this address, right? So two will know the next node is present at some address so that is also going to store there right so each node is going to store two things one is your data and one is the address of next node right so if you know the address of next node you can easily traverse the data structure and you can also put things uh, in an ordered way right so every time you get a new data we can insert at the beginning we can insert at the end we can also insert in the middle right so it's up to you how you want to maintain the ordering inside the linked list right one thing to note is it's a dynamic data structure and the nodes in which the data is getting stored, they are stored in non contiguous memory locations, unlike an array, right? So that is what linked list looks like, right? Now in linked list, we do not specify the size as I have already discussed with you and it is a dynamic data structure. It automatically changes size when an element is added or removed. So we'll go into the internals of how addition and deletions are performed on a linked list in this tutorial. So while doing the implementation, I will show you that. Okay. If there is a node, how do I connect the next node? How do I add something in the beginning? How do I add something in the middle? How do I delete something? Right? So the fundamental operations that we will be learning would be addition. Okay. Removal, right? And getting a node, right? So I want to get a particular node. I can, how do I get that node? Right? So given an index, I, can iterate to that index, right? One thing that is uh, bad about linked list is if you suppose want to get the middle node, right? In array, you can say, okay, give me the ith element. So this, this property is called as random access. So linked list is a bad data structure. If you need to access ith element, why? Because you cannot directly get this element. You have to traverse till i positions to get this element, right? So 
so it's it's bad at getting nodes it's bad at random access but it is good at certain things that we will see all right so that being said let us jump into the implementation of linked list so now let us dive into the implementation of linked list so far what we have learned is that linked list is a chain of nodes in which every node is connected to the next node okay so if there is a node one it must be connected to the second node let's say node two right so the way to do it is that in every node we also store the reference of the next node okay for example if this node is created at some memory location let's say 206 then this node must store what is the reference of this node where it is created right and for the first node what we need to do for example if this node is created at some uh, some location 115 then we need to store this location 115 in a special variable okay we generally call this special variable as head right okay and second node will store the reference to the third node and so on right so third node maybe it might be at 480 so i might be storing 480 here right now the first step in the implementation is that how do we implement this structure okay this uh, object that we see here so we are calling this object as a node object right so what i will do i will say okay i will define a node class and this is capable of holding two things one is my data and one is my reference right so each of these boxes is a node right so each uh, node is going to hold a data now a data can be of a different type as well so just for the sake of simplicity i'm treating it to be a integer but it can be an image it could be a book it could be any object right and second thing i have is a reference to the next node right so how do we uh, store a reference to the next node right so i say okay uh, this will be of the type node and let's call this variable as next right so we have data and we have next so if you're confused i will explain you uh what is this concept so let us first start with the code let us create this structure and let us try to understand that okay inside the node class you can have an object reference which is holding the address of the next node right so let us go into intellij and i have created a package called linked list data structure and here i am going to create a java class called as uh, let's say node dot java right now it automatically creates a class for me but it does not have data members so how do i add data members i can say okay i want data and i also want something called as next so that will be of the type node right now this does not mean that there is there will be an object inside an object no this is only a way uh, this node right it's only a way to hold the address of the next node right so this is of the type object reference i will tell you right and let me do one more thing let me add a constructor here as well so you will see why we need a constructor let's do one thing let's create main right let's create a link list demo another class in which i'm going to test my functionality in this class i will create my main method where i'm going to test my functionality right so let us create a node object so it's okay node a this is equal to new node right now this no this does not hold any data right so a a is not going to contain any data so by default the value of integer is zero right and next would be null right so what i can do i can say okay a dot data equals to 5 a dot next equals to null and if i say okay s out a dot data what what i'm going to get let us see right so i'm getting this uh, value as 5 which is absolutely correct right now why this is happening let's see right? so what it did writing this code it created a node right and what is a a is referring to this node so a is a address right a is a object reference so a is another bucket which is holding the address of this node so this node has two things one is my data and one is my null so this is your data and this is your next and this node has been created at some memory location in the heap right this is my heap memory right? so a uh, this address might be let's say 508 right what is a holding a is holding 508 this is what is exactly happening behind the scenes so in this case this a is also an object reference right and it is referring to an object inside that object i have one more reference okay how do i access this value i access this value by a dot next 
So this is what is happening when you are uh, creating this node, right? So it is giving you, to, uh, it's wrapping up two data members inside one bucket. Inside node, you have an integer value and a reference to the next node, right? If I uh, say, okay, there is one more node, right? Let's say node b equals to new node. Right? And I say, okay, a dot next should refer to b. So if I print out, what is uh, a dot next? So a dot next is nothing but it is the address of the B node that we have created or the value that is uh, getting stored inside B, right? Now, if you see, this is the uh, reference of the next node, right? So let me show you through a memory diagram. So A is referring to a node. Okay. So A is five. B is some other node. So let me do it like this. So A is a variable that is holding this address. Let's say 108. This value is five and B is 30 C, right? So B is some other node. B is another variable that is holding this value 30 C. Right? And this is the address of next node. I don't have any data and null value. Here. So it will be the default value of integer and uh, next, right? So that will be zero and null, right? So I have zero and I have null. Right? Now B is referring to this. So when I say a dot next equal to B, so inside a dot next, which is this field, I'm copying whatever is present in B. So I'm copying 30 C. So it means in a way this B got connected with A, right? Now, even if I lose this variable B, this chain is still connected, right? So this is how we are going to work with nodes. And we will write one more class that does all this manipulation of nodes. Okay. So we'll call that as a linked list class, right? So I hope this node concept is clear. What is A? What is new node? The new node is getting created in heap. In this case, uh, this is a reference variable here. And this variable is created inside stack at this point, right? So what I will do, I'll remove all this code and I will do one more thing. So instead of uh, like every time doing a dot data equal to something, a dot next equal to something, I will define a constructor inside this class. So I call it as node. It will accept some integer, let's say data. It will accept some value of next, but in general, we will not know that value of next. Okay. So whenever you're creating a new node, you know the data. You say, okay, I want to create a new node with data seven. Now what will be connected in the next node? We do not know at the moment, right? So what we can do, we can leave this variable initialized with the default value, right? So I can say this dot data equals to data. So I'm initializing this variable with the data that I'm getting, right? So since the two variable names are same, writing this here is important so that compiler knows that we are talking about this data member as an attribute, right? And uh, next, what about next? So you can say next is null or you can say this dot next is null. Both are fine, both will work, right? So this is the constructor for the node class, right? Now, if you want to create a node A now, you will say, okay, node A equals to new node. You just give the data as five and you say node B equal to new node. You would say data is six and A dot next equal to B. This creates a very simple linked list in which we have two nodes. Okay. If I say S out A dot data and show me what is the data in the next of A. So how do I do it? A dot next gives me the uh, address of B dot data. So I'll say five followed by six. Right? So I will see this. So I see five followed by six. So what we did, we simply created a linked list in which we have just two nodes. This is A, this is B, right? Okay. And A dot next is storing B. So A dot next is storing, right? Now you might say, okay, this is, this looks very easy, but if I have to add 10 nodes, 20 nodes, 100 nodes, 1000 nodes, will we create so many variables and attach them manually? The answer is of course, no. We will write an algorithm that does insertion in the linked list, deletion in the linked list, and it helps me to get the nodes in the middle of the linked list or in, at the end of the linked list or at the beginning of the linked list, right? So to do all these operations, what we will be doing, we will be writing our own linked list class. So what I will do, I'll create a new Java class and I will call it as linked list dot Java in which all these operations involving these nodes will be done, right? So let's see the implementation of linked list.
so let us see the implementation of linked list now suppose you are uh, you want a data structure that is like in the form of a chain right and you want to build certain methods you want to say okay i want to do addition in this linked list that means i should be uh, able to add more nodes inside it i should be able to remove nodes from this linked list and i should be able to uh, get the nodes from this linked list that means i want to read nodes from the linked list right now the add operation it can happen at three places right so maybe if there is a linked list like this you can say okay i want to add something in the beginning of the linked list so i can say okay add at the first position or you might say okay i want to add something after the last node right so you might say okay i want to add at the last node or i might want to say that, that i want to insert something in the middle so i might be doing something in the middle or at a given location okay at a at a given position inside this uh link list right similarly remove can happen at the beginning so i will say remove first would be an operation remove last would be an operation and remove at a particular position can be an operation similarly get me in the okay i want to read something i want to get the first element i want to get the last element or i want to get the middle element right so i will say i want to get first element last element and element at a given position right so what we will be doing we would be implementing these operations right now in order to implement these operations right what is important let us start by understanding how my add operation will work right so whenever you want to add something so one thing you need to know is what is the starting point of the linked list right so suppose you want to add something in the beginning you must know the starting point or you want to add something at the end right now one way is if you are adding something at the end right that means if you are creating a node here you must access this node and update the next variable of this node right you would say okay uh, in the ending of this node i will attach this node so one way is you always iterate till this point starting from the head and this will actually take order of n time if you iterate from here to here it will take order of n time so i don't want to do that so what i will do i will say okay every linked list will at least know what is my head and what is my tail so i will keep another reference that always point to the last node of the linked list so whenever you will add a new node at the ending of the linked list i'll say okay i'll modify the tail node i will attach the node and i will update my tail variable to go here right so let us see how these operations are implemented so what i'm trying to tell you is that if you are implementing a class called linked list this linked list will have data members okay something that the linked list should know okay and some operations that the linked list will does right so here are the operations they will be part of the methods right and we will have some data members or attributes so what are the data members what are the things that the linked list must know so one is head what is my starting address one is the tail what is my ending address so again keeping this is optional but i want to optimize certain operations for example add at last should not be an order n operation it should be an order one operation so i need to keep the tail variable as well right and maybe some optional information like size how many nodes i have in the linked list okay so maybe i want to implement a method like get size how many items are already inserted in this linked list so this is a useful operation we want to check okay if the size is zero that means linked list is empty right otherwise you can check if the head is null that also means linked list is empty right so we will also implement this operation like uh, get size and maybe we'll implement operation like display i want to show the entire linked list okay or you can implement a method like to string iterate on this li linked list and convert it into a string so that is just like a display method i want to show the entire linked list to the user right so let us start by implementing these operations one by one so this is my linked list class so first of all what i will do i will add some data members and i will add a constructor to it so it's okay i want to create a head so node head right? again head is a object reference hence it has a data type called as node right then i will have node tail and one thing i can do is i can make them private so private node head and private node tail i don't want people outside the linked list class to know where is the head node where is the tail node so i will not expose this data outside the linked list class right 
and I can also say private int size. So I'm not making it public because I don't want this size to be changed by someone outside. The size should change automatically when something is inserted or something is removed from the linked list. So it should be a private variable only changed by the linked list class, right? Next thing I want to do is I need to initialize a constructor. Okay. When, whenever user says, okay, give me a new linked list. What should I do? So that linked list will have zero nodes inside it. So I need to initialize these three data members as well. Else, okay. Linked list. There is a constructor here. And what I want to do, I want to say head and tail, they will be null and the size would be zero. Okay. So this is my constructor. Now, what is the first thing I will do? Else, okay. I want to do an insertion. So I will add, I'll write three methods. One to add something at the beginning, something at the end and something at a given position in the linked list. Else, okay. Public method and the method is of the type void add. And let me call it as add first and public void add last and public void add at a particular position. So add add. So in all the three uh, methods, I should know what is the data that I need to add. And in the third method, I should also know at what index I need to add. Right now, take a pause and think how you will implement these methods. Okay. If you are given a linked list and you want to add something at the beginning of the linked list, how you would add in. Okay. So what will be the code behind this method? Take a pause and think about it. Okay. So let us discuss the first method add first. Now, suppose you have a linked list, right? Let's say this is a, this is B, this is C. This is already there and head is referring to this node. I want to say, okay, I want to add another node D, which is at the beginning of the linked list, right? So how I will do it. So first thing is I need to create this node. So how do I create a node object? Very easy. So I simply say, let me create a node called as N. This is equal to new node. And the data of this node is same as this data that I've given. So this creates a new node and N is referring to this node, right? So N is an object reference local reference created inside this function, which is referring to this particular node. What should I do? How do I connect this? So I would say, okay, n dot next should refer to the head. So if head is already there n dot next should connect to head. So it, it makes this connection, right? Now one thing I need to do is I need to say, okay, this head, it should move here, right? This head should not refer to a instead this head should refer to now D. I can say head is equal to n. So this will work really well. And one more thing I will do is size plus plus. Every insertion will increment the size of the linked list, right? So this will work really well if the linked list is already there, right? But suppose you are creating the linked list for the first time and you call the add first method. So head and tail both have both were null, right? And you said, okay, I want to create a new node. So you created a new node called D. And n dot next is equal to head. So head was null. So d is next is also null, which is fine, right? And then you say head is equal to n. This head point refers to this node, which is also fine, right? But the thing is, the tail is not getting updated, right? So whenever the first node is inserted, right? Let's say the first node is a. Both head and tail should refer to this node, right? So what I can do? I need a. I need to add a separate condition that if what if the size was zero before adding this node in that case my tail will also get updated so tail should also point to head or tail should also refer to n right now this is a special case when you have zero nodes in that case you also need to update the tail right so this is my add first method now let us test the functionality of add first method so what i will do i will go in linked list demo it's okay i want to create a linked list L this is equal to new linked list. And now in this, I can say, okay, L dot add first. And uh, I will give some data. Let's say 10 and say L dot add first. I will add 20 and then L, L dot add first. I will add 30. Right? So I want to see this linked list. So I will call the display method, which I have not implemented. So I will, we will implement the display method as well. Right? Let us go back into the linked list class 
and let us add one more method public void display right so how do i display the linked list now it's going to be pretty easy suppose the linked list is 30 followed by 20 followed by 10 right and head is referring to this node okay tail is referring to this node this is 10 right so tail is referring to this node so what i need to do i need to start iterating from head till the end so i'll say okay i'll take a temp variable i will print it and i will take temp here i'll print it i will take temp here i'll print it i will take temp here right so what is happening so once my temp reaches null i will stop so what i can do i can say node temp this is equal to null so temp is again a reference it's not a node right so sorry it's it's equal to head it starts from head and while this temp is not equal to null what do i do i print the node so i say s out temp dot data and take this temp to the next node temp equals to temp uh, temp dot temp goes to the next node this while loop will help me to iterate on the entire linked list right so temp starts from head temp is referring to this node i print out 30 temp equal to temp dot next so temp dot next means this value so this value means this node so temp goes here again temp dot next means this value which is this node temp goes here again this is not null this node is not null so i say temp dot next which is this value which is null so temp actually becomes null and my loop stops right so now the display method is there and we can run this code okay so i see 30 20 and 10 which is okay that means my linked list is getting created but to show you in a linear fashion what i can do i can put an arrow here and I can put a new line here. Right? This will make the representation look little better. Right? So I'm getting 30, 20, 10. Now if you look carefully, I added 10 in the beginning. So 10 got added. That means my head and tail both were here. Right? Then I added 20 in which 20 got added here. And my head moved here. Right? Then 30 got added. A new node was created. It got connected here. And then my head moved here right so this is how the link list is going to look like 30 20 and 10 so i hope you are able to understand the add first method right now on the similar lines what we will do we will implement the method called as add last now take a pause and think how you will implement the add last method all right let us see right now suppose you already have a link list a b c right? and i want to add a new node d which is at the end of the list so this is my head and this is my tail right so how do i add a new node here first of all i need to create this new node so how do i do it i can say okay fine node n this is equal to new node and i give the data to this node that i'm getting right now how do i connect this tail node with the new node so that connection is pretty easy what i need to do i need to update this value and give it the reference of this node which is stored in n right so i need to say that fine tail dot next this is equal to the new node that we have created right so this makes the connection and i also need to say okay this tail should be here because this this node is now the new tail right so i can say tail equal to tail dot next or you can say tail equal to n both are fine right now this tail has also moved and one more thing we will do is we will say size plus plus now this will work fine when the linked list is already there right but think of a case when your linked list is not created that means both head and tail they were null and you inserted the first node by calling the add last function you say okay i don't have a linked list that means if the size is zero and you are adding the first node in the linked list then how should the update should happen right so you still created this new node n right uh, with with the data d n is referring to this node so in this case both head and tail should get updated they should point to this node right so what i can do i can say okay head and tail they will refer to n right they will also store the address that is stored in n right now you might ask okay uh, 
what happens to this n so n is a local variable it will get destroyed after this function call is over but head and tail they are the data members of the class they will exist till you have the linked list object in your memory right so they are not going to get destroyed right so n is a local variable it will be over right and anything that is allocated using new will not get destroyed why because if someone is referring to this memory that memory will not be garbage collected right so head and tail they are referring to this node n is a local variable it will get destroyed right so this way add last will work so now let us test our functionality right so i say okay l dot add last maybe this is 40 this time and again i say okay l dot add last this is 50 right now if you look carefully i am adding the first node by calling add last function first 40 was added add first 10 so 10 was added then 20 was added then 30 was added now again i'm calling the add first method on a link list which is already built so 50 should get added right so if i say l dot display right it, it will give me this link list let us see the output so we are getting this link list 30 20 10 40 50 that means this is working really fine right okay let us go back here and let us implement one more method that is okay give me the size right how many nodes we have so that's going to be easy so public int get size and what we are going to do we are going to return the size of the link list right now we are doing it this way because if you make this size public anyone can change it right so I'm only giving the getter to access the size. I'm not giving any method to set the size of the link list. Okay. So that size should be updated only through the add and the remove methods. So this is also fine. So I can say L dot get size and I want to display how many nodes I have in this link list. This is again a order one operation, right? So I can say, okay, there are five nodes. Now let us talk a little bit about the complexity. So your constructor is doing order one work at first. It is also doing order one work, no loops involved here. Also we are doing order one work, get size. We are doing order one work display. We are iterating over all the end nodes. We are doing order of n work, right? Now the next method is add add, right? So take a pause and think how you will implement add add method. And if you want to insert something in the middle of a linked list at a particular index. Okay. So let us see it next. So we are discussing how do we implement the add at method. Okay. So we have, we are given, okay, this is the data that you need to add and you have a particular index at which you want to do this insertion, right? Now suppose my data is four and my index is three. That means, okay, zeroth index, first index, second index. Here I want to add like at the third index, the new node should come, right? Or you can say, okay, after three nodes, I want to insert the fourth node. So this is my fourth node that I want to insert somewhere here, right? So how I will do it, right? So one way is, okay, I will create a new node n, n is referring to this node four, right? But how do I connect three with four and four with five, right? So this is going to be easy. How? You can say, okay, let me create this new node n. So node n, this is equal to new node with my data four, right? Now, one way is, okay, I can say, I need to reach this node, right? How do I reach this node? Right? That means I st if I start from this node right? and I want to reach the third node, right? After three nodes, I have to insert. That means I have to reach the third node. So if I take one jump here, I reach two. If I take one more jump here, I will reach this node, right? That means in order to reach three, I need to take two jumps, right? Okay. So if my index is some P, right? I need to take P minus one jumps, right? For a particular position P, I need to take P minus one jumps. This we will do it using a loop, right? Let's say I've reached this node and I'm holding this address in a variable called temp, right? Now how I will do it, right? So I can say, okay, temps next, should point to four. If I do this, temp dot next should refer to n. What 
loss I will have. I will lose the address of five. I don't want to do that, right? So how should I do it? I will say that before doing this operation, let me say that four should store the address of five. Can I do that? Of course, yes. So how do I do that? I can say n dot next. That is the next of four. Should refer to five. So what is the address of five? It is nothing but it is the next of temp. So it is temp dot next. Right. So once it is done, can I update the address? The next of three. Of course, yes. I can say okay. Three is next. Now should point to four, and this link will automatically get broken. So I can say three is my temp. Temp dot next should be equal to n. Right. So in just these three steps, I will be able to insert a node in the middle. Right. Now we might have a special case where we might need to insert a node in the beginning or at the end or we are getting an index which is out of bounds. So let us see how we will handle those cases. So first of all, I'm going to check if this index is out of bounds, right? So if my index is less than zero or my index is greater than the size of the linked list, that means I cannot insert this node, right? So in this case, what we can do is either we uh, simply return, right? But that's not a good idea. We should tell the user that you are doing something wrong, right? So one way to do it is we can throw a new exception and we can say, okay, uh, index out of bounds right? that you're using the incorrect index. And here I have to say, okay, this method throws, throws a exception, right? So I can throw an exception in this case and an error will come in the main when this program is executed, right? And uh, now if my index is zero, that becomes a special case. That means, okay, I'm, I'm trying to add something at the beginning so that I have already handled. We can just call the add first method with the data, right? So I can say, uh, you call the add first and you give the data. That's it. Else if your index is equal to size, that means if the link list has three nodes and you want to insert something at index three, that means you're inserting something here, right? Which is again at the ending of the linked list. In that case, you can call the method add last and you can give the data, right? So in the else block, we have to write the exact logic that we are talking about, right? So let's see how we will do it. Suppose your linked list is like this one, two, three, right? And uh, I have five, six, seven, right? So I'm telling you that, okay, after three nodes, you have to insert a data that is four, right? So how do I do it? First, I need to reach the third node, right? So I need to take a temp and reach this node. So temp will start from head. So I can say node temp, this is equal to head. How many jumps I have to take? I have to take index minus one jumps. So I can say, okay, for int jump equal to one, jump less than e uh, equal to index, right? Jump plus plus, right? Or if it is sounding confusing to you, you can say less than equal to index minus one, right? These many jumps, as I told you, we have to take, right? Now in each jump, what we should do, temp will take a step. So temp will go to the next node, temp equal to temp dot next. Now I'm in a good position to do some insertion here, right? What I will do, I'll say, okay, let me create a new node n whose data is four. So I can say node n, this is equal to new node with the given data. And n dot next should refer to temp dot next as we have just discussed here as well, right? So four should get connected with five. That is the first step. Then I need to connect three with four, right? So how do I do it? So three is my temp dot next should point to four. So four is n. That's it. And size plus plus size we will update here. So here we are not doing size plus plus because add first and add last will automatically increment the size, right? That's it. So that is my insertion in the middle. Now let us run this code in main and see if it works really well or not, right? Now I can say, okay, this was my original linked list. L dot add at index. Let's say I want to add at some index uh, zero. Let's say the data is zero, right? 
l dot add at index i want to add something at the last index so l dot get size okay now i'm getting a getting not add last but i can say add at so index will be let's say the last index so data is let's say 100 l dot get size now again here i'm getting this because i've not written throws exception so main can also throw an exception because it is calling a method that throws exception so main can also throw exception right so we have to write this here right and let's add something in the middle as well so l dot display and i will say okay l dot add at index 4 sorry data is 4 add some index let's say 3 right? something like this and again let me say l dot display so this will test our all the three cases and we should be seeing that they should work fine right so in the first case i added zero in the beginning fine i added 100 at the end fine working fine then in this linked list i said okay at index 3 i should insert 4 so 0 30 20 this is the third index so before 10 i will insert a 4 so 0 30 20 i'm getting a 4 here then 10 40 50 and 100 that means in the middle it is also working fine and i display this list right and finally i have eight elements one two three four five six seven eight that means that size update is also working fine in all the three cases right so that completes part one that means we are able to add nodes in the linked list in all the three cases we have seen add first we have seen add last and we have seen add in the middle right next we will move on to get and after that we will move on to remove so take a pause and think how you can implement these methods get first get last and get an element at a particular position it's your time to code and i'll just show you the add art method right so pause this video here and try to implement these three methods let us implement the get method right so i need to write a method called public int get first that means i want to get the first element of the linked list but what if the size of the linked list is zero i do not have any such element so i will have a special case if size is zero i can throw a new exception that the linked list is empty right so linked list is empty that is the error that i am trying to show to the user right and here i have to tell that okay this method also can also throw exception right so throws exception but if the size is not zero the linked list is there then it is pretty easy we just need to return the data present in the head node right so head is referring to this node access the data and return it so return head dot data that's it size will not change and this is what you will do so similar to this you can also write get last so again if the linked list is having size zero then there is no last element you will throw an exception and in that case the last data will be at the tail node right you can say return tail dot data that's it now if you want to get something in in the middle that is going to take one more step because you will have to loop through it right okay so add at we did not discuss it's going to take order and time because you are the worst case you might have to loop till the second last or the last one right so get last we have done now this this will be get at a particular index if i give you an index and i want to get an element at that index, how it will work out so take a pause and think how you will do it so this is also easy right now user is giving you an index now it is possible that this index is also out of bounds like we saw here right like in the case of addition it is also possible that this index is out of bounds so if index is less, less than zero or it is greater than size i can throw an exception index out of bounds then if this is not the case right so if this is not the case if the user is uh, really giving you a valid index right else if it is possible you're talking about index zero if that is the case you can say return get first Th this can happen else if index is equal to size you can say return 
साइज और साइज माइनस वन इट विल बी साइज माइनस वन बिकॉज द लास्ट एलिमेंट विल हैव एन इंडेक्स साइज माइनस वन यू कैन से रिटर्न गेट लास्ट इट अदरवाइज वॉट यू नीड टू डू यू नीड टू आइट्रेट ऑन द लिंक लिस्ट राइट तो दैट आइट्रेशन पार्ट इज ईजी वॉट वी विल डू वील हैव लेट से ए बी सी डी एंड सो ऑन राइट so this is index 0 1 2 3 4 right so i want to get something at the second index what i need to do so i need to take one jump one more jump two jumps to reach this particular index right so that means take the number of jumps equal to that index so i can say okay fine node temp that is equal to head and uh, for int jump equal to 1 jump less than equal to index jump plus plus what do i do i take my temp to the next node temp equal to temp dot next once i reach this node i need to return the data of that node so return temp dot data that's it so i take my temp here and i return this data right so this will give me the data at a given position so that is my get at a particular index now let us uh, test this code so i want to say okay fine in this link list that we have i want to get the zeroth element s out l dot get first s out l dot get last and s out l dot get at index 4 let's go and run this code the first element is 0 last element is 100 the fourth element is 10 let us verify So zeroth index, first index, second index, third index, fourth index. So fourth index is really ten. That means my output is correct. That is how we build the get at methods in the link list. So far we have seen uh, the at method and the get methods. Okay, all the three versions. So getting first, adding first, they all take order one time. But doing some work at a particular position, they take order of n time. Right. So other methods are all one. now we have the remove method we want to remove first remove last and remove at a particular position so let us see how we will write these methods okay so what i will do i'll create remove methods public int so remove i will also get the data that has been removed from that particular index so return type would be int so remove first and you might think it should be very simple whatever is at the head i will uh return that right so i want to remove this let's say 10 is there 20 and 30 and this is my head how do i remove this node right? so one way is okay you can store the output that is going to be head dot data and then you can say okay this head will move to the next node so head will go here right so head is going to be at head dot next right so doing this will it remove this node the answer is yes so in heap uh this node is a node that no one is referring to what will happen it becomes eligible for garbage collection so garbage collector will come and it will going to it's going to sweep away this memory so that means now your link list will be only this right but there are few special cases right so i can say the output will be returned that's okay you also need to reduce the size this dot size minus minus this is something we need to do right but what is the special case if the link list is empty can you remove the first element the answer is no so we have to check if the size is zero what we will do we'll throw an exception right we'll say throw new exception that link list is empty right fine and we need to tell that this method throws exception Now, what about if the size is one, right? So head will get updated fine, but if you have just one node, and both head and tail, they were pointing to this node, will it form a special case? Of course, yes. Right. So if this node is getting removed, what will happen to head and tail? They will be reset to null, right? If your original size was one, how do you remove it? You will set your head and tail equal to null. size will become zero right okay and uh, else sorry yeah so one thing we can do is this code we can move here output is equal to head dot data 
okay and we'll of course return output this code we can move in else case right that means if there are like at least uh, two nodes in that case tail will not be affected right so what about this case else case if there is 10 there is 20 and there is 30 so this is my head this is my tail even if my move remove this node head comes here right so head goes to the next place size gets reduced so tail is not affected right but if i have just one node and i remove that node so in that case head and tail both will be affected so they are reset to null and the size becomes zero so that is how the remove first method should work now let us uh, test this method let me create a new linked list let's say i add at the first position let's say 10 then i add 20 30 40 20 30 40 and i can say l dot display then i can say l dot remove first and l dot display right so i'm getting 40 30 20 10 fine and if i remove the first element 40 my link list is 30 20 10 which is fine Okay, if I have just one element in the linked list, and let me see if it works well. So I have one element, I remove that one element, so my linked list is empty. Fine. That also works well, right? And I can say s out l dot size. I want to see if my size is getting updated properly. Yes, the size is zero and I don't see any output here. That is how I will implement remove first method. Now on the similar lines, can you implement the remove last method? Okay, just need to think what will change, what will happen to head and tail, how much time it will take. So this method, it's going to take uh, order one time, right? Remove first, but you have to think how much time remove last will take. Okay, so let's see uh, remove last. Okay, so first case is okay if your linked list is empty you cannot throw anything uh, you cannot uh, remove anything so if your size is zero you will throw a new exception okay then similar to this one your output in this case will be what your output will be now tail dot data you know the last node is tail and that data is your output right so if your size is one what you will do you will reset your head and tail to null and you will say size is zero if this is only one node both head and tail are referring to this node you want to get this data you store this data in a variable called output that is tail dot data original size was one so if this is removed head and tail they are reset to null and size becomes zero which is correct right otherwise if you really want to remove something right so you will have to check that if your index is in the bounds or is it zero or is it the last index Sorry, you don't need to check here because we are uh, talking about remove last, right? So you just need to remove the last node, right? So what I will do, I'll say, okay, else we have the other case, we know what node to remove. If there are more nodes, right? Uh, there is one tricky thing here that if it is a singly linked list, right? And this is your tail node. You're saying, I want to remove this node, right? That means tail should be updated. Tail should come here. The new tail should come here right after removing this node so i've stored this d in in a variable called output so output is tail dot data so output is d right but how do i bring it back there is no way to do it right even if you maintain okay i'll maintain previous of tail for every node suppose this was the previous but when you remove c how you will get the previous so the answer is we don't have an any order one way of coming to the previous node we have to iterate from the beginning to reach this node right so that i can update my tail variable right so this is going to take time right or the other option is you maintain a doubly linked list in which every node is also connected back right if you do that your remove last will work in order one time but for now we have a singly linked list that means we have only the next address right singly linked list in that case we have only one option start from the head node and try to reach the second last node so how do i do it so i take a variable called temp which starts from head i can say while temp dot next 
is not equal to tail right so what is the stopping condition so when i reach this node temp dot next this is equal to tail right so this is the tail node right suppose this is my c this is my temp and this is my tail node this is my d right so i'm saying while temp dot next is not equal to tail right until this condition is not met i will take my temp to the next and next node so temp starts from here it goes here it stops here right because c's next is equal to tail so temp will stop at c so i can say temp equals to temp dot next my temp stops at the second last node right now why this is important because i want to update the tail thing right now at this point i want to disconnect d so this d i don't want so what should i do i would say temp dot next is equal to null so if i reset this variable to null what will happen this object becomes eligible for garbage collection because no one is referring to this object right so garbage collector will come and sweep away the memory of d because there are no object references which are holding the address of this node so this d will get deleted from the memory and c's next is or, uh, updated correctly right but what about the data that we wanted to return that is still copied in in a variable called as output right so once this is done what should i do so temps next is now null this tail should be updated so this tail should come here so this tail will become equal to temp and the size will also get reduced right so here we have reset the size so here it will be one lesser size minus minus that's it and i will return the output in both the scenarios right so return output in this case also i'll return the output in this case will i will also return the output that is how remove last will work and if i now show you l dot remove last and uh, maybe if you want to output that's okay we just want to see the linked list so i can say l dot display what do i get okay, let me add some numbers only then we can see 20 30 40 so right now i'm getting an exception because you know it's an empty linked list so 10 20 30 40 l dot display and then i called the remove last method so this was the link, link list i removed the last element this is what i am getting and the size is 3 right which is fine that means the remove last is working as expected right now the next thing we would like to do is any guesses of course it's going to be remove at a particular index so we want to write one more method public int remove at a given index so again before i write the code take a pause and think how you will implement this method given a particular index i want to remove something from that index so let us start implementing a remove at right so first thing is if the size is zero that means you cannot re remove anything so you will throw a new exception so throw exception throw new exception and you will say okay link list is empty you cannot remove it or you can check that if the index that you're getting is out of bounds so if index is less than zero or your index is uh, greater than size you cannot remove or equal to size even at size we don't have anything the last index is a size minus one so if this is the case i i have to throw new exception right so i'll throw a new exception and we'll tell that this method can throw an exception all right so the error is fixed now what to do i still want to remove it so if my index is zero that means i want to remove something from the head that we have already implemented so whatever is returned by the remove first we will return that else if index is equal to the last which is size minus one we will return whatever is removed by remove last method and now is the time we will see the actual working of this method right how do i remove something from the middle of the linked list so let's say i have a linked list like this a b c d e f right and as okay i want to remove something from index 2 right 0 1 2 i want to remove this element 
So if I want to remove this element, that means we should get connected with B, right? And uh, this link from B to C, it should get broken, and uh, C should be garbage collected, right? If this happens, C will be deleted from the memory, right? So how we are going to achieve this, right? So first of all, we need to reach this node that is B, right? So if my index is two, I need to reach one node behind that index. So how do we reach that node? Again, fairly easy. I can say I will start with temp that is equal to head. And if index is two, that means I need to iterate one less than that index. For int jump equal to one, jump less than index, jump plus plus. So if it is two, I'll okay, I'll just take less than two jumps. That is, I'll take one jump. I will come here. And at this node, I will start doing certain operations, right? So first of all, let me take temp to that particular node. Right? Now I'm standing at this node. So what I want to do, I want to return this node. Right? I want to return the data of this node. I will copy it in a variable called output. Output is nothing but uh, temp dot next dot data. That is what my output is, right? And I want to return that output. Or let's say this is my node, which is okay. Either way we can do it. Right? Node called output. So this node is my output node. And what I want, I want temp to connect with next of this node. So I want B to connect with T. So how we can do it? So temp dot next. Either you write it should be equal to temp dot next, which is my output dot next. So that is my D. Or you can say output dot next. So again, I'm connecting B with D, right? Now no one is pointing to C. It will become, it will get garbage collected, right? Okay. And if this node is garbage collected, this link is automatically broken. So what I need to do, I need to say size minus minus, and I need to return output dot data, output dot data this output is a local variable right it is there only in this function once i return output dot data there is uh, this function call is over output will will be out of scope it will get destroyed and hence no one is referring to c this memory will also be cleared off that's it that's what you need to do right so that is going to remove something from the middle of the link list right now i can test my code so i can say L dot remove at index, let's say one so given this link list, let's say remove at index two, which is okay. Show me what will happen if you remove something from index two. So this is my link list. And if I say, okay, remove index two, zero, one, two, 20 is gone. I get 40, 30 and 10. That means the code is working absolutely fine. So this is how we can remove something from the middle of link list. So far we have seen the implementation of single link list, right? So in which we said every node is going to store the address of the next node, right? But what happens in real scenarios, you might need sometimes a double link list. So what is a double link list? So just like you were storing the next, you will also store the address of the previous node. That means each node is now holding three things, a data, a next reference and a previous reference. So two will hold the address of three two will also hold the address of one, right? Now the advantage of double link list is that you can traverse in both directions, right? For example, we were doing removal at tail in which I said, okay, I want to remove this node and I want this tail to come back. So I, if it is a single link list, I have to iterate from the front to reach this node, which is going to take order of end time, right? But if I do it the same operation deletion at end for a double link list, I can just come back to the previous node okay because four knows the address of three so i can update my tail pointer very easily right so it comes at the cost of extra memory but it can save some time for example if you want to delete something at the end it can then be done in order one time insert at end can be done in order one time insert at head can be done it can be done in order one time remove at head can also be done in order one time right? so at both ends you can do insertion and deletion in order one time right so each object stores data and memory location 
of next as well as the previous object right so this is something you can implement right now there won't be a lot of change for example if you're making a method to insert something in the middle let's say i want to insert five here what are the variables that you will have to update right so so you will have to update that two's next should point to five okay but if, if you do this first what will happen you will lose the address of three so what i will do is else okay let me create this new node five and let's say this is my temp here i want to insert it so five's next will point to two's next so five gets connected with three right i can also say five's previous can point to temp so five also connects connected with two right now i just need to change these variables so i can say t's next will point to n so two's two points to three right and i also need to say three's previous right or we can do it other way right we can first say that this node which is the next of two so t dot next right dot previous so three's previous should point to n so this link will get like this so this link is gone now what you can do you can remove two's uh, next and make it point to n so you can say this will get connected here so you can say t dot next this is equal to n right so again you just need to think logically and you need to execute these instructions in a particular order so that your updates are correct you are not making any changes which are inconsistent right so again all the operations get remove uh, add you can try creating those operations on a doubly linked list as a exercise right so let's talk about what happens in java right so if you want to use this class inside your collections framework then this class is already implemented so there is a class called as linked lists so it's it's part of java.util uh, package as a part of collections framework by default this class internally uses a doubly linked list right so if you're using this class directly in solving problems you're getting a doubly linked list by default right so if you want to learn more about this i have covered collections in my dsa tutorial on the channel you can watch that and learn how do we use the inbuilt doubly linked list or inbuilt linked list class you can definitely learn about the methods of that as well right so let us quickly revisit the features of linked list right so it provides us an ability to use the non continuous memory locations right so if you have like different chunks of memory available in different parts of the heap and you cannot create a big array but what you can do is you can use some memory here some memory here some memory here and you can just connect those chunks right non continuous memory parts can be utilized efficiently using a linked list second advantage is it's a dynamic data structure there is no need to allocate pre memory and again this results in efficient utilization of memory for example if an array you say okay i need 1000 elements but only suppose 100 get used up then what is happening all this memory is uh, it's a waste of memory it's not efficient utilization of memory so linked list you you create memory on demand and hence you only use that much memory that is required right okay and if you are using a doubly linked list insertion and deletion at the ends of the linked list they are performed in constant time so if you compare it with an array and if you have to do some insertion or deletion in the beginning right you will know that it's going to take order of end time because i have to do shifting if i insert something or if i delete something again i have to shift all the elements right and joining two linked lists is much more efficient in terms of space and time so if there is one linked list and there is another linked list right so think if you have to join two arrays you have to copy all the elements from one array into another array but if you have to join two linked list you just need to connect the la tail of one with the head of other linked list and that is going to be a, again an order one operation so it saves both your space and time right so that is all about linked list so a quick revision on the operations random access if it is a linked list it's a bad thing right because it's going to take order of n time in an array getting the ith element will take order one time insertion at deletion at the beginning order one time in an array it's going to take order n time as i just discussed insertion and deletion at the end right so this if it is a doubly linked list it be it can be done in order one time right in an array also it can be done in order one time insertion and deletion from a random location so if you are doing somewhere in the middle both are going to take order n time right 
so in an array this part is bad insertion and deletion at the beginning random access is good in a linked list this insertion deletion part is good but random access is bad so you can see each data structure has its own pros and cons so depending on upon the problem you have to decide whether you will go with a linked list or an array let us talk about stacks today so just like arrays and linked list stack is a linear data structure that is used for storing data right and it looks very much like a real life stack such as stack of books stack of plates and so on right so you might have guessed the kind of behavior this stack will show so what happens is you can insert something if you want to put a book that book must be inserted from the top right you cannot insert books directly in the middle right you cannot insert a book at the bottom of the stack right basically any book let's say a c++ book it goes on the top then a python book it goes on the top of the stack right so this is how it, it's it's going to be and if you want to remove some book you will have to remove the topmost book first then you can remove the next topmost book then you can remove the next topmost book right basically it's a data structure in which insertion and deletion they are done only at the one end where end is called as the top of the stack right so if you are pushing something so this blue goes then this blue goes and then this yellow goes okay the item which is inserted at the last right last item it is at the top of the stack right now if you want to remove something this three will come out then this two will come out then this one will come out so the last item is the first one to come out so hence this behavior is also called as last in first out right so when you do uh, execute these operations on your computer uh, undo undo redo you do right so you when you do control z so the last operation has been reversed when you do again undo the previous operation gets reversed right so stack is a useful data structure if you want to implement recursion if you build if you want to build something like an undo redo stack you can do that right and problems where this last in first out behavior is important stack can be used there right now talking about implementations of stack we will discuss uh, three implementations we will discuss uh, one using fix size array we will see dynamic array right or an array list and we will also see using a linked list right so we'll go into the implementation details uh, very soon but before that let us also talk about features of the stack right so stacks are different from arrays in a way that in arrays random access is possible that means you can pick any ith element but in this case stack only limited access is possible that means only the element which is at the top is directly available to us right and stacks are generally dynamic in nature in general we can have a fixed size stack as well but generally we can push and pop elements so the size of the stack can keep on changing right so generally we do not say it, it's going to have a, any fixed size right so if you use an array list or a linked list you will be able to implement a dynamic stack right so three fundamental operations that we will have with every stack will say okay we want to push something uh, push something at the top of the stack we want to remove something again that happens at the top of the stack and we want to peak that means we want to get the element at the top we are looking for the element so we call it as peak sometimes also call, called as a top right we want to seek the topmost element that is about stack and now let us jump into the implementation of stack let us talk about implementation of stack so we will be discussing two implementations one is stack that uses a fixed size array and the second implementation would be a dynamic stack right which can use a array list or a linked list okay so we'll discuss a fixed size array implementation and another implementation using dynamic array which is called as array list or we can also use linked list right so one of those data structures we can use to give the behavior of a stack right now if you are using a fixed size array right so you have to think of a container which is getting filled and em getting empty only from one end right so that means if i say okay every insertion will go from here right so one two three four five if i want to insert six i will insert something from this end if i want to remove something i will also remove something from this end right so i can say okay i'll push something into the stack so that means i'll push six and if i pop something 
that pop will also remove sticks right and there is one more method that we would like to implement that okay i want to see what element is at the top of the stack so if you remove six and we call this method as peak right so if i want to see what element is at the top of the stack so that element would be your five right these are the three most important operations that we need to implement on a stack right now clearly we can use a fixed size array to do it right so internally we'll say okay there is an array which is having fixed size and we can add elements from this end into the array and we can also remove elements from this end of the array so let us see how we can implement a stack class in our code so let us start implementing the stack using a fixed size array right now if you look at this fixed size array what are the three things you will need in this class one is the name of the array or the container in which you are going to hold data another is the top variable that is going to move as you insert and delete elements and another thing we need to know is what is the maximum capacity of the stack right what i will do i will define these three attributes as data members of the class so first thing i will have is a private array which which we call it as data next thing i will have as top and another thing i will have as a constant the default capacity can be treated as a constant so public static final int i can say default uh, capacity right and uh, this is equal to 10 right now i need to define a constructor so i can say okay stack using an array there is a constructor and i'm not getting any default capacity so that means my array size will be 10 in this case so i can initialize my data array so i can say this is equal to new int how many integers the default capacity right and what is the initial position of the top so top is the index at which i'm going to store the element uh, at which i am stored the last element so in the beginning i can say my top is at minus one why because i have not stored anything when you insert something you can say okay three is there and top will come here so top will move after you can do the insertion so i can initialize my top variable as minus one so i can have another constructor in which i am getting some capacity as user input so i can say fine i'm getting some capacity so in this case i can uh, say okay the array that i'm creating it has uh, this particular capacity right or you can also put put a check that if your capacity is less than one right that means is it, is it negative or zero in that case we can throw an exception so i can say throw new exception uh, invalid stack capacity right so something like this we can do and here we can say okay this uh, function can throw an exception throws exception so this is how we will create the constructor for the stack class right and we are using a fixed size array now we have to uh, define three functions okay we have to define a push function okay i want to push something into this stack so i'm going to get data right now we have to check whether my stack is full or not only i can push right so how do i check how do i check right so let, let me do one more thing let me also write a function that will that will give me the size of the stack right so i'll say public int um, get size right Make. the methods would be made public so i want to see uh, what is the current size of the stack right so can i say uh, the current size is nothing but the value of top plus one so in the beginning top is minus one and if you have not inserted anything this output will be zero so minus one plus one it will be zero when you inserted let's say something so top will be at index zero what is the size of the stack the size of the stack is one right so when you're going to push how do you check whether the stack is full or not right so what you can do just think about it okay so what we can do is we can check that whatever is the current size of the stack is it equal to the array capacity right so i can say if i can call the get size function which is basically giving me top plus one is it equal to the capacity of the stack right so how do i know so i can say that capacity is nothing but uh array length right so array has a 
property called as length so if these two are equal that means my uh, array is already full okay so we have, we are getting a error here data dot length because of this reason uh, data is a variable here and data is also an array here right i need to make it something different i need to say this is some item that i'm pushing into the stack and now this data means the array right if they are equal so in that case i cannot push anything more so i can say throw new exception and the exception name is stack is full right so that is some message we can display and we can tell this method also throws uh, exception all right but if if this is not the case so what i will do i will increment my top else okay fine increment the top variable and at the new position of top you are going to store that item right that's it if the stack is not full right a uh, function can be made as void public void push so we don't return anything right now what is happening that your top was here i said push 3 so my top comes here and i put the item i say push 4 my top comes here and i put the item again i push 5 top comes here and so on right so eventually if your top uh, top plus 1 is this value that means if my stack is full okay so get size is how many elements i have currently stored let's say 6 7 and the capacity of there is also 5 so if it is there so i can say stack is full right so that is how we can perform the push operation on the stack right now let us talk about how do we remove something from the stack right now i can say uh, i will have public int pop okay i want to remove the topmost item so again here what you can do you can make a check that if my stack is empty right then i have to throw an exception i cannot uh, pop from an empty stack so if get size tells me okay this size is zero there are there is no data in the stack so you can say uh, throw new exception stack is empty right and here we can say this method throws exception right okay if this is not the case i can easily remove something from the stack i will store my answer so i answer that i want to return it will be a uh, data of top right what i can do i can reduce top top minus minus and i can return the answer that i have so let's see what we are really doing so we are saying okay 1 2 3 4 this is my top right i want to remove this so i can simply say okay this top will come here and i will uh, copy this four in a variable called answer and i will return it right now you might say okay if i print the stack i might see four that's not going to be true because we will only print up to 1 2 3 right up to top right so this data if you want you can make it zero or you can keep it as it is right so just to make it little more more clear i can say answer of top i'm making it zero so that uh, sorry data of top i'm going to make it zero so that it looks good when you try to uh, look at the entire array right so i'll so in general you are not going to look at the whole array but only the array till the top but that's okay so this is a optional step if you would like to do right because data can be zero also right so again this is an optional thing if you want to that is how you will remove something from the stack right now we have the method to look at the topmost element right so sometimes this method is called as uh, top sometimes it is called as peak right so if you want to look at the peak method uh it's pretty easy you just need to do the similar thing right so i'll say okay if the array is empty then you can throw a new exception that stack is empty otherwise you get the data but you don't remove it so that's it you can or you can simply return data of top okay the topmost element you can return directly so that is your peak method right 
let us add some more methods if you want to print the stack so i will print everything up to top right public void um, display so i can say for int i equal to top i greater than equal to zero i minus minus so i will iterate on the items in the reverse order so if it is like one two three four so i will first say okay I, i'm going to print from top to the bottom right like this so what i will do i'll say okay s out data of i that's it right so that is my display method and uh, i can give a new line here okay so any other methods if uh, we would like to write so maybe we want to write a method called as is empty or is full so we can write those method as well so i i can i will write is empty method whether the stack is empty or not so i can say public int public boolean is empty so this is helpful when you want to uh, continuously remove elements from the stack until the stack is not empty so this method can be used right now i can return if my get size is equal to zero so this expression will evaluate to true or false so i think this looks good next we will test the functionality of this stack that we have created now let us write one more class so that we can uh, test the functionality of this stack class so i'll call it as a uh, stack demo dot java right so in this stack demo we will create a stack object so main method is there like in the stack s sorry this should be stack using an array right stack using an array i call it as stack this is equal to new stack new stack using an array right so i've created the stack object or just call it as s let us push some numbers into it so i can say s dot push one s dot push two uh, s dot push three so we have to push method can throw an exception so i can say main can also throw an ex exception so s dot push three four five whatever it is right and then we can try to extract items from the stack. so four five six so i've added six items i can say okay s dot display show me uh the stack right let us run this and see what do we get right and at the same time i will do one more thing i will pop items from the stack until the stack is not empty so while the stack is not empty what I will do, I'll say okay, give me the topmost element. So I can say s dot peak, print the topmost element. So s out uh, topmost element and remove it. So I can say s dot pop, right? A pop function you can also use uh, because it also gives you the element and remove it, right? But here we are not reading the value from the pop, we are just reading the value from the peak function so when we are printing it you see uh, six is at the top then five then four then three then two and then one right if if i do not call the display method instead i use this while loop so what is the first element that will get removed that will be six last in first out then five then four then three then two and then one let us go and run this code and we will get a same output by removing all elements from the stack as well right so you can see that means our uh, class is working perfectly fine by default the capacity is 10 so if i show the capacity is 5 and i try to insert six elements then this code is going to throw an exception that the stack is already full and i cannot push any more elements into the stack the next implementation of stack we will see using a dynamic array and a linked list let us talk about dynamic stack now there are two options to implement it one is you can use an array or one is you can use a linked list so when i say array we can use a dynamic array right so suppose you are implementing the stack using an array and at some point your array got full okay your current size is equal to capacity right so what you can do is using the same logic as array list inside your push method what you will do you will say fine i will create a new array of double the capacity if this is c 
I will create an uh, array of 2x of my capacity and I will copy the elements here, right? So that is how my push method will uh, get changed, right? And pop will remain same. I am not going to shrink anything. So pop will remain same. Even the top method will remain same. No changes, right? Nothing changes here. Only in the push method, we are going to change. So array will not overflow. Instead, it will get a doubled, right? And again, this copying is an expensive operation, right? So we should make sure that this is not happening, happening too frequently, right? So that is why in initial capacity is important, right? So that is uh, using an array list, right? Now, if you want to discuss it in the code, so you can say, okay, I have a class called stack. So either you can keep a array list object here, right? Because we have already implemented array list. It can be your implementation. It can be library based implementation as well. Whenever you call, get a call for push some item i, you can simply say, okay, a dot add the item i. So add function, we know it adds at the end of the array list. The code becomes even simpler, right? Or if you don't want to use uh, the inbuilt class, right? What you can do, you can take the manual array like we did in the previous example and write the doubling logic inside the push method. So I'm hopeful that you will be able to do that part, right? Another option is you can use a link list also, right? Now suppose we are uh, building a stack. I got one. So I insert that node into the link list. So my head is updated. Tail is also updated, right? Now suppose you, you got two. Now the question is where should I insert two? Should it, should it go at head or should it go at tail, right? One option is okay. If I put it at tail, insert at tail, if I do it, this tail will go here, right? Okay. And suppose I got three, then you can again insert it at tail. This tail will go here and uh, three is also inserted, right? Now the question is, if I want to remove something, if I want to pop out three, right? how do I move this tail back? Right? I cannot move it back in order one time, right? I have to traverse from the beginning. This is going to be time taking. So push is going to be order uh, one, but my pop is going to be order of n, which is not acceptable here. right? So hence, I need a better implementation using a linked list. So let us do one more try. Suppose I got one and both head and tail, they got updated, right? Now if I want to insert two, two will go here. I will create a new node. Okay. And I will connect this node with the head. So basically I'm inserting at the head only. This head will move here. Fine. Right because that that we have seen how to insert at head then i insert three i create a new node connected with the previous head and i update this head right this head can come here right now if i want to remove something i can say okay i want to remove the topmost node i want to pop this node right how do i remove it this is now pretty easy how we can say okay fine let me move the head from here to here and this node now becomes eligible for garbage collection right that means popping is very easy even looking at the topmost element is very easy so the element at the head is the element at the top so again if i want to remove this thing my head will go here and the node too it will become garbage collected so using linked list also uh, building a stack is very easy if you want to insert something or you want to push something you can say, okay, I will call the add front method of the linked list right? or insert front, whatever it is. And if I want to pop something, I will say remove from the front. Okay. I think add first, we call called it as add first. Right? I need to add at the first position and I need to remove at the first position. Right? And peak is nothing but it is the get first. I want to get the first element of the linked list, right? that is how it's going to work right so regarding the implementation i think it's now pretty easy given that we have uh, implemented array list we have implemented link list so what you can do you can also uh, put that code inside your uh, dynamic tag class as well right now three options either you write entire code that is option number one you define the node you write how do we insert at front Second option is you can use uh, the linked list class that we have created or 
the array list class we have created so you can use your library version okay if you don't want to do that you can also use the collections um, array list or the collections linked list right any any code you can use to um, build your own version of dynamic stack right and the behavior wise it will have same functionality except that it will not get full unless your system memory is not full right so that's all for dynamic stack hope you understood the functionality of dynamic stack okay i'll show you one more implementation of uh, implementing dynamic stack using the stack using array class so this class we have uh, just written so what i'm doing i have created one child class called dynamic stack and it is extending the stack using array class that we have just written so inside this class i have only updated the push method so basically i have overwritten this method right and i have provided two constructors so that i can provide uh, build the dynamic stack object right so the first constructor does not accept any capacity so i call the constructor so this is basically calling this method with the default capacity so i say okay go and create a stack with the default capacity right and if i get a capacity from user then also i can i call the constructor of the parent class so super is for calling the parent class and i give the capacity okay you go and call the constructor that is here right so this constructor is getting called right and i pass in the capacity so either i pass in the default capacity that is 10 or i give the user defined capacity right so i give that so this calls the parent constructor and initializes that array right of that particular size right the so pop method i told you it's not going to change the peak method it's not going to change in the push method if my array is full right so if get size is equal to data dot length right and what i will do i create a new array of twice the size i copy all the elements into the new array okay and i say okay uh, this dot data should uh, now point to this array right what happens so data was pointing to the old array right now data is pointing to the new array so this reference is gone that means this array will be garbage collected right so this is arr arr is a local variable it will be destroyed but data is a class member so it will not get destroyed so using the this keyword is optional it is for more clarity that uh, we are talking about the data member array not any local variable right? right so that is what we are doing here and then after we expanded the array we call the push method of the parent class in the uh, parent class now if if your array has already expanded you will never get this uh, condition so this condition will never be met which condition that uh, data dot length is equal so exception will not be thrown and what will happen top plus plus and data of top equal to item so this code will actually execute if condition will not be true so before calling the push method of parent function i simply expand the array in case of a dynamic array this is what i really do and it will work so what you need to do you need to replace this stack with the dynamic stack you can try it out and it will work right so that is another way of uh, using inheritance and creating a dynamic stack object for you one small change i wanted to discuss was i did a change that i made these uh, data members which were earlier private i made them as protected now right why because i want to use uh, these data members in the child class as well right so that is the only change i have done in the class called stack using an array so let us start by understanding the fundamentals of a queue so what is a queue a queue is just like a real life queue so in most general terms a queue represents a sequence of objects waiting to be served in a sequential order okay so one thing you need to remember is queue is also a linear data structure like other linear data structures you have seen so far arrays array list tags linked list queue queue is also a linear data structure that stores the data in the sequential order starting from the beginning of the queue right for example if you go to a bank right so the person who enters the queue first it is at the front of the queue second person is behind it third person is behind the second person and so on right so in general queue has two ends one is called as front from where the people will be served right and one is the rear end from where people will join the queue right 
basically insertion of data will happen from this side and removal of data will happen from the front side right people at the front once they are served they will get removed from the queue right now this queue can also be seen as queue of cars at a toll booth right people standing in a line to buy tickets right and in the world of computer science we use queues a lot right for example many people are uploading videos on youtube and youtube has maintained a queue so that people who have uh, uploaded videos first their videos will be processed right so we might maintain a queue of videos on the server waiting to be processed right similarly on in software applications for example an application has to perform several tasks it might maintain a queue of the task that it needs to perform so that our work gets done right so queue is again a very important very interesting data structure right so now let us talk little bit more about the operations so as i discussed one fundamental operation on the queue is insertion right i want to insert something into the queue right so the kind of queue that we are discussing current now it is called as fifo queue first in first out queue why because the person who joins the queue first is the first one to get served right in in a fifo queue insertion happens at the rear end of the queue so this is your let's say rear end right whereas deletion happens at the front end of the queue so this is your front side right so anything you cannot say okay i want to remove something from the middle of the queue that is not possible only the data which is at the front of the queue will be removed right there is one more operation so we have seen uh, insertion we have seen deletion right we will discuss how these operations are implemented using other data structures right there is one more operation that is called peak so i want to look what is the uh, front element okay who is standing at the front we call that operation as peak so just in case of stack if you remember uh, the peak operation returns the top of the top element of the stack in a queue peak operation should return the front element of the queue right the person who is standing at the front of the queue so that is what peak operation will do right so as a next step we will look at the implementation of a fifo queue right so there are three common ways to implement a queue we can use a fixed size array right and we'll see how this array will behave as a circular array when we are going to implement it okay so in this case uh, queue will have a limited capacity because the array size is fixed suppose n is 6 so i cannot have more than 6 elements in this queue at any given point right second is i can use a dynamic array so i can write my own logic for creating a dynamic array for example if my queue gets full i will say fine i will double the array i will create a new array of double the capacity of the given size right now if again the queue gets full i'll again do the same thing right so this is called as implementation using a dynamic array the other option is if you do not want to write the functionality of doubling it is already implemented inside your array list class you can also implement queue using a array list right third is we can use build a queue using linked list as well right uh, you know linked list is a dynamic data structure so we will look at how a linked list can be used to implement a queue as well right so let us start with the first uh, implementation that is implementing a queue using fixed size array now let us talk about how we can implement operations on a queue using a fixed size array so the three operations that we need to build are nq dq and peak so nq nq means i want to insert something into the queue dq means i want to remove the element at the front and peak means i want to get the element at the front these are the three things that we will have in a fifo queue first in first out right now let's see how we can use a fixed size array to create these operations on the queue right so in the beginning i should know if something is coming at what index i will insert it into the queue and at what index i will remove it from the queue right so what i will do i'll say okay let us take a variable called front and it is here right we can also take another variable rear but again that is optional if you are maintaining the size of the queue in the beginning size is 0 front is also at 0 that means um, nothing is inserted in the queue yet right now someone says okay person 1 is going to join the queue and i will insert it right what i will do i will insert it at the rear end okay so how do i compute the rear end let's see so rear end can be said as front plus size 
I will tell you why. Right. So what is front? Front is zero. So what is size? Size is zero. So zero plus zero is zero. So I can insert person one here in the queue, right? And I will increment the size. The size will become one, right? Size is going to become one, right? So I'm not going to change the front. Look carefully. I'm not going to change the front, right? Now uh, it was zero plus zero. That's fine, right? Now I can say again. I want to insert person two. Okay. I want to insert person two at what index I will insert. I will insert it at the rear end. Right? So what will be the rear my what will be the rear value now? It will be F plus size. So F is zero. Fine. Size is one. It is going to be one. So I can insert person two at this index. Very good. Right now, let's say one more person wants to join the queue. So I want to insert person three. Right. Size is already two. Right. I've inserted two elements, but what index I will insert? I will insert it at the rear index. What will be the rear index? Zero plus two. That is going to be two. That means person three will be inserted here. And this is the new rear. Okay, so front is not changing. Rear is changing in this case. Again, I want to insert person four. Let's insert person four. So size is already three now. Right? Size is already three. So what will be the new index? Zero plus three. It's going to be three. I can insert person four at this index, and my rear is already here, right? Now suppose I've done lot of insertions. I want to remove something, right? So I have inserted till person four also, and I want to see how my front is going to change, right? Now suppose I want to remove something. I want to uh, perform DQ, right? So that means I got a query to remove the front element. The front element will get removed. Right? Now how do I remove it? If I move this F one step forward right? and I will have to reduce the size. So right now the size was four because four elements are there in the queue. Right? My size becomes four from four. It becomes three and I say, okay, F should move one step ahead. So I'll say, okay, I'll take this front one step ahead that means this p1 is uh, it's kind of a removed it's not there right so the area between front and rear it is the content of the queue right now suppose i want to insert something more right so what i will do i'll again do um front which is at one okay plus size which is at three so look carefully so one plus three i get an index four that means the next insertion will happen at this index. Can I insert something? Of course I can insert something because Q is not yet full. I insert something at this index, right? Now suppose I want to do one more insertion. Again, um, what is the value of uh, size now? Size is still four. Size is four. Right? So what will be the value of rear? So it will be front, which is one plus rear, which is at uh, which is plus size, which is four, right? It is going to get five. Now, is this five a valid index? Is this five a valid index? The answer is no. Right now, I will get a problem that if it it will give me index out of bounds exception, but Q is not yet full. Q is not yet full. So how should I handle this case? Right. The way to handle this case is by treating this array as a circular array. Right. If you exceed four, you should come back to this index. You should kind of rotate and you should, you should you should come back here right now how do i achieve this i have to say take a mod with five every time you hit a five you go back to zero again you start filling the queue from this index now suppose i got this uh, p5 i have already got i want to insert p6 right? this p6 will get inserted here right? what i am saying is the rear will not be updated using this formula. The rear will be updated by using front plus size mod of the capacity of the queue. The capacity is five, right? So I have to take a mod with capacity. So that means if you hit the capacity, if the rear index hits its capacity, it will be again shifted back to zero, provided your queue is not full. You you have to check that okay, if my size is five and I have only four elements, right? Then I can add more. The size is five, and I have already added uh, 
if the capacity is 5 and the size is also 5 in that case i will throw that the queue is full i cannot insert anything more right so i will insert it here right now my front is still at p2 right front is still at p2 but my rear is here right now someone says okay i want to remove something or let's say i want to insert something right now what is the size the size is 5 can i insert something more the answer is no right so what you will check that if your size is equal to the maximum capacity that we have allocated i cannot insert anything into the queue so i have to throw some kind of error that queue is full right now again let's say i want to insert uh, perform the remove operation right so how i will do it i'll say fine i'll move this front from here to here i will reduce down the size from 5 to 4 and this makes that p2 is not there right so p2 is not there i'll either make it zero or i'll just keep keep it like this right now i can insert something right i want to insert something so my, what is my front front is at two what is my rear oh, sorry what is my size the size is five so two plus five mod five it gives me two. Oh, sorry the size is actually four the size is four so two plus four that is six mod 5 it gives me 1 2 plus 4 mod 5 it's 1 that means the rear should come here and the next insertion will happen at this index so if p7 comes that person 7 will be stored at this place again if you want to remove something you will remove from the front so the front is p3 so you will read the elements in this order right the elements will be removed in this order right now one thing you have to notice when you're moving your front right the front your front will also go like this it will go to p3 p4 p5 and again it should come here p6 p7 right basically what i'm trying to say is that when when you're doing this operation that uh front will move like f equal to f plus one right here also we should do mod with the capacity so that my both front and rear move in a circular fashion inside the array right at, at, at any given point right, um, I have to check if the queue is full I cannot insert something if the queue is empty I cannot remove something right so we have to handle two cases that if size equal to maximum capacity I cannot insert and if the size is zero I cannot remove right so those these will become our special cases in the code right so I cannot remove so I hope you understood the logic for the fixed size queue and now we will jump into the implementation let us start implementing queue using a fixed size array i will be using java but you can use any language of your choice for the implementation so let's begin the first thing i will need to do is i need to create a class queue and i need to define few data members so as we have discussed earlier that if we are using a fixed size array we will need a object reference to store this array right so you can call it anything i am just going to call it as arr right so let's create this variable data member so i'll say private it's an integer array and i need to define what is the maximum capacity of this queue right so that i will define using a constant because i'm taking a fixed size array i'll say okay fine this constant will be a public static final int called as default capacity and this is equal to 10 right uh, one thing i need to notice that if someone is inserting in data into this queue what is the current size of the queue so i will take another private variable to denote the size of the queue right and now in order to uh, perform operations like uh, insertion and deletion i must know the front of the queue so i'll create uh, another variable that is private int and i call it as front right these are the four data members that we will need so one is your capacity let's say that is 10 then the, there is your front which is initially at 0 and there is size which which will be also at 0 right now we need to initialize these data members so that part we will do in the constructor for the queue right so i'll say fine let's create a constructor and in this constructor i'm going to create uh, queue right so maybe i'm going to get some capacity as input right if nothing is given i will use the default capacity so i'll create actually two constructors one is the parameterized accepting capacity and other one does not 
accept any capacity from the user so in this case we will use the default capacity so one thing we can do is uh, from this constructor we can directly call this and we can say okay fine you can call this constructor and give default capacity as a parameter to it right so that will help me to avoid uh, creating an array here and that part i can do directly here right let's see how we can do it now if my capacity is less than one if someone gives a wrong argument maybe a negative capacity in that case my code should throw an exception so i can say throw new exception that uh, invalid capacity you are uh, giving it to me right and also we need to define that this throws an exception right all right now let's do the actual work the actual work is that we need to initialize this array right so i need to say that fine this array that i have right so again i'm using this uh, which is optional here but uh, it's a good thing to do because you are clearly referring to the data member of the class so this dot array should be a new array of capacity right now this capacity can come as an argument from the user directly or if the user does not give then this constructor will be called and this capacity will come from here right that will be your 10 right and here also we need to say that this method can also throw an exception so this is how we have initialized our array now we need to initialize the size and the front variables initializing them is pretty easy so i can say this dot size it is zero and this dot front that is also zero right so I hope this is clear. So we have created a new queue of given capacity. It can be fixed size. It can be uh, given by the user as well, right? So we have a capacity, right? Let's say capacity in this case is one, two, three, four, five, six. So capacity is, is six. Front is zero. Array is referring here, and the current size of the queue is also zero. So the queue has been initialized correctly. Now the next operation that we need to build on this queue is nq. I want to push something into it. So I can say public void nq and I'm going to get uh, some data or value to add into this queue. Now since it is a fixed size queue and it is possible that queue is already full. So how do I check if the queue is full? I can simply say that fine if the current size, if this dot size that is my data member it is equal to the capacity of the queue so what is the capacity this dot array dot length right? length of the given array then i can say throw new exception that my queue is and here i can say that this method also throws a exception but if the queue is not full so we can insert it right so if the queue is not full we can say okay fine we will push something at a rear index so we will need to compute that rear index let's see how we can compute that so i can say the rear index according to the formula is the front index plus the size and then we have to take the mod with the capacity so that capacity is nothing but this dot array dot length that is the capacity now in this case rear will be 0 plus 0 mod with 6 in that case it will be 0 so I will insert something here and then again size will also increment so we will uh, put the data so we'll say this dot array at the rear index I want to put the value so I'm storing 1 and I need to update the size I need to say the size is now 1 so next time the rear would be 0 plus 1 mod 6 next time the insertion will happen here maybe i push two so i'll do the insertion at this index so to, in order to achieve that i have to say this dot size plus plus so i need to increment the size as well so that's how the nq operation will will work right and finally you insert here you insert here you insert here you insert here now if you try to insert the queue is full you have to remove something so maybe this gets removed so your f will come here right now let us look at the remove method as well so in that case we can call the method as uh, public now either you can make it as void or you can make it as int so you also want to return uh, what has been extracted from the queue right 
So in that case, you can make the return type as int. Now this method can also throw an exception. If your size is zero, that means queue is empty. You cannot remove anything from this queue. If this dot size is zero, what you should do? You will say, okay, so new exception that queue is empty. But if this is not the case, I can say throws new exception here. Sorry, throws exception. But if this is not the case, what we discussed, what we will do, right? So we'll store maybe this data one. We'll store this one here. You can say, okay, our output, the answer that we want to return is present at this dot array of front right? or this dot front, whatever. Right? So you can definitely return this answer, but you have to update your front and you have to update your size as well. Right? So I can say fine, this dot front will move this dot front equal to this dot front plus one mod capacity so capacity is this dot array dot length right and the size will reduce this dot size minus one if you remember from the diagram this is what we discussed earlier also that this is how my front will change in case of removal right okay and this is how i will compute rear right in the case of insertion right we have already discussed how it's going to work so I'm changing the front and I'm changing the size as well. So this is my DQ method, right? Now let us write some more uh, methods that would be helpful. So one method would be peak. If I want to look at the front element, I can say fine public int peak. Now if again the queue is empty, I cannot look at the front element. So if this dot size is zero, I can say fine. Uh, so new exception, the queue is empty. Q is empty. That means I cannot remove anything from this queue. Otherwise, okay, let's just fix the error. Otherwise, I can say return the front element this dot array of the index which is this dot front. Okay, that, that is my peak method return the front element. So the complexity of this method would be order one. Here also DQ method, it will be also order one. The insert method that is also going to be order one. The constructors are also order one. Apart from it, we can make two, three more methods. One is to check if the queue is empty or not. That can be a Boolean method. I can say public Boolean is empty or just empty, right? So I can return true if this dot size is equal to zero. I can make a method called public boolean full. So I can return if this dot size equals this dot array dot length. Okay. That will tell me if the queue is full. What else? I can also make a method to get the size public int size. So I can return this dot size from this method. Anything else that you think would be helpful? Maybe just a method to print the entire queue, right? So maybe I want to display the entire queue, right? So in Java, uh, this method is called as two string, which is present in the default class. So I need a way to look at um, all the elements of the queue, right? So Right now, I'm not going to iterate from uh, front to rear. I will just display the array. So it's more of a method for debugging, not for uh, doing anything else. Okay. I'm go just going to print my array or we can say we can print so one simple way you can do it as out uh, arrays dot to string. And you can say this dot ARR, right? But now instead of doing this, you can also say that fine, I would uh, print elements from rear to front. Suppose this diagram is your queue. So maybe I want to print the elements from uh, rear to front, right? Or front to rear. 
so how i can do it right now suppose if my front is at 2 right so i want to print let's say 1 2 3 4 5 6 so i want to print all the elements from front to rear of the queue i want to display all these elements so my output should be 1 2 3 4 5 6 so how i can do it very easy i can i know this index i can compute this i can compute this i can compute this so this is f plus 0 this is f plus 1 this is f plus 2 this is f plus 3 this is f plus 4 right and of course you have to take the mod so that you can rotate in this circular fashion so very easy i can say for int i equal to 0 i less than this dot size okay and i can say okay the current element the current index will be nothing but this dot front plus i take a mod with this dot capacity that is array dot length now i can say s out that in, uh, element so this dot array of index followed by a comma and s out this looks good to go so this will uh, print all the elements from front to rear now let us test our functionality in the q test file so we have created a q test so here what we need to do we need to create a queue right so we will say psvm that is the main method now we can create a queue object q q equal to new queue let's say the capacity is 5 now i want to add certain elements to it right? those exception right we have to tell that main can also throw an exception here now capacity is 5 so what do i do i say okay fine uh let's push q dot nq1 let's say two three four five then i remove something let's say q dot dq q dot dq and then i can say seven and eight and then i can say q dot display right now let's see how this queue should look like let's go and run the code so i inserted one two three four five the so queue was full then i removed something right so i removed this i removed this my front is here and then i enqueued seven and eight so seven and eight they will come here right so if i now print my queue it should be like this three four five and 7 8 yes that is what i am getting right that means my queue is behaving in a correct manner the front element would be this next front 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 would be this so i hope you understood uh, the implementation of queue using a fixed size array next we will jump into the dynamic array implementation of the queue so let us now discuss the implementation of a dynamic queue right now there are two ways one you can use a linked list or you can use a dynamic array as well right so in this implementation i am going to show you how we can use a dynamic array functionality and we are going to extend the implementation of the queue class by adding this functionality okay so queue we have already written what i am going to do i am going to create a class called dynamic queue which will be the child class of the parent class so dynamic queue extends the queue class right now one thing to notice that this dynamic queue it's going to behave in a similar way the operations nq dq peak they will remain same the only thing is the logic in the insertion operation that is nq operation it's going to change right so first of all let us start by creating the constructors for this class so i can say public dynamic queue so again there can be two types of constructors one without the capacity and one with the capacity right so public dynamic queue where I am going to accept some capacity, right? Now, in this case, in the first constructor, what I am going to do? I am going to simply call the second constructor with default capacity. So I can say this and call it with the default capacity. Basically, what, what is happening? If I want to create a dynamic queue object in which I am not getting any capacity, so I make a call here. If I get a call here, Again, what I can do, I already know how to create an array of given capacity that I'm doing in the parent class, right? 
तो Q इज माई पेरेंट क्लास डायनेमिक Q इज माई चाइल्ड क्लास तो इफ आई वॉन्ट टू क्रिएट अ फिक्स साइज एर इन बोथ तो इफ आई गेट अ कॉल हियर टू क्रिएट अ डायनेमिक क्यू आई कैन रीडायरेक्ट द कॉल टू द पेरेंट कंस्ट्रक्टर सो आई कैन से सुपर एंड आई कैन पास इन द गिवन कैपेसिटी दैट आई एम गेटिंग राइट बेसिकली आई एम कॉलिंग द कंस्ट्रक्टर ऑफ द पेरेंट क्लास राइट नाउ दिस इज अ स्पेलिंग मिस्टेक डायनेमिक क्यू नाउ The parent class constructor. If we look carefully here, right? So basically, what is happening? The call is going to come here to this constructor. So we are already initializing the array correctly. Size is set to zero, front is set to zero, and we are also throwing a exception. We can also uh, say that our dynamic queue can also throw an exception. This can also throw an exception. Now the errors are resolved, right? So constructor part is done. Now Uh, there won't be any change in uh, other methods except nq let us see so if i want to nq something uh, let's say public void nq so i'm going to override the method that i have written for insertion you can see we are overriding this method right now there are two things we have to do we have to expand the array right and then we have to put the element If the queue is full, okay. Uh, put the element right. Expand if queue is full, and then we have to put the element right. Now this functionality we were not doing in the previous uh, implementation. Now we have to do this uh, functionality right. Now assume that your queue looks like this. So suppose queue is like this: one, two, three, four, five, six, right. and suppose my front is here that means if i want to read data i will read the data in this manner right so my capacity was 6 size is also 6 that means my queue is full right and i want to create a new queue a new array basically with double the capacity right let's just say that this is going to be 2x twice of the original capacity now if i want to copy this data can i copy it directly can i say I'll copy five, six, one, two, three, four. Will that be correct? The answer is no. Why? Because if I want to do a next insertion, right? So at what index the next insertion happens? It happens at front plus size, right? So in this case, front is at two. Fine. Size is six. The next insertion will happen at the eighth index. That means I will start filling from this index. But is it correct? The answer is no, right? because what happens at these places we don't know right so the correct way of doing the copy is you create a queue of uh, double the capacity right you iterate over this part let me change the color you iterate over this part in a circular way and you copy the elements here right so you copy 1 2 3 4 then you copy 5 6 this is my front this is my front now if i want to do an insertion so my rear would be front plus size front is 0 fine size is 6 i'll start copying from the sixth index 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 that is correct so if i want to push something that insertion should happen at these places right so let's see how we can do do this right so let's say this is my original array this is my temp array in which i'm going to perform a copy so i will say if what how do i check the size if this dot size is equal to this dot array dot length right now one thing you will notice that these members were earlier private so i've just made them protected now right i've made them protected so that i can use them in the child class right so coming back here so i can access the data members of the parent class because they are now protected right so what i have to do i have to create a new array of double size right? so let's say there is a new array called temp that is equal to new int of size twice of this dot array dot length so this is created 
now i have to copy the data so i can say for int i equal to 0 i less than this dot array dot length that is the size right or you can say this dot size both of them they are equal i plus plus right? i'm going to run a loop these many times right okay so i'm going to iterate over these positions 7 8 will come later right i need to copy these values right so i can say temp of i and add the ith index in the temp what should i copy so at this index what should i copy i should copy the element from the front so this is f plus 0 then at the next index i should copy this value this is f plus 1 then this is f plus 2 f plus 3 f plus 4 f plus 5 and so on right so i can say this is going to be equal to uh, this dot array of let's uh, find the old index so this is going to be this dot original front plus the original size with the original capacity mod right so the elements at the uh, at this particular index right mod this dot array dot length this is what i need to do right sorry this dot front plus this dot uh, plus i sorry that's a mistake so f plus 0 f plus 1 f plus 2 f plus 3 right so basically the ith element okay so the element at let's say temp of 3 will be equal to array of f which was let's say 0 1 2 plus i i is uh, 3 mod 6 it will be array of 5 the so fifth index 0 1 2 3 4 5 so that element is 4 that's correct so at the third position i am putting the value that is 4 right array of 5 this is what i need to do right so just like we did in the display method in the queue that is the same logic we are using here right now once this is done temp array has been created right so i've erased all of it i'll just do it once again so it was like one two three four five six right this is my friend now i have copied this data like this one two three four five six so i have to reset the front here right this should be the new front okay and this was my array this was my temp right now one thing i need to change is that this arr should refer to this memory this connection should get broken so i can say this dot arr this will be now referring to temp object and now doing this no one is referring to this memory so garbage collector will clean up this memory right? and this dot front will be set to zero right but have i really done insertion as of now the answer is no we have still not done the insertion part right so how do i insert so i can say fine at this position which is rear rear is my f plus size mod capacity I will do array of rear equal to the value that I'm inserting and I will do size plus plus right now this code I'm already doing in the NQ method of the parent class so I can just call that method super dot NQ and I can give value right now this method will get to know that the array has been changed because ARR is now referring to this memory right and it will try to push something into this method uh, something into the new array because we have changed arr which is now referring to the new array right so i can say this method can also throw an exception throws exception this error should get resolved let us look at the nq method of the parent class so here what is happening this is what we are doing right now this condition is handled in the child class if q is full double it when you come back into the parent method this condition will not be true so what code will execute this code will execute right that is how we have implemented dynamic q using a dynamic array right now let us test down uh, test our functionality let us go back into q test dot java right so earlier i was creating a q of fixed size so if i try to uh, let's say push six elements in a queue of size 5 
I will get a exception, right? I'm using the fixed size queue. Let's see. So I'm getting an exception that queue is full, right? Now if I replace this queue object with the dynamic queue object, let me show you. If I do this, I should be able to hold it, right? Yes, I'm able to hold it. I do not get any exception because queue queue is getting expanded, right? And even I can put more elements. I can define. Let me put nine, ten, eleven, twelve, right, and so on. So let's see what output do we really get. Right? So I'm getting everything from three to twelve, which is correct, right? So you inserted one, two, three, four, five, six. Then you removed one, two, the elements at the front. Then you inserted seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay. Irrespective of the initial capacity, which was five, you are able to hold more elements because your array is getting expanded during the insertion process, right? So in this case, you will never get a queue is full exception unless you run out of your uh, heap memory or something like that, right? So that is uh, dynamic queue. Using a dynamic array, right? So next, we will discuss dynamic queue using a linked list. So so far, we have seen uh, two implementation: fixed size array implementation and dynamic array implementation. We have seen, right? You can also use a array list object uh, if you want, right? Now, third kind of implementation why will involve a linked list because linked list is also a linear data structure, right? Now you might ask how we can use a linked list. It's pretty simple and very intuitive as well. Now suppose you are inserting something. So one is at the beginning, then you insert two, then you insert three, then you insert four, right? Now if I ask you, uh, this is let's say head and this is tail, right? If I ask you where is the front element, right? So I want to get the front element. So that is one. If I want to remove this element, can you remove it? Of course, yes. You can say okay, I will move this head here, and that means this element will be removed. If I want to read the front element again, that element is at present at the head of the linked list. If I want to insert something, it should go at the rear end. So where is the rear end? The rear end is at the tail, right? So you can easily insert something here and your tail will come here, right? So your head and tail uh, data members will behave as front and rear for the linked list. So this will be your front. This will be your rear. You can always insert at the rear end which is insertion at tail and it will be a order one operation and you can always remove from the front end which is again going to be a order one operation right so very simple implementation and we have already covered linked list so i will not write the code using linked list once again you can either use the same class object so in your queue class you can say fine i am going to create a linked list object linked list l and whenever you want to enqueue you add it to the linked list and whenever you want to remove you remove the first element of the linked list okay so those methods can be implemented or you can implement all those methods from scratch as well right so that is about uh, implementation using a linked list now before we wind up this tutorial i want to talk a little bit about the java queue that is part of collections framework right so the java queue supports uh, three types of operations so one is your insert remove and examine right so examine is like getting the front element right now there are uh, two variants of the methods that are provided so in one variant the methods throws an exception like the variant that we have coded those methods throw an exception so if you want to add something the method is called as add instead of nq right so you will say okay i will create a queue object and i will call the library method add right if i want to remove the front element the method is called as remove instead of dq and if you want to get the front element it is called as element right if the queue is empty it will throw an exception right and the second set of methods they are also same but instead of throwing an exception they will return a special value maybe a boolean value whether the operation was successful or not right so add and offer they are equivalent methods remove and pull they are equivalent methods element and peak they are equivalent methods okay so i've discussed about queue interface in my java collections tutorial on the channel right so what we talked about is 
that in Java Q is actually an interface. Okay. And there are three implementations. There are three classes that implement this Q. So your linked list class, it implements your FIFO Q that we have just seen that we can build a Q using a linked list. Okay. And there is something, there is a class called as array deck. So array deck is a class that implements another kind of queue in which you can insert and remove from both ends, right? So it is called as a doubly ended queue. So in this case, the behavior would be different. You, you can add at first position. You can add at last position. You can remove at first position. You can also remove at last position. So it stand, it is a doubly ended queue. It's called as deck, right? It's not DQ. It's called as deck, right? It's a different type of queue. And third type of queue, it's called as a priority queue, which we will of course discuss. It is based upon the concept of heap data structure. In this case, the elements don't maintain a FIFO ordering, but they maintain a priority ordering. So again, it's a big topic. We will discuss it separately. But if you want to see the code demo, how these different queues are, how these classes are different in behavior, check out my video on data structures and in which I have discussed the complete collections framework as well as different implementations of queue as a part of that video. Let us start the topic by understanding what is tree data structure. So in computer science, a tree represents a hierarchical structure with a set of connected nodes. Right? So for example, if you look at this diagram, this actually represents a tree and this node, it is the starting of the tree. It is called as the root node. Right? We will discuss where it can be useful. So in this structure, each node in the tree can be connected to many children. So this is a non-linear data structure. The first non-linear data structure that we are covering is a tree. So far we have talked about array. We have talked about linked list. All of those data structures were linear data structures because they were following a sequence here. There is no sequence here. There is a hierarchy, right? So each node can be connected to many children. So two is connected with seven and five. It is connected with two children. So seven and five, they are children of two, but must be connected to exactly one parent. So each node must have one parent. I cannot say seven will have two parents. No, seven will have only one parent. That is two. Five has only one parent. That is two. Two has only one parent. That is seven. 10 has only one parent. That is also seven, right? So except for the root node, which has no parent. So root node has no parent rest. All the nodes, they have one, one parent, right? Now, because of this property, there will be an interesting observation. Suppose you're creating a tree in which you are going to have N nodes. Okay. For example, I have three nodes here. So how many edges you will have so except for the root node for every node that you will have that you will add there will be an edge. So there will be, of course, n minus one edges in the tree, right? So in, in any tree that you are going to create, irrespective of is it a binary tree or not? Each node that you add will add an edge in the tree, except the root node. Okay. So root node does not add any edge in the tree, except the root node. If there are n nodes in the tree, there are, there would be n minus one edges. Okay. Because root node has no parent rest all the nodes that you add they must be connected to a parent through an edge right so this is an interesting observation you can note so in n every tree there will be n nodes and there would be n minus 1 edges in the tree right so that is tree data structure now let us talk about where this data structure can be used how it can be helpful in computer science okay so basically trees are used to represent or manipulate hierarchical data in applications such as file systems or directory structure, right? So all of you have worked with the file system. So what happens in a file system? You say, okay, uh, I have my PC in this. I have certain drives, C drive, D, D drive, E drive. Right? And then inside this, I have folders F1, F2, F3, F4. Right? And here also I have folders. Then I have subfolders. Right. Maybe I have photos here. Maybe I have some documents here. Right now we often do operations like that. Okay. I want to move these photos from here to here. Right. So what is going to happen? You're not going to copy this data. You're going to say, okay, I'll cut and paste. So if you 
simply want to move this photos from here to here what you need to do you do not need to uh, copy this information to some other part of the disk you only need to change the reference right that okay earlier this reference was stored by uh, f4 now this reference is stored by f2 basically the links right the links to the folders and some folders they can be easily changed if the data structure is implemented using a tree right this is something we will discuss right the file system is a good example of uh, a tree data structure right multiple inheritance trees in programming so this is used when you are using object oriented programming concepts and you have a class c which is going to inherit from a class a it is also going to inherit some methods from uh, class b right so this is uh, not exactly a tree i would say because uh this node this is inheriting from two different classes so irrespective of that fact basically uh, the trees are internally used by the compilers to see what methods would be part of the class that you have implemented using inheritance okay then again in natural language processing basically whenever you have a sentence for example i am going for a party right now this sentence can be broken down into uh, certain components maybe you have a verb maybe you have a subject maybe you have a predicate or you have even for language parsers okay so what are your parsers so whenever you write code uh, it goes through a language parser so that compiler can figure out if there is any error in the code is it it is having the correct syntax or not so they again form a parse tree of that code right so again it's an interesting concept that you will learn in compilers right so again they are used a lot in understanding of the language okay then in html there is a dom tree so whenever you open up a website right you see there is a html code right so inside html code there are a lot of tags there is head there is uh, body right inside body there is a paragraph there is a div there is a image right so if you look carefully this whole document forms a dom tree so inside dom tree you have head you have body right then you have certain elements you have div you have paragraph here you might have image you might have some text right now what is happening you want to say okay i want to uh, click this particular button and on clicking this button this div uh, will change its color right so how do you fetch elements from this huge web page so there are methods like document dot get element by id document dot get element by tag name so what it is doing it is traversing this dom tree it it is a tree of objects okay it is a tree of objects uh, in your web browser again it's behind the scenes so it is doing some kind of search operation on this tree and it is trying to manipulate this tree right for example you scroll your web page and a new item is added from the bottom so maybe it is adding something in in the list right so your tree is getting modified right then of course there are uh, trees which are used in search operations like binary search tree there are trees which are used to implement data structure like map self balancing trees okay so they are used to perform faster searches and keeping data ordered we will talk about bsts in the coming class in machine learning there is a concept called as hierarchical clustering so it is a part of uh, a clustering technique okay where i want to group together similar items so it, it comes under a part of unsupervised learning so there also the tree data structure is used right so you, we see lot of applications are there and that becomes uh, very important for us to understand uh, the tree data structure so in this video we'll be uh, talking more about binary trees in general because that they are the most common ones uh, that are widely used okay so let us start with binary trees so let us start by understanding what is a binary tree so as i discussed it is the most commonly used uh, tree structure uh, in which you can have at max two children okay so it constrains the number of children for each parent to at most two that means a uh, node can have zero children for example in this case the nodes d e f g they don't have any children they are also called as leaf nodes the nodes which don't have any children they are called as leaf nodes node can also have one child right or it can have 
टू चिल्ड्रन राइट इट के नॉट हैव मोर देन टू चिल्ड्रन फॉर एग्जाम्पल इफ आई ड्रॉ फ्यू स्ट्रक्चर्स यू हैव टू टेल मी वेदर इट इज अ बाइनरी ट्री और नॉट इज इट अ बाइनरी ट्री द आंसर इज येस ईच नोट हैज जीरो चाइल्ड वन चाइल्ड और टू चिल्ड्रन राइट ओके इज दिस अ बाइनरी ट्री द आंसर इज येस तो दिस नोट द नोट सी इट हैज वन चाइल्ड ए एंड बी दे हैव टू चिल्ड्रन एंड डी ई एफ दे हैव दे डोंट हैव एनी चिल्ड्रन हेंस इन दिस केस वी हैव थ्री लीव नोट्स तो दिस इज अगेन एन एग्जाम्पल ऑफ अ बाइनरी ट्री राइट ना वॉट वी आर गोइंग टू लर्न इन दिस टूटोरियल वी आर गोइंग टू लर्न अबाउट डिफरेंट ऑपरेशन हाउ डू वी क्रिएट अ बाइनरी ट्री हाउ डज द नोट स्ट्रक्चर लुक लाइक हाउ डू वी परफॉर्म सर्च और अपडेट ऑपरेशन ऑन अ बाइनरी ट्री हाउ डू वी डिस्प्ले अ बाइनरी ट्री एंड देर आर फोर पॉपुलर वेज टू डू इट प्री ऑर्डर रिवर्सल इन ऑर्डर रिवर्सल पोस्ट ऑर्डर रिवर्सल level order reversal okay so we are going to look at all those all these things one by one and we'll be starting with uh, creation of tree first let's begin with that let us talk about creating the tree so first of all we need to understand the structure of the node that is going to create the tree right so in this tree if you look carefully there are so many nodes and this box represents one particular node okay that is the root node right so i have the root node now what is this root node going to contain or any node going to contain it is going to store three things one is your data one is the address of the left node one is the address of the right node okay in java we also call it as the reference right now suppose this object b it is created at some memory address let's say uh, 250 right this is the location of b in the heap where it is created so a is left is going to store 250 let's say this is created at some location 380 So A is right is going to store three eighty right. A itself is created at some some location. Let's say four hundred. The root is going to store four hundred. Okay. So root is not a node. Root is a, just a reference to the root node. Okay. So root variable is holding the address of the root node. Right. Now B is left is referring to D. So D is created at some location. Let's say five sixty. So here we will have five sixty. Now D is left and right. They are they are null they, they don't refer to anyone because d is a leaf node right so d is a leaf node e is a leaf node f is also a leaf node so they are left and right they are null now b is a node with a single child right because it does not have any right child hence this value is also null and here i will store the address of e here i will store the address of f right so i hope you are understanding the structure of the node so i need to implement a class called node in which i will have three things one is my integer data data can take any type just to keep it simple i'm taking it as a integer one will be my node left a reference of the next no uh, left node and node right a reference to the right node if the left and right node does not exist then i will set this value to null right now let us see in the code how can i implement this node class so let us go to intellij now i am going to implement the tree data structure i have a class called binary tree i have a class called binary tree test both are empty classes as of now so in order to build binary tree class i need to define that what is node right so node will have three things one is my data one is my left and one is my right apart from it i also need to give a constructor here that whenever a new node is constructed what data it should take Well, it's okay. Data I will know, but at the time of construction of new node, I do not know what node will go into the left, what node will go into the right. So I will simply say that my data this is equal to D, and left and right they will be set to null by default. So whenever you are creating a new node, you do not know the left and right uh, nodes. So th these will be set later. Right now comes the binary tree class. Now. Now suppose we want to create a tree like this, okay? Or let me take up another example in which I have numeric data. So I can say, okay, let me create a tree like this: one connected with two, and then it is connected with three, right? Let's say very simple tree, three nodes. Now, how you will read this tree? The first thing is, how do I read this tree? Right? So the first input I will get is the root node. Okay, user will enter one. i will say fine input is 1 let me read this create a node called a root node and root node is going to point to this node right 
and in the left of this i will again read from the user right the user says okay fine the next node is 2 so i'll say fine i'll create a node called 2 i will attach it in the left of 1 like this okay and now what is the next node i will read right now it can happen that i have something in the left of 2 or i have something in the right of 2 or i, I have something in the right of 1 right so i do not know the way we are going to do it is we are going to read now what is there in the left of two okay so if the uh, left of two is null right i will input minus one so minus one in the input will denote that near is nothing here so i will simply set this value to be null right? what is right of two i am again going to say it is minus one so i will set this value to null right now this option is gone i have read it this option is gone now i can only read this so I will come back here. I will say fine. This 2 is done. Now try to read what is there in the right of 1. Right. So I will say okay. The next input is 3. I will create a new node. And I will attach it of course here. But before that I will read what is in the left of 3. Right. So attach part will happen a little later. Right. I will read what is in the left of 3. So this value would be minus 1. Minus 1. What is there in the right of 3? Again, I say minus one. Now this node is constructed or in a way I can say this subtree has been constructed. So once it is constructed, I will return it back to the parent. So the parent is one. It will get connected here, right? So this will become more clear once I write the code. So idea is I will of course do it for a bigger tree as well. This is little tricky, right? So what the idea is we are going to build a tree recursively. We are going to build recursively, right? Now, how we are going to build a tree recursively? Many tree operations, they are recursive in nature, right? So, I'll say, okay, fine. I will build the root node. That is one. Then I will build the complete left subtree. In the above example, the left subtree has only one node. So, it looks easy, right? I will build the complete right subtree. Right? Okay, I will build the complete left subtree and I will attach it here. That is part one. I will build the complete right subtree. And then I will attach it in the right of one. Right? So we will do it for a bigger tree as well. So let us jump into the code first and try to see how this can be written. Of course, I will do a dry run and explain you how you can build a more complicated tree like this with the same code. Okay. So let us go into the binary tree class. Now one thing is for sure that every tree must know what is the root node. What is the root node? So this is something that will be the property of the tree. Every tree must know what is the root node. Just like in a linked list, every linked list knows what is the head of the linked list, what is the tail of the linked list. So in, in case of tree, you must know that what is the root node, right? So one thing is there, I am going to read this tree. So user will uh, input will come through the user, right? So let us see the tree construction part. So in this binary tree class, what I'm going to do, I'm going to first define the data members of the tree. So I have only one data member that is the root of the tree, right? Now this root should be initialized where it should be initialized. Of course, when the tree is created. So when the tree is created, it is created when the constructor is called. So I need to define a constructor called binary tree. Right? Now in this constructor, what I need to do, I need to take input from the user. So in order to take input, I will need a scanner object. I will say scanner SE. This is equal to new scanner system dot in. So scanner object is used in Java to read inputs. So I have imported the scanner. Right now, the building of the tree is recursive in nature. So I will create a helper function to do it. So I can say find node. Let's say create tree. And to this create tree method, I am going to supply the scanner object so that this method will actually read from the user. Okay. So I will say fine. The root should be initialized by calling the create tree method. So create tree is a helper method getting called in the constructor that will read the tree from the command line. Right. Now I'm going to pass the scanner object here so that I can use it to read data from the user. Right. I'm no, I don't want to create this object again and again. Uh, inside this method. Okay. So I'm creating it once and that object is being circulated 
across all the recursive function calls that are going to happen right now suppose i read something right? i can say okay uh data that i'm going to read is scanner dot next int so i'm going to read something all right now i have read something from the user let's say this data is one right what i want to do okay this data can also be minus one right i'm asking okay tell me what is the next data so i will actually have a two two types of case one will be my base case if my data is minus one then what should i return right. i will return a null that means okay i don't want to attach any node here that subtrace just null so i will return null but if it is not minus one if it is something else basically i'm talking about the recursive case for example if my input is one what i will do i will create a new node i'll say fine i'll call it a node root this is equal to new node and uh, i give it the value data right so if root is confusing to you just call it as n right i create a node called n which is initialized with this data so suppose my input is one so I say okay n is a new node now what should I do I need to read the left subtree basically I need to create a left subtree here and attach it here right so what I can say that in the left of n n dot left should refer to a new tree which is equal to create tree again scanner will be, get passed what should n dot right point to n dot right should also refer to a new tree called create that is returned by the create tree method and again the scanner is going to get passed and then i can return n so what i'm saying that n dot right should also point to a new tree so left subtree right subtree right this is the recursive way of constructing the tree now you might ask okay how does this method will actually work i will show you it will actually work Let's see how it's going to work, right? So let us take an example of a more complicated tree. Or let's first start with a simple tree, right? Let's say I have a tree like this: one, two, three. Right? Now for this tree, what is my input going to look like? So input will be one, then it will be two, then it will be left and right of two, which is minus one, minus one, then it will be three. And left and right of three, which will be minus one minus. So given this input, I actually want to create this kind of a structure. Let's see how it's going to happen. Right. So I said fine. Uh, root is equal to create tree. I call this method create tree. It reads something from the user. So one integer it's going to read. So it's going to read one. So data is not minus one. Fine. I come here. Node n this is equal to new node. So basically I have a stack call in which n is going to say n is a new node where the data is one fine now n dot left it makes a new call n dot left right so i said fine in the left of one i want to create tree so I, again create tree is called if you come again in this function you read something from the user so you read two fine you said fine i create a new node n okay a new node n is created so earlier n was here now the new n is here right it's a local variable it is created in every stack call right it is here this is equal to new node where the data is 2 fine now n dot left this is equal to create tree right so again i call i make a function call create tree go and do something right so I'm, i've made a call for here right now if i go and read what is the next number it is minus 1 so I return null. Basically, what happens? So two's left made a call and it got a value that is null. So two's left starts pointing to null. Now, what is the next call that is going to happen? We are in this stack, and I make a call that two's right this is equal to create tree. So I make another call here, and this value is also null, right? Once these two calls are over this one and this one i return n so i return this n back where i return it to the place from where it was called so who called it one called it so one gets to know that my left should refer to this node so by returning this n this answer goes back to the previous function 
and once left is now connected with now what is the next call we are going to make so once left is now created so this call is over once left is now created right now one says okay fine my left is created i am pointing to two i will make a call to update my right so n dot right this is equal to create tree right so this was already read again a new function call is made you read the next number that is three you create a new node from line number 29 you said the new node is three n dot left this is equal to create tree so three is left makes a call to create tree which again reads a data that is minus one so you return a null so three is left says okay make a call that call says i will return null now three is right says make a call to create tree it goes and reads a number that is minus one again it returns a null right and then you return n so now n is this right so it returns three back so when you return three back what happens who called three so one's right made a call to create this tree so one's right is now going to store the address of three so it gets connected here from here if you return n where does it go it goes back to the constructor because this made a call to create t finally root is referring to the address of one right okay i'll hide myself so that you can see the root is referring to this one right so this is how it is uh, happening right so this is a small example demonstrating how this small tree is constructed using this code right now i will run this example on a run this code on a bigger example as well now some of you might not be convinced that whether this code will work for a bigger tree or not so let us rerun this code on a bigger example okay so this is the method create tree that again i am explaining with a big big example so let's say i have a tree which is which should be built like this let's say i have one i have two i have three I have four, I have five, and maybe I have six. Now, what input should I give? So, first of all, I will give the root node. Okay, so input will be one. Then I will go left. Input will be two. Then again, I will go left. The input will be four. Then I will go left of four, which is minus one. I will go right of four, which is also minus one. Okay. then i will come back because four is done i will come back i will go in the right of 2 so right of 2 is again minus 1 then i i will go back two's left is done two's right is done right so i'll go in the right of 1 so right of 1 is 3 then i will go in the left of 3 which is 5 i will go in the left of 5 which is minus 1 right of 5 which is also minus 1 then i will go back i will go in the right of 3 which is 6 then left of 6 right of 6 minus 1 minus 1 right so the goal is given this input i want to create this tree structure in the output from this input i want to create this tree structure right now let us see how we are going to do it so again i am going to read some data so i will read the first number that is 1 i will say fine data is equal to scanner dot next int it's not minus 1 so i create a new node n right so fine let's create a new node n that is having data 1 let me draw the stack as well side by side so n is referring here right now what so if you want to learn ki what is the function that is currently executing so that is at the top of the stack so n is created now you make a call n dot left equal to create tree so you are making a call to create something in the left of one right so one makes a call for the left part so again you go call this function you read data so data is the next number that is 2 fine you again create a new node now this function is paused this function is paused here You said fine. I'm going to create a new node, and that node is two. That node is two. Right node is not connected. It's not connected with one. Right. And again, you say I want to connect something in the left of two. What will be that something? 
again you make a function call to create tree so again this is paused and it is expecting to build its left tree so you again call the function create tree you read the data so now you are going to read 4 so you read 4 you read 4 now 4 says okay i am i am a new node and i will create something in my left a force left makes a call to create tree the force left again makes a call to create tree and in this case you read data the data comes out to be minus 1 and if the data is minus 1 you return null the force left gets to know that my value is null so a null is returned from this function which is attached with left of 4 and then you hit this line for the first time in this function call right and dot write this is equal to create tree now you say okay i will again call create tree i will read this number this number is again minus one it returns a null in the right also force left and right they are null that means the subtree of four has been created this subtree is finished i will return n so this is null and i will return n so n is this now where this return value will go it will go back to the place from where it was called. So who called it? Two's left called it. So two's left is now connected with four, and this function call is over, right? So two's left is connected with four, right? Now this is the point where this connection has been established. Right? So two made a call to four. Four said, "Okay, I will build myself. I will build my left and right, which are null, and now I will return myself." Right? So two's left is over. Now what will happen? 2 will make a call on the right, the right subtree. So 2 makes a call here, n dot right, this is equal to create tree. Now what do I read next? Again it is minus 1. So I return a null. I return a null from here. So 2's right is null. So 2's right is null. It's not referring to anything, right? So this value is null. Now 2's left is done, 2's right is done. I, re I say return n. So return n means what is the function that is at the top? At the top, I have this function. I'm going to return this subtree, this whole subtree back to one. So basically, one will get to know that my left points to this n, and hence the left subtree of one has been built. Now I will build the right subtree, right? Okay. So one will say, okay, fine, my left subtree has been built. This is over from the call stack. So once one is now connected with two and four, right? This tree. A one will say, okay, now it is my turn to call the right. So once left is done, it will execute this line. End dot right, this is equal to create tree. Now you again make a call. Next number you read is three. So you create a new node called n. This is the new node. So three is created. And then you again make a call to the left so you read a number 5 is created this is new node and you again make a call to the left minus 1 so 5's left is null again you make a call on the right so 5's left is null again you read minus 1 so 5's right is also null then you return n so you return 5 so 5 gets attached in the left of 3 so 5 is returned it gets attached in the left of three so five goes here right? then again what's going to happen you'll say okay i want to build something on the right of three so three is left is done three is right's turn so i'll again make a call it will read six a new node will be created six okay and again you say okay i will read the left which is minus one i'll read the right which is also minus one and then i will return n so when you return n this six is returned back to the right of three so this six is being attached here right? and then you say okay i'm going to return n so when you return n you return this three back to one so once once right is going to point to this subtree three five and this subtree is attached with one so finally when you are here this call is over right so you will return n so n will be this node and it is returned back here root equal to create tree this this becomes the root of the tree so root is a data member of the class 
and hence root of the tree gets updated i hope you are now convinced that how this structure can be made so easily with this recursive function okay with this recursive function okay now this way of building the tree it is called as pre order right pre order means first we are building the root node then we are building the left subtree and then we are building the right subtree then we are building the right subtree right so right now we have built the tree using a pre order recursive build tree function right or create tree function right next we will look at how we can print this tree in a similar way now let us talk about tree traversals okay so tree traversal is a way to iterate over all the nodes of the tree right now this traversal can be helpful if you want to perform operations like counting the number of nodes searching for a given node updating a given node right so in order to do all these operations we must know how to traverse a given tree right so a tree has been built a tree has been created we want to, a way to go to each and every node of the tree right so as i discussed if you want to do a tree traversal there are two broad techniques right so tree traversal right? so one is your recursive technique that okay you start with the root node then you iterate recursively on the left tree and the right tree right there is a recursive way of doing it there is a iterative way of doing it right so we will discuss all these ways now right so in recursive way again there are uh, it depends upon the ordering okay the way is same we basically recursively iterate on the left and right subtrees but based upon ordering there are three different ways one is called as pre order reversal one is called as in order reversal and one is called as post order reversal you will be look, looking at all of them in iterative there is only one way that is called as level order reversal right so all of these traversals they are going to travel all the nodes but the order in which you will see the output it will be different so let us start with the pre order traversal given this as the tree right 1 2 3 4 5 6 so i will just redraw this tree 1 2 3 4 5 what is this pre order traversal says that fine what i will do i will travel the root node then i will recursively traverse the left subtree okay this will be a recursive call and i will recursively travel the right subtree again a recursive call okay it is very similar to the build function what we are doing in the build function also if you look carefully we are first building the root node and then we are recursively building the left tree and then we are recursively building the right tree right so if you see in this case the output will be very similar to the order in which you have built the tree so if you start traversing you will say fine i will start with the root node i will print one i will go to the left subtree so this whole is my left subtree so i will print the root node that is 2 and then i will go to the left subtree so left of 2 is 4 so i will print 4 and i will go to the left now left is null so i come back i will go to the right right is null i come back a 4 is done this whole tree has been printed so i come back to 2 so i will go to the right of 2 again it is null i'll come back so this whole tree has been printed i go back now left of 1 has been printed so i go to the right of 1 so i come to 3 so i will print 3 i will go left now i'll print 5 i will go left i'll print right of 5 again null so 5 is done so this whole tree has been printed so i'll go back so at 3 i'll say okay let's go right i'll print 6 i'll go left i'll go right nothing happens this whole tree has been printed i come back now tree has been printed so root has been done left of tree has been done right of tree uh, has been done so i'll return so this whole tree has been printed i come back and at one i see one has been printed already because before printing left and right i print one so this output is called as pre order output in which before printing left and right nodes i print the 
root node right so one two four three five six this will be the pre-order output for this tree right now let us see this thing in in our code as well let's write a pre-order print method let's write a method called uh, void display and this is going to be the method that will display the tree right so inside this logic can be changed i can display a tree in a pre-order way or in a level order way or any other way right so i'll again create one more helper method so i will say void pre-order so void pre-order print now this is a recursive function so i have to tell at what node i am currently at so i will start with the some node that is root node okay so what I will do, I'll say fine. I will have a base case. What will be my base case? What is the smallest tree I can get? That the tree is null. The root is null. In that case, I don't need to print anything. I will simply return. Otherwise, what I will do, I'll print the root data and I will go on the left and the right tree. So I'll say fine. Uh, S out root dot data go and print the left subtree recursively so pre-order print root dot left then pre-order print root dot right that's it and in the display method i can call pre-order print with the root of the now let's do one thing let us test our binary uh, tree because we have the create method we have the print method now i can create a binary tree and try to print it so I can say fine. I want to create a binary tree object. This is equal to new binary tree. I have defined the class. Now, as soon as this constructor is called, your tree will start getting built because we call the create tree method here, right? Now I can call tree dot display. Right? Now think of any tree that you want to make. We will give it as an input here. Sorry, I should run this file. Now this is waiting for the input, right? So let me draw a tree. Let's say tree is one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Now how this in tree will be given as input. So you will input one, then two, then four, then left of four, minus one, right of four, minus one, right of two, minus one, then three, then you will input five, left of five, right of five, right of six right of three that is six left of six and right of six okay the same input that i have shown you in the example also this input is given and now i am saying that let me print this tree what i am getting i am printing one i go here then i go to two fine then i go to four fine then i go to three i come back i come back i go here yes then i go here five then i go here six absolutely correct right so if you look at this was a pre-order build right and this is actually a pre-order print so if you see the output will be exactly same one one two two four four minus one i am not printing skip 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 then three five three five absolutely correct minus one i am not printing six six right that means my both functions are working fine tree is getting built correctly and tree is also getting printed correctly as well right now i will show you two more variations of this print method that is called in order print and post order print so now let us discuss the next type of recursive printing that we call as in order print okay so i hope pre order is clear now we are moving to in order so nothing is going to change the order of printing is going to change okay so earlier it was root left subtree and right subtree now what we are going to do in order means root will be printed in between so before you print the root you will print the left subtree okay and after you print the root you will print the right subtree that is what the in order printing would mean now let us dry run this logic on our uh, code and see what do we get in order so what i want to do so i will start from the root node I want to print this root node, but before that, I will have to print the left subtree, right? Now, at the left subtree, again, if I am at 2, I have to print the left subtree. So that means I will have to print 4. So 4 will be the first output that I will get. 
now i will print the root so what is the root the root is 2 all right then i will print the right subtree so right subtree of 2 is null right then i can go back to 1 so for 1 i have seen the left subtree is already printed then i can print the root so i will print 1 and then i will print the right subtree now i am at 3 right so before i print 3 i will have to print the left subtree so only one node i will print 5 then I can print the root node that is 3. Then I can print the right subtree that is 6, right? The, the, this will be the output we can expect by traversing this uh, tree in a in order fashion. So let us jump into the code and see what we will change, right? So just like the pre order print method, what I will do? I will create one more method called as in order print so in this case the root will be printed in the middle and this call will be now in order print root dot left and this will be now in order print root dot right okay now in the display method instead of calling pre order print maybe let's just call in order print this time i want to display the tree using in order print i will pass the root of the tree as a parameter here right? so let us give the input for this tree and see what output we get so we are getting 4 to 1 5 3 6 is it the expected output 4 to 1 5 3 6 the answer is yes right now you might be interested in doing a call stack analysis of this right so let us see how we can do the call stack analysis as well right so in the beginning what is happening uh let me also copy paste the code this is the code right let us do the call stack analysis this is the method that we are calling right so the call stack is empty so we called in order print where the root node is 1 so i say root is 1 but i am not going to print it so root is not null i will just call on the left so i make a call here right so that means root is now 2 i am at this node but i am not going to print it again i make a call on the left that means root is 4 okay i am not going to print it because root is not null again i make a call on the left when you make a call on the left of 4 you actually come here this is null so if this is null you return okay so you return then you make a call then you print the root data so that means you print 4 this is the top of the stack and this is the root that we are talking about so you will print 4 then what's going to happen you will say okay i'll go right so right is null again you make a call to null and you return so you come back again you are here now for four you have done all the three things left is done root is done right is done so you return so from here you go back and this is gone from the stack right now what is the new top right how do we come back to two this is how we come back to the two so the new top is this now this is the root node that is currently we are talking about so have i printed the left yes have i printed root dot data no i will print it now have i printed the right no so i make a call on the a right of 2 that is null and i again return then this is done so i come back now what is the top node the top node is 1 so have i printed left yes have i printed root dot data no so i will print 1 and i will make a call on the right so i make a call on this tree right so again you do a similar process you come at 3 right so root is 3 then you make a call on the left that is root is 5 so 5 left is null so you print 5 5 right is null you come back so 5 is done then you go back the new top is now 3 right it was 5 now it, it is 3 so 3 says okay my left is done i will print myself and then i will go right so uh, root will be 6 so you come here right so you went here then you came here 6 now root is 6 left and right they are null so 6 will get printed right is null right and then 6 will be popped off right then 
so for three write is also done so this call is over right and you come back at one so for one left is done root is done right is done so this call is also over right finally the call stack will be empty and this is the output that you will get right so i hope you have understood the in order traversal now make a bigger tree and try to uh, generate the output for that particular tree right and next i will discuss post order traversal let us talk about post order print so as the name suggests post means the word after okay so in this case what we do we print root in the last so we first we print the left subtree then we print the right subtree recursively of course and after then we print the root right so if this is the tree once again what i will do i start with one but i have to first go in the left subtree then I have to go in the right subtree and then print one, right? So at two, I again have to print left subtree. That means I will print four. Right? Then I will print the right subtree. So right of true is null. Then I will print two. So I will print two. Right? Then at one, I have to print left, which is done. I have to print right subtree and then I will print two. So at three, I will say, okay, print left subtree, which is five. Then print the right subtree, which is six. Then print the root that is three. Now for one left subtree is done, right subtree is done. Then I can print the root that is one. Right. So this is what the post order output would look like, right? You might be asking, uh, why do we need so many traversals? Okay. For example, what happens in certain problems is, in certain problems you are expecting that uh, you are expecting output from the left and right subtree. For example. Given a tree, I want to calculate the height of the tree, right? For example, I want to calculate what is the height of this tree, right? So in order to calculate height, what you will need? You will need to know that what is the height of the left subtree? Let's say this height is three. What is the height of the right subtree? This height is two. Then can you say recursively at this root node, the height is uh, nothing but it is the maximum of left and right. Okay, maximum of the answer that you're getting from left, comma, right, and one more than that. So can I say the height will be four? Now what is this? This is the answer from the left subtree. What is this? This is the answer from right subtree. So what I'm trying to claim is in order to build the answer at the root node, you need the answers for the left subtree and right subtree. And hence, in problems like these, you would of course need a post order reversal, right? So that is the idea. When you need answer from the uh, child subtrees to calculate the answer at the root node you will definitely need post order reversal there right so now let us write the code and then we will do the dry run of that code right so co writing code is very easy so i am in the in this class so if root is null i will return right then what i will do i'll go on the right a left post order root dot left then I can say post order print root dot right and then I will uh, print the root node. So s out root dot data right. Now let us go and uh, call post order print in our display method. Right? So I can just pass the root here. So t dot display it's calling the post order print method. Now for the same input let's copy this input and we will see what output do we really get now we have given the input i'm getting 425631 is it the same output as we have got 425631 absolutely yes now let us do a quick call stack analysis of this method as well so i'll copy the code i'll put it here and uh, let us do a quick call stack analysis. Let's say this is my call stack. In the beginning, I give one as my root node, so root is one. Then I say, okay, uh, make a call on the left. So my root is two. I make a call here. Now code is paused, right call will happen later. Again, at two, I make a call on the left. I come here, root is four. A four makes a call on the left. So left is null. I return. 
then 4 makes a call on the right, right is null, again I make a call and return, now I can say print root dot data, I will print root dot data, this is the top of my star, I will print 4, right? then uh, if 4 is gone from the stack, what is the new top, the new top is 2, right? that means I am in this function, I am at 2, so I am printed the left, I make a call on the right, so 2 says ok go and print the right, right subtrace null, I return, then what happens, left and right they are done, I will print root dot data, that means I will print 2, right? now 2 is also gone, we are done, so 1 is at the top of the stack, now at 1, I said ok, go left, which is already done, so left is done, go right, I come here, right? so now 1 makes a call to 3, right? now 3 says ok, go left, so 3 makes a call to 5, R5 goes here and R5 says ok go left which is null, go right which is null and hence you print 5, so you will get 5 as the next output, right? now once 5 is gone, you are back again at 3, 3 says ok my left is done, this is done, I will go right, so I go to root node that is 6, right? the root becomes 6 in this call, so this is the top, 6 says go left, null, go right, null and hence you will print 6, Right. and then 6 is also gone from the call stack, then what happens, you are at 3, 3 says ok, my left is done, right is done, I will print root dot data, so I will print 3, I will get print 3, so 3 is also gone from the stack, and now top is at 1, so for 1 left is done, right is done, and hence you will print the root dot data that is 1, right? so this is the output of the post order print, I hope you have understood post order traversal, next we are going to discuss the level order traversal, ok let us jump into the uh, iterative traversal which is also known as level order traversal, ok, so that means we won't be using recursion, we would be using some kind of iteration to iterate on the tree, ok, uh, some kind of loop, right? so let us take this example of tree once again, and idea is instead of uh, going in a depth first manner, ok, so in all the traversals that we have done so far, what is happening, we are starting from the root node, we are going here, then we are going here, so all these traversals, they are depth first traversals, that means you first go deeper into the tree, and then that's how you iterate, okay, so your pre-order, post-order and in order, they are depth first traversal, right, but now the traversal that we are going to do now, it will be a breadth first traversal, that means if I have a tree like this, I will be going across the breadth of each level, this level, this level, this level, right, that means I can expect an output that is 1, 2, 3 and 4, 5, 6, right, so level order traversal, so this is my level 1, then I am printing level 2 and then I am printing level 3, okay, what is a level? all the nodes which are at same distance from root node, so level 1, all the nodes are only one node, it is at distance 0 from the root node, or let's say level 0, level 1, all the nodes are distance 1 from the root node, and this is my level 2, all the nodes are at distance 2 from the root node, okay, so this is also known as breadth first traversal, right, breadth first traversal, right, now let us see how we can achieve this kind of a traversal, uh, right, so let's draw this tree once again, now if you look carefully, if you start uh, doing any traversal, that is a recursive traversal, right, so from 1 you come to 2, right, and at 2 you do not have a direct way of going to 3, right, so that means with recursion it will be very difficult for us from 2 to go directly to 3 right and if we go to 3 we don't know a way to come to 4 right so we cannot go back and forth right so how this is achieved this is achieved by using a concept of a queue data structure okay so what we will do we will create a queue the queue you know it is a p4 data structure first in first out so in the beginning i will push this node in the queue fine right and then i will say okay like q dot push root now i will pop one node from the queue so i will pop this node 
and I will push the children of this node into the queue. So I will print it. So output will be one. This is popped. And what are the children of one? Children of one are two and three, right? Now, how do I know the children? Because I'm not going to store an integer value here. I'm going to store the reference of this node, right? So I'm going to say, okay, this root is the address of this node is stored here. So if you know the address, you also know the uh, child values, right? So you know the children are root dot left, root dot right. So I will push the reference of two and three in the queue, right? Next, I will again pop one node. I'll say, okay, let's remove two. Let us print it and let us push the children of two in the queue. So two has only one child. So four will be pushed into the queue, right? Again, repeat this process pop one node. So now you're going to see that, okay, one is done, two is done. The next node is coming is three, right? So I will pop it. I will print it and I will push the children of this three. Okay. Into the queue. So I will push five, six. So you look carefully when the second level or the first level is popped, the next level is already in the queue, right? The next level is already in the queue. Let's say I have some more nodes. Let's say I have uh, seven, eight and nine, right? So let us just extend this example a little bit. Now I will pop four. I will print four. This will be removed. Four does not have any children. So nothing will be pushed. Next, I will pop five. I will print five and I will push the children of five into the queue. So I will push seven and eight into the queue, right? Next, I will pop six, I will print six and I will push the children of six into the queue. So nine will get into the queue. Next, I will pop seven, I will print seven and uh, no children. So nothing will happen. Next, I will pop eight, print eight, no children, nothing will happen. I will pop nine, print nine and the queue is empty, right? So no children. So queue is now empty. This will be my output of level ordered reversal, right? I hope you are convinced that this is the correct output for this tree, right? Now let us look at this implementation in our code as well. Let us discuss uh, the implementation of level order print. So I'm going to create a method called as void level order print. And first of all, I will, I will need a queue object, right? And I also need to pass the root here. I'll say, okay, fine. I'll need a queue of node called queue. This is equal to new linked list. So in Java, queue is an interface and linked list is a class that implements the methods of the queue. Right? We need to import this from the uh, util package. Okay. So linked list is imported. Queue interface is also imported. So to start with, you can say, okay, queue dot offer that is your add operation right and i can offer root inside the queue that means i can add queue right now i said you will do some work while the queue is not empty so while the queue is not empty what you will do you will pop out something you will say okay give me the node which is at the front of the queue so node f this is equal to q dot Pole, right so this removes the first node like we have seen in the diagram we are always removing the node at the front of the queue right so this is going to remove it and return it right now i can print the data of this node so i can say s out f dot data and now i can check if the left and the right child if they are not null i can push them into the queue so if f dot left is not null i will say q dot push f dot sorry q dot offer f dot left and if the right child is not null or if yeah if the right child is not null i can say q dot offer f dot so in this way q is getting uh filled using these if conditions and it is getting empty from the front using this whole operation right 
that's all that is the code and now i can just run this code so in the display method or here i can say uh, t dot level order print okay root so it's better to call it uh, internally because root i don't want to access it outside so okay i'll just call it from the display method because we are testing the functionality so i can say level order print so here i can just call t dot display so now my tree will be displayed in a level order fashion let's see what output do we get so for the given tree i'm getting 1 2 3 4 5 6 which is correct and uh, if you look carefully here for this tree i'm getting 1 2 3 4 5 6 yeah this is the tree actually so i'm getting the correct output which is this so i hope you understand the level order traversal and how it is achieved using the data structure the code is very simple and uh, you can also do a dry run of this code at your own let us start discussing binary search tree data structure so right now we have learned about binary trees which we said it is a tree in which every node can have at max two children a binary search tree is a special kind of binary tree which is optimized for the search operation okay so that is why the name called binary search tree in short we also call it as bst so bst is a special kind of binary tree with the following properties the first property is the value of all the nodes in the left subtree of a given node should be less than the value of give, given node for example if this is the root node and it has certain value for example this value is 8 then all the nodes which are in the left subtree they must be less than 8 okay and all the nodes which are in the right they must be greater than it so this is the bst property right now how this makes searching easy for example you are searching for five you don't need to have to traverse the entire tree you will have to say okay i will go into the left subtree right now this property that we are talking about that nodes in the left subtree would be smaller nodes in the right subtree would be greater it is not just applicable for the root node but it is applicable for all the nodes of the tree okay so we will see an example how do we construct such a tree where every node follows the BST property? So this this we call as the BST property, right? Or the BST properties. So this is what makes this tree very special and efficient as well, right? Now suppose we are given this data and we want to create a binary search tree from it, right? Now how we will create it? Let us discuss. So first of all, we are getting eight, right? So eight will be the root node because my tree is currently null so 8 becomes the root node right now next element that i'm getting is 3 right? now 3 i know it it is less than 8 so it will go in the left subtree of 8 so 3 will go here next i'm getting 10 so 10 i know it is greater than 8 so it will go into the right of it it will get connected here right now i am i want to insert 1 so again i do not know where it will go so i will start from the root node so one is less than eight i will go left one is less than three so i will again go left so i will insert one here then i get six six is less than eight i go here now six if you compare with respect to three it is greater so it will go here six gets inserted here then we have 14 so 14 is greater than eight i go here it is greater than 10 so i go here the so 14 will get inserted here then i have four 4 is less than 8, I go here. It is greater than 3, I go here. But it is now less than 6. So I have to travel the branches accordingly. So that means 4 will get inserted here. Then I have 13. So 13 is greater than 8, go here. 13 is greater than 10, go here. 13 is less than 14, so you will go here. And finally, I have 7, right? So 7 if I start with respect to root node, less than 8, go here, greater than 3, go here, greater than 6, go here. 7 will get inserted here, right? Now this is how the binary search tree is constructed, okay?
so we have discussed how do we create a binary search tree so we have to insert all the nodes one by one right now how much time it will take to insert one node right so it will depend upon what is the height of the tree now suppose if this tree height is h and i want to insert a node so in the worst case i have to travel one branch for example if i want to insert let's say uh, 20 right or let's say i want to insert 12 right so what i will i have to do i have to start with 8 go here it is greater than 10 i have to go here it is less than 14 i have to go here and it is again less than 13 so i have to go here and insert so this is how 12 will be inserted in the tree right now let us talk about searching okay how do i search for a given node now for example i am i want to search for let's say 7 right where is 7 present or if it is present or not so i just want to output yes or no whether this is present or not so i start with it if 7 is pre present it must be on the left so i go here at 3 if 7 is present it must be on the right so i go here at 6 if 7 is present it must be on the right so i go here now i hit a node which is actually 7 right so that means if i am again uh, performing an operation like search i will do it in order of h time where height in the worst case can be n also for example if you say okay i want to insert these nodes into the binary search tree so it will form a skewed tree like this one two three four right so a height can become n also so that is why i'm not saying order of n or i'm not saying order of login right so the height in the worst case will be uh, can become order of n right and in the best case if your tree is a fully completely balanced tree like this okay in the best case if a tree is like this the minimum height it will have would be log of n right so height will be greater than log n greater than equal to log n and it will be less than equal to n so height lies in this range right so accordingly the creation and the searching time okay not about creation but inserting one node okay so inserting a single node will take order of h time where h is the height of the tree searching for a given node will take order of h time where h is again the height of the tree i hope you understood the fundamental concept behind binary search tree and now let us dive into the implementation of it so let us start by building a binary tree binary search tree class okay so in this class what this class should know that what is the root of this tree so i can say okay private node root so I have a root node which is a private member because I don't want a outside world to access this root directly right now I want to initialize this root node by creating a tree right so I can say okay there is a binary search tree constructor and in this case I can say this dot root this is equal to some build tree method that I am going to create right now let's see what is this build tree method going to be so I can say okay public void or public node build tree so the build tree is going to read data from the user and it's going to insert all the nodes into the tree one by one okay so the in the example that we took we said okay we will take these nodes and we will insert them into the tree one by one so if you take eight you insert it into the tree then you took three you insert it into the tree then you took 10 you insert it into the tree then you took one and so on right so we what we have to do we have to insert nodes into the tree one by one so we will also build a insert method that will do the work for us right now how do i read this data so i will read it till i hit minus one right so this is one way or you can ask how many nodes you want to insert and then you can read n numbers both are fine right so i can do this as well or i can say okay i will read n followed by n integers right so right now i'm doing it this way that okay i will read everything until i hit minus one so i can say okay fine scanner equals new scanner and now i'm going to read data right so i can say int data this is equal to scanner dot next int so while this data is not minus one what i will do i'll insert nodes into the tree so while data is not minus one i can say okay this dot root is given by the insert function and what i need to insert so i will say okay take root 
and take this data insert it into the tree okay so for example if i want to insert six that's okay fine take this root node take this number six and go and insert six into this tree so maybe six will go here right something like this i'm going to do so i will give data as well right and finally i can okay build tree is going to return root right that is fine or you can do it like this as well mm, node root which is initially null you can say say it like this as well so i'm finally returning the root node which will get updated here and this root is the data member root that is here right now let us write the insert method that is going to insert data into this tree so this is just like a wrapper function okay so the actual insertion will be done by the insert method so i want to say okay uh, node insert i'm going to get root node now this root node is uh, in the beginning it is this root node but it's going to be a recursive function so this root node is going to change right and the key that i want to insert right okay so i'm already getting the key now can you think how this insertion will work okay so let us take an example of beginning what is going to happen in the starting so in the starting you are going to insert 8 so root is null so here the root is null and the data that you are getting is 8 so if the root is null can i say inserting 8 is very easy just create a new node and return it so your root will get updated so you can say okay root is equal to insert uh, you give the current root node maybe you can give this root node that is fine and you can give the data right so what is going to happen you are going to say fine i am inserting uh, i am inserting something into a null tree so you can say if root is null that means you can insert it directly you can create that node and you can return it so you can say return new node and the data is equal to key so this this will also act as a base case and it will also help us in the beginning to create the actual root node of the tree right but if this is not true for example i have inserted eight now so root is pointing here right and suppose i want to insert three now this three is given input to this tree right so i will compare is three less than eight so i will compare if root dot data sorry if key is less than root dot data then what should i do i should go and insert in the left subtree right so i can say okay root dot left now this will point this will point to a new subtree in which three has been inserted so root dot left this is equal to insert method again where in the root of left and the key will remain key right now this is a very important step you have to see right so what i'm saying is that go and insert three in the left subtree of eight so so if you hit this what will happen so your root will come here again you will observe that root is null so you will return new node of that key so you will say okay fine i'm going to create a new node three and i'm going to return it so where you're going to return it you're going to return it from here that means it will get updated in the left of it so this is how three will get connected in the left of it okay let me finish the code i will do a complete dry run okay and the complementary case okay we can make it less than equal to so if duplicate elements are present all of them they will go into the left subtree else this is not the case else root dot right this is equal to insert root dot right comma that means if it is greater go and insert that node into the right subtree and update the root dot right okay and once it is done what i have to say i have to say return root right now this is important because every function is expecting that address of a tree or a subtree or a root node will be returned so we are going to return the current root node now let us take an example of let's say 8 3 10 1 6 and let us try to insert some of these numbers into a tree. okay so i'll just take this example and i will dry run this function so what is happening 
oh okay i think i missed out one thing here i will have to read the data again also so i have to say data equal to scanner dot text int so i'm inserting a number okay and then i'm reading the next number right so first of all i will read 8 fine so if for 8 root is null the root will point to 8 so i will say okay return new node of key so insert call is over next time i'm reading this number 3 using this line data is equal to scanner dot next int data is not minus 1 so i say okay root is equal to insert into this tree right so root is now 8 and i'm saying insert 3 so if you want to insert 3 what what will happen the base case is not true you come here if key is less than equal to root data yes root dot left this is equal to insert root dot left comma key right so i will draw this call stack as well so i have 8 so 8 makes a call on the left so left is null so you hit the base case you say return new node of key right so it returns a new node 3 so this function returns a new node 3 now where is this 3 getting updated so 3 is getting updated in the root dot left so it is getting connected in the left of 8 so this is how it is getting connected right so this is over and now from this function call you return root you return root so you basically return the address of 8 back into the uh, build tree function okay now you want to insert 10 okay you got 10 again you compare 10 with respect to 8 right so what happens you call the insert function take this tree insert 8 now root 8 is not null 10 is not less than root so you come into the else block you say root dot write this is equal to insert root dot write comma key now root dot write this is null that means you again hit the base case so this base case returns a new node that is 10 now where is this node returned it is returned to the previous function which is this and where it is getting updated so 10 is getting updated in the right of 8 so you get 10 here and this base case is over so 8 is connected with 10 and you return root so what is the root node this 8 is the root node so you return this address back into the main right now comes the next node you read one and you want to insert one into the this particular tree so now this is the tree 8 3 and 10 right now you want to insert one here so one is less than 8 fine so 8 says go and insert one in my left subtree 8 makes a call here right 8 makes a call here now when you reach 3 so your root is 3 right and you again compare is 3 uh, is 1 less than equal to 3 the answer is yes so you again make a call root dot left this is equal to insert root dot left so you make a call here so you make a call in the left of 3 now this value is null so you return a new node that is 1 so this one is updated in the left of 3 so you return 1 1 gets attached in the left of 3 and then you say return root effectively now you are returning the address of 3 back to 8 now 8's left is again earlier it was referring to 3 now again it is referring to 3 but now with 3 1 is also attached okay so that is what i was saying that 1 gets inserted in the left subtree of 8 right so this is again updated so earlier 8 was storing the address of 3 now again it is storing the address of 3 and again you say okay from this function i am going to return root so you are going to return the address of 8 back into the built tree method okay let us do one more insertion let's say i want to insert 6 so 6 is less than 8 so this is now the tree 8 3 1 and 10 right? now 6 is less than 8 i go here 6 is greater than 3 i go here so again what happens this is null so you return a new node so you create 6 so that address is attached in the right of 3 and from 3 you say return root so 3 gives its address back to 8 and 8 gives its address back to me right so by keep on doing this you will be able to insert all the nodes until you hit minus 1 into this tree right so i hope you have uh, understood the insert method the insert method is going to take order of h time to insert one node into the tree right 
now let us try run this code and see if it works okay i want to execute this code dry run we have already done so i have a binary search tree test class i have created a main method so i have to create a bst object here so i have to say binary search tree bst this is equal to new binary search tree this will automatically trigger the built tree method and it will, it will start reading input from the user okay but if i want to display this tree maybe i have to do some kind of traversal as well so i go into the binary search tree class and here we can write a method for doing the in order print of this tree right so void in order i can say node root and here i can say okay if root is null do nothing otherwise do a in order print on the left subtree print the root data and do a in order print on the root dot right so let's call this as in order print in order print okay let me create a display method from where i will call the in order print method so i can say okay uh, in order print and here i give root or you can say this dot root both are okay this dot root means we are talking about the data member root okay so display method is done so i am going to create the bst and i can say bst dot display let us execute this code the build is complete it is waiting to uh, waiting for us to give input so let us give the input and here we got some output so this is the output of in order traversal of this tree and this output looks sorted so let us see uh, what output we should ideally get so let us quickly create a tree with these numbers so i have uh, 8 i have 3 I have 10, I have 1, I have 6, I have 14, I have 4, so 4 will go here, then I have 13, so 13 will go here, then I have 7, so 7 will go here, that's it, right? Now, in order traversal, that means before printing root node, you will print left and then you will print right. Now we know all the nodes in the left subtree are smaller, all the nodes here are greater, right? And if you do it for every node, you will observe your output will be sorted. So at 3, if I say okay, go left, that means I will print 1. Then you will print root, that is 3. Then you will print the right subtree. So for 6, you will print left, root, right. So you will print 4, 6, 7. And then you go back here. For 8, left subtree has been printed, so you print root and then you print right so you come here at 10 you say okay left which is null then root which is 10 then the right subtree so again here left root right so again you will print 13 and 14 right? so this is the expected output of in order traversal let us verify if it is correct so we are getting 1 3 4 6 7 8 10 13 14 which is absolutely correct so that means our build tree and the insert methods they are working perfectly fine right so i hope you have understood the insertion in a binary search tree so now let us talk about the search operation in a binary search tree so given this bst i want to search for a particular node for example let's say i'm given that i am searching for a key that is 2 how do i search for 2 right so i will start from the root node i will compare 8 with 2 so i will say okay 2 is less than 8 so i will go here i will go left 2 is also less than 3 so I will go here and here I compare if 2 with 1 so what happens if 2 is present it must be on the right of 1 so I go here so I go in the right of 1 but as I reach here I see that I am hitting a null value that means 2 is not present right so one of our case would be that if I hit a node that is null right that means the given key is not present so I can simply return false that will be one kind of a base case right now suppose i am not searching for two but i am searching for let's say uh, seven right 
so seven is present here so let's see how we can do it now if i compare seven with eight i know it is less than eight so i will go left if i come to three seven is greater than three so i will come towards right and at six seven is greater than six so i will again come towards right so now i am hitting a node where my root data matches with key so what should i return of course i should return true so if root data matches with my key i would be returning true from the method right now let us talk about a recursive case if we are searching recursively so what exactly we are doing right so we are saying that fine i am going to compare root node with uh, the given key let's say the, the key is 7 so i am comparing 8 with 7 right now if the key is not matching so what i am saying that okay if the key is lesser i will search in the left subtree whatever is the answer of left subtree i will return that answer now suppose the left subtree says true that key is found i will return true but if the left subtree says false i will go and search i will not go and search in the right subtree why because I am already checking whether I should go left or I should go right, right? Because if the key is less than or equal to, it will be present in the left subtree. If the key is greater than or equal to root node, it will be present in the right subtree. Let us take an example of 13, right? So now 13 is greater. So I will not make a call in the left subtree. I will make a call in the right subtree. Right? So okay, go and search in this tree. Now at 10, 13 is greater. What I do? I say, okay, go and search in the right subtree. At 14, 13 is less than 14. So what do I do? I say go and search in the left subtree. Now at a, as I reach this node, I say okay, this matches my key. So what I will do? I will return true. This 14 will also return true. This 10 will also return true. And this 8 will also return true. So this is how true will be propagated back, right? So what I have to do? If root data is... Uh, let's say root data is greater than equal to key right so that means key is less than equal to root data that means i will return the answer of the search method by calling the left subtree so i will say okay return whatever has been returned by the left subtree for that key so root dot left comma key right otherwise i will say return whatever has been returned by the search method by calling it on the right tree so root dot right comma key. so this will be my search method now let us quickly write this method in our code as well and then we will see whether this works correctly or not it should it should work right so this i'm writing it recursively you can also write it iteratively right so the only thing that you need to do is you need to travel at max from the root node to one of the leaf nodes in the worst case that means the complexity of this method will be order of h where h can lie between n and log n right so in the best case scenario when the tree is perfectly balanced your height will be log n in the worst case if all the nodes are on one side that is called as a skewed tree your complexity for search operation will be order of n now it is much better than um, binary tree because in binary tree you have to search for across all the nodes but here we know that we have to move in one direction either left or right but not both okay so let us quickly code it up and see so let us write uh, a method called search so it will have a boolean return type so i can say boolean search i'm going to get the root node and i'm also going to get uh, the key that i'm searching for okay let's say this is some search uh, function right so it's a recursive function so i have to write a wrapper function as well so i can say boolean search uh, where i'm just getting the key so it will return whatever has been returned by the search function and here i will pass the root node and the key now let us see how this can be done so i discussed there will be two base case so you can stop if your root is null that means the key is not present so i can say return false in that case but if your root matches with the key you can return true in that case okay otherwise i have to compare okay so i have to say if root dot data is greater than 
equal to key or you can say key is less than equal to root data then you have to call the search function on the left and you have to return whatever that function is returning so you return the output of the left subtree so search in the left subtree that is root dot left comma key else you can return the output of the right subtree so root dot right comma right so, so this will be your search function recursive function is the search function so this looks good now let us test our method so here i can say okay uh, s out t dot search let's say i'm going to search for four sorry this is not uh, the correct file i have to do it in binary search tree so bst dot search i can say let's say search for four and bst dot search for let's say 41 right so i will s out the output and same here so this looks good to go and let us run our code Now let us give some elements let's say 10 20 30 41 3 5 6 8 9 minus 1 right so this creates a tree and for the value 4 i'm getting an answer false that 4 is not present and uh, for other values i'm getting the tree is uh, the 41 is present the 41 is present here right and you can see in order display is looking sorted and 4 is not present in this and 41 is present okay so this is how the search method is working i hope you understood the search method really well next we will move on to deletion let us discuss deletion in a case of a binary search tree so deletion means that okay i have given a particular node and i want to remove that node okay for example someone might say that okay let us delete 13 or let us you know, delete 3 or let us delete 8 right so if you observe closely there are three kinds of nodes okay so there are nodes which have no children also called as leaf nodes so there are nodes with zero children deleting them is very easy there are also nodes which have one child deleting them is uh, slightly more difficult and there are nodes which have two children they are even more tricky to delete okay for example node like 8 if i want to delete this node then how would my tree structure would look like so we have to discuss all these scenarios now right so let us start with scenario 1 and let me create a copy of this tree as well so that i can use it right now suppose i want to delete a node like 4 or i want to delete 7 or i want to delete 13 so deleting it is very easy so suppose let's say i want to delete 7 right so that is my case one case number one so in that case what i need to do first i need to search for seven where is this seven located right so i need to reach that node so i start from eight i say okay seven must be on the left so i go to three so three says seven must be on the right so i go here now six says seven must be on uh right so i go here right now if i reach this node what should i do i would say okay fine this is the node that I want to delete. So I will somehow delete this node and I will return a value null to the parent. So basically what I will do in every call, I will try to change the tree. I will say, okay, in the right of six, I will attach a null value. And this node is now referenced by no one. So that means this will be automatically garbage collected. Okay. So garbage collector will come and it will get garbage collected because no one is referring to this node okay so garbage collection mechanism will clear out the memory occupied with by this node okay, so what what i need to do is i need to reach this node and if this matches with the data that i am uh, finding out i have to uh, return delete null okay so when i return null value that will get updated in the 
write of six. Okay, so I will also update. So that means uh, the return type of the function will be of the type node. It will not be a void function. So there will be a function, and I say okay, fine. Root dot write. This is equal to some delete node, and uh, delete node returns a null value which gets attached in the write of six. Okay, so this function is delete node. Something like this I will be doing. So just to give you an idea how it's going to work. So basically we are going to update the write reference in the parent. That is case number one. This is how it will be deleted. Now let us write the code and see case number one, and then we will discuss case number two and case number three. So I am in the uh, file called binary search tree dot Java, which we have written. Now we are going to define a method called as node remove, and here we are going to accept the current root node and the key that we want to delete. Right. Of course, there will be some base cases which we will see, okay, and there will be some recursive cases as well, right? So one thing that I told you that first we have to search for the node, okay? Now uh, three possibilities can happen. So if you are at eight and that the node that you are deleting is also eight, then you can do work there. But if the data is lesser than eight, you have to go left. If the data is greater than eight, then you have to go right. So first, let us do the searching part. So if the key that you are that you want to remove is less than root dot data, so in that case you do not need to do anything at the current root node. What you need to do is make a recursive call in the left subtree. For example, this is eight, and I want to delete something which is five. A five is not present here. So what I will say, okay, I'll say okay, go and remove five from the left subtree. So remove function will go and remove five. From the left subtree, so you say root dot left and key go and go into this tree and remove it. Now it is possible five might be present here, or five might be present here, or five might be present here. We do not know, right? So whatever it is, uh, after removing five, whatever is the new root of the tree that will be given back to me. So I will say okay, eight dot left. This is equal to remove. So I can say root dot left should be updated by the reference of the new left subtree that I, I am going to get. Now it is possible that here the node was six and nothing changed. Still I will get the address of six back here, right? So that is something we have to do. So root dot left, this is equal to remove. So I make a call in the left subtree to remove it. So this is a recursive case, right? Else it is also possible that key is greater than root data. That means I have to do the same thing, but in the right subtree. For example, I want to remove 10. I can say, okay, go and remove 10 from the right subtree and whatever is the new tree, give the reference back to me. I can say root dot right. This is equal to remove root dot right comma key. Right? Else that means this is the node where I have to do the actual deletion. That means it is the case of equality, right? So this is the node to be deleted. Now I, I said there can be three cases. Case number one that I have a node with no children. In that case, it is pretty easy. That for example, if you are talking about a node like this, uh, a node like seven, right? So if you have already traversed till this node and you want to delete this node, it matches seven. So what I can say, I can simply say return null, right? I can simply say return null. So I can say if root dot data matches key. I can say return null. Now this null will be attached in the uh, back in the parent, right? So if it was present in the left, so left value of the parent will become null. For example, six and seven, right? So six made a call on the right that okay, delete uh, the seven node from this subtree. Now seven is equal to seven, so I'm saying return null. Right? This null is returned, and root dot right called the remove function which returned null. So this remove function returned null. So eventually what will happen? The right of six will start referring to null and from six we will return the address of this subtree which is nothing but this node itself, right? So finally what, what we have to return? We have to return root also, right? Like if we are not returning null, that means if we are returning from some other node, we have to return the same root that we were getting as input. So six will return its address. So seven returns a null. Okay. 
which gets attached here six returns six three returns three eight returns eight okay this is how it's going to happen so we have discussed the case with zero children now let us discuss the case when we have one child right now suppose i want to remove 10 right now look at look at this i want to remove 10 so let me draw this diagram again right i want to remove 10 right now this is case number two where i have one child right now if you look carefully if i want to remove 10 what should i do right so that simply means that it is a node which has either a left child or it has a right child right if i want to remove 10 can i simply say that whatever is the left subtree or the right subtree of 10 this will get connected directly here and 10 will be removed so if i simply say remove 10 and this child will be connected here is it correct is it a bst the answer is yes for 8 14 is greater and for 13 is less than 14 so it is correctly placed okay so what i'm trying to say is if you have 10 and if you want to remove 10 right what so you have to actually return the non null child of 10 back to 8 what is the null null child so this is the right subtree right so if you want to remove this node you have to return the reference of this right subtree back to 8 so 8 will point to 14 and the remaining subtree will get attached as it is so nothing changes in the subtree so nothing changes in the subtree right okay this is the point that I'm trying to make, right? So how do you reach 10 by the search mechanism that we have already written, right? I want to delete 10. So 10 is greater. So I will come here now at this node, 10 is equal to 10. What should I do? I will return the non null child of 10 back to the parent. So this is what I have to do. Now let us see how we can write it in the form of code. All right. Okay. So I think uh, I have made a small mistake. This is a node to delete. So of course the data will be equal because we are in the else case, but case one was no children. Okay. So I need to fix this case. So the condition would be both left and right of that node are null. Okay. So I'm fixing a small mistake here. Root dot left is null. And root dot right is also null. Null would be capital small small so i can return null right so root dot left is null and root dot right is also null that means if it is a leaf node okay now let's talk about case two that means exactly one of the child is not null so else if root dot left is null that means the left child is null and the right child is not null in that case can i say i will return root dot right back to the parent Else if it is the other way around, if root dot right is null, that means the right subtree does not exist. So we are at a node where the right subtree is null, but the left subtree is existing and I want to delete this node. So what I need to do, I need to return the address of the left subtree back to the parent. So I can say return root dot left. Now what's going to happen? This will get attached here, but do you really think that this node will be deleted? Do you think this node will be deleted? The answer is yes. Why? Because who was storing the address of this node? The address was being stored here. If this is updated, if this is updated, if the right of this root node is updated, then no one is referring to this node. That means in a way, this object becomes eligible for garbage collection. So this will get deleted right so this is what we need to do now we have a third case which is case three that means a node has two children we need to delete a node with two children so let us discuss how this case three will work so let us discuss case number three this is the tree and suppose i want to delete a node which has two children so it can be any node which has two children. So let's say I want to delete eight, right? Now if I directly delete eight, this tree will be split into two parts, which I don't want. This tree should remain same, right? 
this tree should remain same so what i can do is i need a way so that uh, i do not disturb the tree structure a lot right so if i talk about in order traversal of this tree i get 1 3 4 6 7 8 10 uh, 13 and 14 right so this is what i get right if i want to delete 8 the new root node should be either 7 okay or it should be either 10 so one of them should become the replacement of this node right now how i am going to do it so it can be the largest node in the left subtree that is option number one right option one is make the largest in the left subtree as the root node right option number two is make the smallest in the right subtree as the root node in the right subtree as the root node so you can use any of these options okay so if i show you if i make smallest in the uh, largest in the left subtree as the root node in that case seven will become the root node okay now how it is done let us see now suppose you have reached the node which you want to delete and it has two children right so you will say okay I'm going to find out the largest node in the left subtree. So how do you find the largest node in the left subtree? You start from this node and you try to keep on going right. You always go right. And eventually when you stop here, because the right of this node is null. So you, st you have to stop at this node and you will have to say, okay, this is the largest node. And I will put this node here, right? A putting means I will copy the data. So you will copy the data seven here. So this data is copied. Right? I'm not changing the node structure. I'm just copying the data. So seven is copied here. Right? Now, if you copy seven here, what you will observe? You will observe this seven is duplicate. Right? This is present two times. This is duplicate. Right? Now what I can do is, can I make a recursive call to remove seven? from this subtree from this particular subtree can can it be done the answer is yes if i remove seven from this tree then my work will be done right now if you look carefully now seven will be a node which has either okay it will have either no children for example in this case or if it is the largest node it will not have any right child right so seven can have a left child can have a left subtree right so seven can have a left subtree right so that means if i'm recursively removing seven from this tree two two things can happen seven does not have any child so it will fall back to case number one that a node with no children so it can be easily removed i can return a null here right or seven has a left subtree in that case that subtree can be returned here and it will be correct to attach it why because all these nodes they are greater than six but they are less than seven so they can be attached directly in the right of six right so seven still can be removed so, so this if this is the case it will handled by case number one if this is the case it will be handled by case number two that a node has one left child or right child but it, it cannot have both okay so you can see largest node can never have a right child okay similarly the smallest node can never have a left child because it is a bst right if it is a, has a left child then it is not the smallest right so we are going right until we don't find anything on the right so seven can be replaced okay so that means in this case seven is not having any left child i want to remove this node i will make a recursive call on this left subtree to remove seven so seven will be removed and this is how the tree structure would look like right so i hope you are able to understand new tree would look like this it will be 7 3 1 6 4 and here i have 10 14 and 13 right? this is how the new tree would look like if you talk about the in order traversal it will be 1 3 4 6 7 10 13 14 is it correct of course it is correct is eight removed yes eight is removed from this reversal right now let us look at in into the code how this can be actually done right so i have case three where the node has two children so this can be handled by the else block
so what we need to do so we need to uh, so first we need to do is we need to find the max node in the left subtree okay so i can say okay i will take a temp variable node temp this is equal to root dot left so i can say while temp dot right is not equal to null so i will move this temp towards right so temp equal to temp dot right so if you are confused what we are doing now suppose this is the tree 8 let's say i have uh, 5 6 7 and i have some nodes here as well right i'm saying okay i want to find the largest in the left subtree so i start a temp here so temp dot right is not null so temp goes here again temp dot right is not null temp goes here now temp dot right is null so what do, what do i do i stop so even if it has a left subtree temp will stop at 7 right okay so we found out the node now what i need to do i need to replace the data here so i can say okay fine root dot data will be replaced by temp dot data the data of the temp so i copy this 7 here right now what i need to do i need to recursively delete the node 7 from the left subtree so can i call the remove function yes because it will either lead to case 2 or case 1 which i have handled right so i can say okay fine now my function is to remove the node with temp dot data from the left subtree so i can say remove root dot left the node is called temp dot data i'm not i don't want to remove 8 now i want to remove 7 now so that is why the value is not key but it is temp dot data but after removing this something will be updated right so i am standing here i am making a function call on this left subtree so this left subtree will tell me the updated uh, address of the left subtree or the updated reference so i have to say at root dot left this is equal to remove right so whatever uh, is the tree after removing please tell me right? So root dot left this is equal to remove right so once it is done what should i do i will simply return the address of the root so this is something we will do right so i'll tell you quickly what what is happening here right okay return root we have already done at the end so no no need to do it here so we have three guesses right? when we are at the node uh, which is matching the given key that we need to delete okay we have two recursive cases which are uh, basically helping us to reach a node okay so there will be a base case also right the base case would be that if node is not present so if node is not present we might end up at a value that is null right so i will show you what will be the base case now suppose i want to delete uh let's say i want to delete uh 41 right now i start with let's say 7 i say okay 41 is greater i go to 10 it is greater i go to 14 now it says it must be on the right so i go here so basically the right of 14 is null so if i reach a value that is null that means the node is not present so it is just like the search method where we were returning false here we will not do anything so if root becomes null at a certain point right so i can say okay i am also going to return null right so this i think makes the code complete now let us test our functionality by going to binary search tree test file okay so okay i was all uh, doing searching earlier now i can say okay uh, i will remove something and then i will display the tree Okay, one more thing we have to do is we cannot uh, call the remove function directly because we have to supply the value of root. So we'll uh, create a wrapper function. Let's say node uh, remove key. Let's say or let's say void remove key. This is the method, and here we will only accept the key, right? And from here we'll say okay, let us call the remove function where we will give the actual root and the key here. Yeah. So now from binary search tree test we can say okay bst dot remove key and here i can give some key let's say 41 now if this is present it will get removed so i will uh, give this value and let's say i want to display this tree so 
so i have given uh, this particular input so this is the tree before printing uh, before removing then i removed 41 and this is the tree right so we can experiment with uh, this tree as well that we had so for this tree uh, the input was 8 3 10 1 6 14 4 13 and 7 let us try to play with this tree as well so i will quickly type the input so this is the tree from the diagram and uh, now from this tree let's say i want to go with case 1 where i want to remove let's say 7 so i will give input as let's say 7 or i can ask the user for the node to delete okay that that is also doable i will just rerun this code and i want to delete 7 from this tree Let's rerun it. Uh, okay, so let's say, sorry, this is the wrong input we have given. All right, so this is the input we have given. And now from this input, I have uh, removed seven. So you can see the seven has been removed from this tree, right? So that means case one is working fine. Now let us rerun this once again. And let us discuss case two, where I want to remove, let's say 10. So the same input goes, but I have to remove 10. So I have to rerun this code once again. I will stop it and I will rerun it. Let's say I'm removing 10. Now from this code, you can see 10 has been removed. That means it is working fine for case two as well. Case three, let's say I want to remove eight. So I want to remove eight. I will rerun this code. And uh, let's see. Now after removing it, you can see this is the in order traversal of the tree, which looks correct. Okay. So in this code, I have two fours, which is okay. But uh, you can see eight is removed and eight was the root node of the tree, right? That means it is working fine for all the three cases. That's about how you remove a node from a binary search tree. Okay. If you want a small dry run, we can do it once again. Uh, let's say now you're removing it. So as I discussed, so what are you doing? Uh, you had seven here, right? So you say, okay, I want to remove eight. So I will, I will go in my right subtree in the left subtree and I will try to iteratively find the largest node. So it says, okay, three says, okay, temp is here. Temp goes here. Right is not null. Temp goes here. Right. Then I say root dot data. This is the current root where I want to delete. So I say root dot data. This is equal to temp dot data. So seven is copied here. Then I make a recursive call on this. I say, okay, root dot left. This is equal to remove. Okay. Uh, if I talk about in the code, I'm making this uh, change here. Uh, I show you okay, this is the remove function. So I'm saying root dot left. This is equal to remove root dot left and temp dot data. So I'm not saying remove it. I'm saying remove seven from this tree right? because seven is now duplicate. So I guess I can say root dot left should point to a new tree in which seven is removed. So now I say seven, I want to remove seven from here. So seven is greater than three. I go here. Seven is greater than six. I go here. So I reach finally seven. If I reach seven, I say return null. Now six right is pointing to null and I say return root. So six is being returned. So three refers to six. This node is gone. And from three, I say return root. So seven now refers to this three. So this is what is happening when I'm doing a recursive call for deleting seven from this tree. I hope all those who had a doubt now it is clear and this is how removal in BST works. Let us try to understand what is a hash table and how it works. Okay. So you might be already using hash table a lot of times and it is known by uh, different names in different languages. For example, in Java, it is called as hash map. In Python, it is called as dictionary in C++. It is called as unordered map, right? So 
there are different names but the internals of the data structure they are same in different languages okay so hash map in java dictionary in python and unordered map in c plus plus and in of course in other languages as well you have this data structure that is available right so the reason why we are going to study this data structure is it is very very powerful right and it is used a lot right it is used a lot right so when i'm saying it is used a lot so not just business logic so when you are uh, dealing with your problem solving when you're building real software you would often require a hash map to store data in the form of key value pairs okay so it stores information in the form of key and the value pairs but not just that we can also store key value pairs in the form of a list right why it is powerful because it allows us to do operations like insertion i want to insert a key value pair i want to look up for a particular key right and maybe i want to delete a particular key right a key value pair so i can just give okay this is the key delete the corresponding value and the key so delete the key value pair given the key so look up means the search right i want to search for a particular key if it is present or not and if it is present what is the associated value with that particular key right so these are the three important operations associated with the hash table right and the good thing about these operations is why uh, this is so popular or why this is so powerful because these operations are performed on an average in order one time so order one on average that means most of the times these operations will be performed in constant time okay so we will discuss the scenario when they are not performed in constant time but you can say okay most of the practical scenarios these operations would be performed in order one time by the hash table right so now let us discuss where this can be used okay so i discussed that it stores information in the form of key value pairs okay suppose you are building a uh, application for a restaurant and user item a user of wants to order particular item right so user says okay i want to uh, check if dosa is available and what is the price of the dosa so the restaurant owner might instantly reply that okay the cost of the dosa is 100 right so given this key you are telling the value in order one time okay maybe i want to order some uh, coke maybe this is priced at 50 maybe i want to order some noodles right this is cost costing maybe 70 right so what can happen with this menu what are the operations we might be doing on a restaurant menu right so if we are building an online menu we might be adding a key value pair okay a new item has been added maybe a pizza has been added so you will supply okay pizza has been added and it is associated with some object or in this case the, that object is nothing but an integer object only right so the cost of pizza is is 250 right so i can say i want to insert a new key value pair that is doable second is i can look up now i can ask what is the price of the coke so the hash map will tell me in order one time yes the price of the coke is 50 rupees then i can delete i can say okay coke is not in the stock delete coke so it will be deleted from the table so these are the three operations that our hash table is going to support right now of course we saw that this can be used in business logic when you are building an application a hash map can be a useful data structure to use right because it provides fast lookups fast inserts and fast delete operations as well right but one major application is also in the uh, language runtime right so whenever you are working with a language like java or c++ you know uh, you create certain variables you say create certain classes so you say okay i am going to create a variable uh, int x and i'm going to say this is 10 right then you say okay int y this is 20 right so what happens is how these uh, variables are stored so these variables are actually stored in the memory right so x is a bucket that is storing 10 y is a bucket that is storing 20 right but when you want to make a change you want to say okay x is equal to x plus 2 right so your compiler needs to know where is this x located so that I, it can go to that location and change that bucket now suppose this bucket is at some address abc right let's say abc20 right this is some address written in a hexadecimal format right so the compiler maintains a symbol table 
for all the variables and the classes that you are going to of all the objects that you are going to create so there is a symbol table right maintained by the compiler right so this symbol table will tell that okay x is a bucket which is present at this location abc20 right now when you do this operation x is equal to x plus 2 so i'll just scroll up a little bit when you're doing this operation x is equal to x plus 2 so the compiler will look at the symbol table where is x located it will go to that location and it will make the change right similarly y is located at some location maybe 11462 right and maybe right so 11462 this is some other location for y so y will it will again look up at the symbol table where is y located it will go to this location and it will make the change in the y right similarly if you create some objects let's say dog d this is equal to new dog so this dog object is created at some location in the heap right so similarly your d will be mapped with some address right now what is your symbol table a symbol table is also of a form of a hash table right it is also a form of a hash table right that your compiler is maintaining and it is called as symbol table right similarly when you have classes and objects right so you say okay i want to create a new class called dog the dog has certain properties right let's say it has a certain name it has a certain breed it has a certain method right so what is happening so you are also you are able to map dog with various uh, attributes and various methods right so all these features right they they are powered by the language runtime and language runtime might be is actually using hash table internally so that you can uh, do lookups very very fast okay if this functionality is slow your language will become slow so that is another application of hash table it is used in the internals of the language so i hope you got a good introduction about hash table now we will jump into the internals of the hash table so let us talk about hash table internals right so what is exactly a hash table from inside basically it is nothing but it's a container okay it's it's like in the simple form it can be an array as well okay of some size right so basically whatever data we are given we have to map this data with a certain index in this array right so suppose i'm getting dosa right so the first step of a hash table is that we have to hash the key value right we have to produce an integer location for a given key now given key in this case i am taking it of the string type but it can be any object right it can be student it can be book so for that particular type of object you need to tell the hash function how the that integer value will be computed right so right now i am assuming that there is a hash function which is going to accept some key let's say dosa and it is going to produce an integer location right so maybe that integer location is 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 and so on right maybe dosa will get stored here and the value will also get stored here right i got noodles so noodles will go also go into this and maybe i get a location 6 so maybe noodles get stored here and 150 gets stored here right in the same location right so what is this hash function doing hash function is taking input a key and it is pr producing a integer location in the array right now you might have some questions right how big this array should be right now if i have six keys and if if i have six uh let's say six size of the array right and i have 12 keys then of course i cannot store 12 keys in this array right so it's going to cause problems so we will look at how to handle this very soon right this is not the completely correct implementation we are going to discuss it step by step right so the idea of hash function is that it is going to produce a inti unique integer location for every key but it is also possible that for two different keys they get mapped with the same location for example if i get something like coke and uh, this since this is a mathematical function it might compute a similar location as well right so it might say okay coke should also go here right so this is called as a collision we will discuss how do we handle collision right so maybe 200 something but the idea is how big this array should be right so one thing we need to notice that this in if it is producing an integer then integer can take any value right so integer can be in the range maybe 0 to 10 it could be in the range 0 to 100 right it could be even in the range of 0 to int max right so that means like if i talk about every possible integer that can be generated this range can be int max as well right 
बट डू आई रियली नीड टू क्रिएट दिस बिग एरे ओके इंट मैक्स इज अप्रॉक्सीमेटली टेन पावर नाइन एलिमेंट्स राइट इफ आई टॉक अबाउट हाउ मच स्पेस दिस एरे विल टेक इन द फिजिकल मेमरी दिस विल कम आउट अराउंड सिक्सटीन जी बी राइट सो विल यू नीड सिक्सटीन जी बी ऑफ एन एरे राइट और कैन यू क्रिएट दिस बिग एरे द आंसर इज डेफिनेटली नॉट वी कैन नॉट क्रिएट दिस बिग एरे बिकॉज दिस अमाउंट ऑफ कंटिन्यूस मेमरी माइट नॉट बी अवेलेबल एंड सेकेंडली सपोज यू हैव क्रिएटेड दिस बिग एरे एंड यू हैव ओनली वन थाउजेंड कीज इन योर की वैल्यू पेयर्स इन योर डेटा सेट राइट देन यू आर एलोकेटिंग स्पेस फॉर टेन पावर नाइन एलिमेंट्स एंड यू जस्ट नीड स्पेस फॉर टेन पावर थ्री एलिमेंट्स दैट मीन्स यू आर डूइंग लॉट ऑफ स्पेस वेस्टेज विच इज नॉट अ गुड ऑप्शन राइट देन हाउ बिग दिस एरे शुड बी इट शुड बी रफली ऑफ द ऑर्डर ऑफ नंबर ऑफ कीज दैट यू आर यू वॉन्ट टू इंसर्ट राइट सो यू इफ यू हैव एन आइडिया ओके आई वॉन्ट टू इंसर्ट समवेयर अराउंड वन थाउजेंड कीज दैन इट इज गुड एनअ दिस एरे शुड हैव अराउंड वन थाउजेंड बकेट्स इन साइड इट राइट और इफ यू वॉन्ट टू इंसर्ट मे बी अराउंड फाइव हंड्रेड कीज इट शुड बी ऑफ द ऑर्डर दिस मच राइट सो वॉट आई एम गोइंग टू से दैट टेबल साइज शुड बी ऑफ द ऑर्डर नंबर ऑफ की वैल्यू पेयर्स दैट यू आर गोइंग टू एक्सपेक्ट राइट इट माइट हैपन दैट यू एक्सपेक्टेड फाइव हंड्रेड कीज बट इन प्रैक्टिस सिंस द डेटा वॉज डायनमिक सेवन हंड्रेड कीज केम राइट सो वी विल ऑल्सो लुक एट टेक्निक्स टू ग्रो दिस टेबल डायनमिकली ड्यूरिंग द इंसर्शन प्रोसेस राइट सो दैट इज समथिंग वी आर गोइंग टू स्टडी राइट वॉट हैपन इफ देर इज अ कोल्यूशन हाउ डू वी ग्रो द टेबल हाउ डू वी इनिशलाइज द टेबल सो ऑल दीज कॉन्सेप्ट वी आर गोइंग टू सी नेक्स्ट सो लेट्स बिगिन स्टार्टिंग विद द हाश फंक्शन वी विल टॉक अबाउट इंसर्शन सर्चिंग एंड डिलीशन इन द हैश टेबल सो वी आर डिस्कसिंग हाश फंक्शन राइट सो एज आई डिस्कस्ड हाश फंक्शन कैन एक्सेप्ट की ओके इनपुट इज अ की इट कैन बी ऑफ एनी एनी इट कैन बी एनी टाइप ऑफ ऑब्जेक्ट फॉर अवर केस आई एम जस्ट एज्यूमिंग इट टू बी अ स्ट्रिंग एंड आई वॉन्ट अ इंटीजर वैल्यू इन सम रेंज ओके इन सम रेंज दैट इज फ्रॉम जीरो टू एन माइनस वन वेयर एन इज द साइज ऑफ द टेबल राइट सो एन इज द साइज ऑफ द टेबल दैट आई एम इम्प्लीमेंटिंग राइट सो फॉर एग्जाम्पल जस्ट टू कीप थिंग सिंपल आई एम गोइंग टू एज्यूम दैट आई हैव अ स्मॉल टेबल वेयर the size of the table is just 7 so 0 1 2 3 4 5 and 6 so indexing is from 0 to n minus 1 so i have this array right or i call it as table as well so this is having a table size of 7 right now i have a hash function which knows how do i convert a given string into a numeric value So suppose I'm getting a key like dosa comma hundred, right? The goal is to generate a integer, map it with a integer, right? And that value should not be random. It should be same always. So whenever you ask dosa, you have to tell me at what location this dosa is present, right? So goal is to convert this dosa into a, a number in the range zero to six, right? How do I do it? So one simple way could be that I iterate over the ask i values of dosa. add them and since this addition will produce a number much larger than 7 okay for example uh, your capital a right it i think it has a ask a value of 65 b is 66 c is 67 so d will be 68 right so similarly here you will have certain values 68 plus something plus something plus 65 so this is going to produce a large integer right maybe of the order 200 to 300 right but i want to map it in the range 0 to 6 right so what i will do how do i reduce a bigger range which is some larger range into a smaller range right so i can say okay fine this can be easily achieved by using a mod operator right so i can say mod with n so i can take a mod with n so let us assume that this mod gives us an answer that is 4 so that will be called as a hash index okay so basically the index on the table produced by hashing the hash index is let's say 4 so that means dosa will go at this particular index and this value will be stored at this place right now the question is what should i do maybe i am getting another key right in which the result is also 4 right the result is also 4 
so can this happen the answer is yes so i can say okay i have maybe coke and maybe 150 right i do not know i add the letters of coke right and i take a mod with n right now mod with n can produce the same result for many numbers right so maybe this also leads to four what what happened here right what happened here so coke is also fighting for the same position that means i also want to store coke here right now this thing is called as a collision right we have space for only one key value pair but we want to store maybe two or more key value pairs at that particular location right so this is something called as a collision right so what happens right so what is a collision a collision is a scenario in which basically two key value pairs two or more key value pairs they get mapped with the same bucket mapped with the same bucket so this what does this mean right can we avoid collisions the answer is no can we reduce collisions the answer is yes right so we will talk uh, talk about both the things right so in order to reduce collisions right what we need is we need a good hash function so we will work on both the fronts right so collisions should be it they cannot be avoided right so how irrespective of how good a hash function is collisions cannot be avoided but they need to be handled right so cannot avoid collisions right okay but i can reduce the chances of collisions but chances of collisions can be reduced by using a good hash function right but chances of collisions can be reduced using a good hash function right using a good hash function right? now how do we design a good hash function we will discuss by taking an example of string right and secondly since you cannot avoid collisions so even if the collision is happening you need a way to handle that collision right so they still need to be handled so we need something called as a collision handling scheme right collision handling scheme this is we, something we will discuss very shortly right now there are two important things here one is what is a good hash function second is a good second is we need a good collision handling scheme so first good hash function will reduce the chances of collisions but they still can happen so if the collision is still happening we need to handle it using collision handling scheme so let us discuss what is a how do we design a good hash function and how do we design a collision handling scheme next so let us discuss the properties of a good hash function right so i am going to discuss the properties of a good hash function right so basically a good hash function should have two properties first it should ensure a more of a uniform distribution okay it should ensure more uniform distribution right and secondly it should be fast to compute right so that means we do not spend a lot of time in computing the hash index itself right for example in our case what we were taking i will take examples of two hash functions okay so let's say example number one in which i am simply adding the ask values and taking a mod with the table size so i'm saying fine uh, i will add dosa d plus o plus s plus a and i will take a mod with the table size right now is is this function fast to compute yes because i just need to iterate on the uh, letters of the key right so when when i'm talking about i'm going to insert many key value pairs so what is n n is the number of key value pairs okay so key 1 value 1 key 2 value 2 right key 3 value 3 so i want to insert many key value pairs so my hash index does not depend upon the value n but it depends upon how big my key is so in general the key would be small length so we can assume that okay if it is a name of a person and the phone number is the value the key would be maybe maximum 50 characters or 100 characters so yes in this case this is a fast hash function right but is this hash function is going to 
minimize the chances of collisions maybe not right why because if i talk about english language right in english lot of words they are anagrams that means a uh, lot of words have same set of letters in them for example let's say the word is tab right so it is made up of t a and b and if you add you will get certain sum right but if i talk about the word bat right it is also made up of same letters so in this case we are sure that these two are going to collide because our hash function is doing a very simple sum right so in maybe of course there could be other words also maybe the word is mango right now it is possible that even if you do a mod with table size uh, you might end up at the same index right so we do not know so in this case it is of course difficult uh, to tell whether the collision will happen or not but it may still happen right but here we are sure that a collision will happen right so many words in english they will have such a scenario right so what we can do is instead of doing a simple addition right we can do a weighted addition right so this is like a simple addition of ascii values we are doing right so a better way would be that you do not do a simple addition in your hash function but you do a weighted addition right so example 2 of building a hash function would be that you do some weighted addition right so that means you are going to multiply each letter's ascii value with some weight right so for example i choose a weight maybe generally it is a prime number right so maybe i choose a weight as let's say 31 right or 29 right so what i can say that fine i will multiply dosa with powers of 2 so let's say the weight is 29 so 29 power 0 that is 1 into d plus 29 power 1 into o plus 21 square into s plus 21 square into a and then i take a mod with table size right what i'm trying to claim is now if you do it for bat and tab it is less likely that you will have a collision right so i'm saying you multiply uh 29 power 0 which is 1 this is 29 and this is 29 square right and then you like it's a weighted addition again 1 plus 29 into a plus 29 square into b and of course mod with the table size mod with the table size right now earlier we were sure that these two values are uh, will surely collide now we can say okay the chances of the collision are less okay so there is a less chance of collision right so these are the factors that you can keep in mind that okay if i'm building a hash function can i modify it some way so that it reduces the chances of collision and it is fast to compute right so here also it is fast to compute right maybe if you have a string in which the length is too big maybe you can restrict that okay i will consider only the first 10 letters of the string for this weighted addition that can also be done right so that will even make the function bit more faster right so if you are thinking that the keys are too too long you can restrict to maybe the first 10 letters or maybe something like that right so now we have a good hash function which is the second one the so second one is obviously better we are doing weighted addition so it is going to reduce uh, the chances of collision right but a collision can still happen right so how do we handle if still a collision happens so here comes a collision handling scheme right so let us discuss about collision handling scheme now so you have seen how do we design a hash function now we need to discuss how do we design a collision handling scheme right so collisions can still happen we need to handle them right so let us talk about how do we design a collision handling scheme right collision handling scheme right so there are actually multiple schemes but i would particular particularly discuss one scheme right so in this case what we can do we can do something called as separate chaining so we are going to discuss only one scheme uh there are other probing techniques as well right so i will discuss separate chaining right so this is one of the most popularly and widely used schemes in implementing a hash table right now i'll just copy the diagram that we have seen earlier this is the diagram right so let me just copy it uh okay so here we go 
so idea is that if a collision happens what should we do right that is what needs to be addressed right that we are going to address using a technique called as separate chaining so suppose if we got dosa and it get, get mapped with index 4 so what we will do we will not store it directly inside this bucket but instead every time we get a particular bucket mapped with dosa we will start a chain from there right so what what is a chain a chain is like a linked list so it's exactly a list right so that means each bucket is actually going to hold the address of the first node of the list right so for 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 example i'm going to store dosa comma 100 here right now suppose i got coke comma 150 the so coke goes into the hash function and maybe this time i get two so i will start a chain from two and coke will go here coke comma 150 it will be stored here right now suppose i got something like noodles okay and noodles is going to have a value let's say 120 now noodles if it goes to the hash function let us assume the hash function computes an index 4 right now at index 4 we already have dosa so what we will do we'll also try to store noodles at this index how so we can say okay we can add noodles to this linked list now suppose this is some address let's say this is uh, 150 this is 270 right so this is storing 270 this is storing 150 so each array bucket is actually storing the head of the linked list right now how we can insert noodles in this chain in order one time it's pretty easy so you can say okay i will create a bucket called noodles let's say this bucket is uh, this node is created so i'll create this node n with the given key value pair right so it's a new node with the given key value pair right now in this new node what should i do like how do i add this node in this linked list right so i can say okay this is some array right so or this is some table so i can say array of uh, and let us also compute the index so i can say index where I want to store this is given by the hash function of the given key right so I get to know the index also so at this index I need to store noodles so one thing I can do is either I can insert at head or I can do insert at tail so since I'm not maintaining the tail of the linked list explicitly but you can maintain if you want I can also do a direct insertion at the head right so that means we can say okay uh, this node 4 will refer to noodles and noodles will connect here so right now this is connected here so what i can do i can ask noodles to connect with dosa right so i can say n dot next so in every node i'm also going to have next field right so that i can actually form a chain just like a linked list so every node is going to have a next field so i can say okay you should connect here right so i can say n dot next should be equal to array of index so array of index is storing 150 so that 150 will be copied here right and now i can update array of index to point to this node so i can say array of index should point to n so basically i'm changing this connection like this so n is what whatever it is so this will be now referring to this node now if you look carefully we have actually formed a chain right so this is let's say this is some address let's say 480 this is now storing 480 right so you can see we are actually forming a chain right we are actually forming a chain so this is exactly how the insertion is going to work and this is the code to insert right do you think will it work in order one time absolutely yes this insertion will be always order one right because we are inserting something at the head of the linked list irrespective of the chain length the insertion will be always order one right so i hope you have understood insertion but is it done the answer is no we are not yet complete right we have to still discuss one more concept but that concept i will discuss after discussing searching okay so this is still not complete so this is insertion part one right okay so there is something more to the insertion that is going to come up right let us discuss searching how we can actually search in such a scenario right so we are discussing searching now right 
so now what is the purpose of searching the purpose of the searching is that given a key i want to look up for the value of that particular key right so if i ask okay i want to know what is the price of dosa how i will find it so first of all dosa is a key this is given as input so dosa will go to the hash function the hash function will generate a index where this dosa can be present so in this case hash function gives me a index 4 that means now at index 4 i actually have a chain right if i write it little more clearly so this chain looks like this so i have noodles and which is like 120 and i have dosa which is part of the chain and this price is 100 right and of course the next is null now i have to iterate on this chain to check if this chain can contain dosa or not so if i iterate on this chain i will find dosa at this particular position and once i find dosa i can return the value that is 100 right so that is how searching is going to be performed so we first find the bucket where the hash function is telling me okay in this bucket you have to check and in this chain dosa can be present dosa may not be present right now you might ask okay if we have to iterate the chain then what is the time complexity of this operation so my answer is it will be order of chain length right now how do we figure out chain length okay can this chain length become very large the answer is yes it can become very large right so the key to successful search operation is that we have to ensure that this chain length is very small okay so we have to ensure that chain length is very small right maybe 2 to 3 nodes or maybe 3 to 4 nodes right and this is achieved using a concept called as rehashing and load factor so we will discuss this concept ensure that the chain length is very small so if the chain length is very small we can say okay on an average this operation will be order 1 maybe i say okay the chain will have only 3 nodes 2 nodes right but now let us discuss how this chain length will be decided right how this chain length will be actually decided right now suppose i have a hash table where i have seven nodes only right and i keep on inserting data right so if i say okay my table size is 7 and i insert 70 key value pairs inside it right so what will be the average chain length if i talk about the average chain length in this case so i can say okay i have done 70 insertions across seven buckets so it will be 70 upon 7 that is 10 so 10 is a big number i do not want to keep this much chain length right so this quantity that i have just written here it is actually called as load factor so load factor is a technical term for the average chain length okay so how do we compute load factor so we say okay total number of key value pairs that have been inserted in, into the hash table so total key value pairs i have inserted upon my table size or in other words you can say current size the number of key value pairs that have been inserted upon table size that could be another way of writing it right so i write this one looks little more better to me so in the current scenario if you have 70 key value pairs inserted in seven buckets this is 10 it is actually huge it's bad right so what do we need to ensure we need to ensure that our load factor does not exceed a certain threshold right so in some languages it is 1 in some languages it is 0.7 so whatever is the case we need to ensure that it does not exceeds the threshold value of let's say 0.75 right now what does it mean so if i have let's say 10 buckets and i insert seven key value pairs so what will be the load factor it will be 0.7 that means on an average every chain has less than one node right so that also means that my table size will be slightly bigger than the number of keys i want to put so if i want to put let's say 100 keys then my table size could be of the order 150 right something of that sort right so that is something we need to ensure right now how do we ensure that our table grows dynamically as the data in the table is increasing right so one thing you can do is if you have an idea that okay i'm going to insert somewhere around 70 keys you can in initialize your table size um 
around 100 okay so generally it is a prime number right so if it could be like 103 something of that sort right or 107 right so you need to ensure that uh, if it is a prime number it it ensures a slightly better distribution right of the keys right so what i'm going to do i'm going to do insertions and i'm going to show you how the load factor is going to change and what happens if the load factor exceeds the certain threshold so going back i'm going to discuss the insertion logic once again and now apart from doing the insertion in the chain we will also discuss the concept of rehashing and how do we increase the table size dynamically so let us talk about uh, rehashing uh, according to the load factor so let us talk about rehashing right so rehashing is a mechanism that is going to help us expand the table size and bring down the load factor let us try to understand insertion and rehashing procedure with the example okay for example now suppose i have a table which is of size 7 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 right now i'm going to insert certain key value pairs inside it and i will calculate the load factor during the insertion process for example i insert a right so the locations are decided by the hash index so now the load factor will be 1 upon 7 which is 0.14 right which is well below the threshold okay so our threshold is let's say 0.75 so it is below the threshold i will not do anything that means on an average every bucket has 0.14 elements inside it right if i say okay i will insert b maybe it goes here now my load factor is 2 by 7 which is about 0.28 right then i insert c maybe a collision happens and c goes here but then on an average each bucket has now 0.42 elements so it is 3 by 7 that is my load factor right and maybe i insert d so it's going to be 4 by 7 right so it's going to be around 0.56 right so it's it's around 0.57 on the calculator and similarly if i insert let's say e maybe e goes here right so it is 5 by 7 it's going to be around 0.71 it is still below the threshold then if i insert the sixth element maybe f it goes here and it collides right so it's going to be 6 by 7 which is around 0.85 now at this point what do i see i see that the load factor right has reached 0.85 that means it is close to one that means on an average every bucket has around one element each right it is the time to grow the table right so what is the table this is my table i want to grow this table i want to make it bigger right so what i will do i will create a new table or a new array right which is approximately double of the given size right so maybe this table size was seven so i generally look for a table size which is a prime number right so this new table size could be let's say seven into two is 14 what is the nearest prime number close to 14 it could be 13 also it could be 17 also let's say this is 17 right so i'm taking the next biggest prime number right now what i will do this table is empty right this table is empty and my goal is to remove all the entries from this hash table and put it into this hash table now you might ask why can't we uh, use this hash table right the reason being uh, your table size has changed and your hash index that we saw right so we saw it was a weighted sum okay it was a weighted sum of um, the letters of the string taken with taken mod with the table size now table size has changed so my hashing will also change that means if i now insert a earlier it was going at position one now it might go at certain some other position so a might go here c might go here b might go here and d might go here and since the number of buckets they have also increased that means my distribution uh, will also change and it is possible that the number of collisions that are happening they might reduce right so what i have to do i have to do rehashing so this is what rehashing is so we have created a table of size uh, double the capacity right and we we iterated over every chain in the original table every node we added again into the hash table so once we are done what we will do we will delete this from the memory this will be cleared off 
and now my hash table is going to refer to this table right now in this table if i compute uh, the load factor okay if i compute the load factor now this will be much much lower than 0.85 why because it was now 6 by 7 now this will be 6 by 17 so if i calculate this value 6 upon 17 this value comes out to be 0 0.35 0 0.35 right so i can keep on adding more entries into this table right again if again it exceeds the uh, threshold what i will do i will re execute rehashing once again right now what i'm trying to say is that this rehashing is a special mechanism that will be triggered from the insert method when my load factor exceeds the certain threshold right so it will be some condition like if my load factor exceeds the certain threshold i will have to call the rehash method from the insert function right so this is something i will show you in the code as well right but i hope you are understanding the reason of rehashing right now, what is the importance of rehashing so if we have done rehashing right can i say the average chain length will be always less than one that means on an average no bucket has more than one node right so it might happen that some buckets may have zero nodes some buckets might may have two or three nodes but i'm going to say this average chain length will be a very small number and it it is it can be treated as constant so that is why we say that our search is order one on average right order one on average right that is what what my search operation will be right now another point what is the complexity of rehashing right so of course we have to iterate on the entire table and put all the keys into the new table so it, it is going to take order of n time right then how my insertion can be order of one so if you look carefully this rehashing is not happening again and again so it is happening once in a while so you you inserted this element you we took order one time this element it took order one time order one time order one time order one time and at this point we saw that load factor is increasing and it is going to tr trigger the rehash function so it is going to hit order of n time right so can i say that for six elements I spent it constant time, but for one element, I spent order and time, right? So if I talk about on average, how much time I spent on each element? So again, if I take an average, it, it's like a worst case, right? Inserting six is like a worst case. The worst case, yes, it can go order of n, but on an average, we are spending order of one time in doing an insertion, right? Now you might ask, how can I bring down the time of rehashing? So if you know that, okay, I am going to insert about 500 keys. So you make sure in the beginning that your table size is big enough so that rehashing is never triggered. Okay. Or it, it is triggered very, very rare, right? So the correct way to do it is initialize a large enough table. Okay. It should not be too big that you're using too much of memory. And so you have to make a balance between effective memory memory utilization so you should know from the historic data okay how how big table should be sufficient so if you're storing phone contacts you know in general people might have 500 to 1000 contacts so you can initialize a table of the size around 1000 right so it is just large enough just large enough so that rehashing is never triggered right or it is triggered maybe just once right it is never triggered right so this is something we can do right to make sure that almost every insertion is order one right so i hope you understood the concept of rehashing and i'll show you in the code as well let us discuss the implementation of hash table so i'm using c but you can also use java or any other language to map the same functionality in in your own language right so first of all i discuss that hash table is a table and in this table is going to uh, contain the address of it, it is going to contain the head of the linked list so linked list is made up of nodes so node will store key a value and the next field right so that is what i have defined in the node structure so i'm using templated classes so it's like generics in java and templates in c these templates allow me to uh, hold data of any t type in my node right so for keeping things little simple i'm assuming that my key is always a string but it can be of other data types as well for that also you need to 
use templated classes and you need to provide a way to convert that data type into a hash index value right so for now i'm dealing with strings only but i'm saying the value can be of any type it could be int it could be string it could be float because we are not computing any hash on the value we are just going to store that value as it is and third thing is the next property that is of the node right whenever i initialize the node i set the value of key i set the value which is the value and by default i set the next as none right and this is my constructor and if i want to delete a node so this deletion will happen if we am deleting a certain value or i'm doing rehashing and i want to delete some data right this is actually a destructor which says that if next is not null delete next so basically it is a recursive way of deleting the node right so that means if i uh, make a call at this point it says okay if i'm going to delete this node and if the next is not null first delete it if the next is not null first delete it so it, it, it's a way in which i can delete the entire chain at once right so this is something um, which you can also like it's uh, it can be implemented in other way also right so you might not necessarily do the same thing but in my case i'm doing it i will show, tell you why right so uh, that is about the node constructor and now let us come to the hash table class right so what i have done i am actually keeping a two dynamic array called table so table is referring to an array right you might ask why star star because see uh, each each bucket in this array is going to hold an address of the node so it is of the type node star right and what is table table is a pointer to an array of pointers right because each bucket is going to point to the head of the linked list so each bucket is of the type node star hence the type of the table is node star star right it is going to be a dynamic array referring to an array of pointers okay so i have a table which is not initialized at the moment i have current size i have table size so current size will be zero in the beginning so i will show you uh, the constructor for this yeah this is the constructor so whenever a new hash table is created right so current size is set to zero table size is set to default size i'm taking a parameter with the default value of seven so if user gives me let's say i want a table size of 107 it will be 107 but if nothing is given by default i'm taking it very small and it is seven right then i initialize my table array so table is an array that points to an array of node star and this is of size table size so these many buckets i have initialized and by default in every bucket i'm putting a value null right so this is null this is null this is null right so instead of having garbage it is better to initialize everything with null that is how that hash table has been initialized i hope you don't have any doubts till now now comes the interesting method that is insert right now if i want to insert something right so i my table is ready so table is here my hash function is also ready okay i'll show you the hash function let's say i want to insert dosa comma 100 so what do i do i will show you the hash function let us understand the insert so my key that is dosa it goes through the hash function and i get an index so maybe the index is 4 right so at this index what do i do i will create a new node so i say okay there is a new node called n which is dosa comma 100 so in this line i do this work and i say n dot next this is equal to table of index so table and this is index so n dot next will point to whatever this is pointing to so it is currently pointing to null so the next starts pointing to null right then i say table of index is equal to n so this index is going to hold the value n so n is let's say 248 that is the address of this node so it is going to store 248 right so this is how this node gets attached to the beginning of the table current size plus plus so current size becomes one then i compute load factor so which is one upon seven is it greater than 0.7 the answer is no right so if it becomes then i will trigger rehash i will show rehash, rehash method also right so this is about the insert functionality right so i hope you're getting it let's say i'm inserting one more node which at the index four so i just want to show you how the chaining is going to work let's say i inserted noodles 
and for noodles also i got an index 4 so noodles comma 120 i created a new node called n right then i said n dot next is equal to table of index table of index is storing this value so noodles starts pointing to this value right and table of index is equal to n so this connection is broken and this starts pointing to this node right? so you can see in a way we are forming a chain in which noodles is getting inserted at the head of the linked list right so this is nothing but insertion at the head of the linked list current size plus plus so current size is 2 load factor is 2 by 7 which is again less than 0.7 so hence i do not trigger rehash at this moment right so i hope you insert uh, you understood the insert method so next i want to show you the hash function that i've used here the hash function i've made it as a private so what i'm doing i'm simply multiplying the numbers let's say the word is dosa what i'm doing i'm iterating over this and i'm multiplying it with powers of 29 so it is 1 so initially it is multiplied with 1 then in the next iteration power becomes into 29 so into 29 next time it becomes power becomes again power into 29 so it gets multiplied with 29 square and again it becomes 29 cube right so in order to avoid overflow i'm doing a percentage mod at each step because if, if you take mod at the last uh, or if you take mod at each step we know this is the property of mod so mod can be taken at each step as well so this is a better thing to do because it helps us to avoid overflow right i'm taking a mod with power also and i'm taking the mod in the answer also so i get an index which is in the range 0 to table size minus 1 because i'm doing a mod with table size so i hope you understand the hash function as well right now what i need to do is i need to understand the rehash method right so if we understand the rehash method our insertion will be complete so i have written a rehash method as well which is actually a private method as well so what i'm doing in my rehash method that suppose i have an old table like the actual table in this i have inserted some keys let's say a b is there c and d is there what do i do i say okay old table is going to point to table so this was my table now old table is pointing to this table i create a new table okay which is almost double of the previous size plus one i'm just making it as an odd number instead of making it as a prime number so i'm saying this is my table now which is also the data member of the class right so what do i do i initialize it with null so all these values are set to null and then what I do, I copy elements from the old table. So I iterate over the old table. And how do I do, do the work? Let me show you. So I do, do it like this. I take a temp variable, which is the ith row. So temp starts from here. Okay. Temp is referring to the head of the linked list. And while temp is not null. So I copy the key. I copy the value. So I say, okay, give me this key value pair and i call the insert method so insert method we know by default it acts on the table which is the data member of the class so it is going to insert automatically in the new table right and temp goes as next so temp comes to this node again i copy b i and insert it in the new table right so once it is done i make a destructor call if old table of i is not null delete old table of i so in java there is a concept of garbage collection but in c++ we have to use explicitly we have to invoke uh, the destruction of this uh, this entire linked list by saying delete old table of i so i initiate a destructor call from here which makes a call to a a is being a, it being a recursive destructor a makes a call to b this way this entire row is deleted right and then i go to the next row so my i is incre increasing so i go to this row this row this row this row this row i do the same work and all the nodes are inserted in the new table and finally i say okay i want to delete the array that is old table so i also want to clear up this memory so i say delete old table this old table is gone and since it is a local variable this is also destroyed right so till now you have seen the insert functionality and we discussed that uh, the function rehash will be triggered from the insert whenever load factor exceeds the threshold okay so we basically double the table size here right now let us talk about searching a little bit how do we actually do searching in a hash table 
so searching is pretty easy so if you have a hash table right and you want to search for a certain key let's say dosa so that key will go through the hash function the hash function will tell you the bucket so maybe this is the index of the bucket and in this bucket there might be a chain in which dosa could be one of the item right so maybe this is some x item some y item some red item so you need to iterate on this chain linearly right so i start temp from this node so while temp is not null while i do not hit the end of the chain i compare is the key of this node matches with the given key if i'm that i'm searching so if that happens i return the value otherwise i go to the next node if i hit end of the chain that means i did not found the key so i return null in that case right this is how searching is done right so on an average what we are saying that this chain length is so small right because of the rehashing and the load factor that we are maintaining right so we can say okay iterating over a very small linked list will take order one time on average okay so we are not talking about the worst case so a worst case scenario might be like this uh, a single bucket has all the n nodes inside it right so base, basically chain length is of the order n but this is a very less likely scenario because uh, this can be only possible if your hash function is too too bad it is producing the same bucket for many different types of keys okay in general it's not going to happen so that is why we say on average it's going to be order one most of the times right so i hope you have understood the search functionality as well right on a similar lines you you might have to do erase as well you might want to delete a particular key as well right now how you have to do it now this is pretty simple if you know how to search then you can also know how to delete right so suppose i want to delete a key that is y what i will do i will pass y to the hash function it will give me the index i'll find this linked list now the problem boils down to deleting this node from the linked list now you have to handle these cases this node could be the last node in the linked list it could be middle of the linked list it could be beginning of the linked list right so if you know deletion in a linked list you can easily handle the code to erase a particular key value pair from the hash map as well so let us talk about graph so graph is a network like data structure consisting of nodes and edges so it is a data structure that means it is able to hold data and the data is in the form of a network okay and consisting of nodes and edges so if i look at this figure all these circles they represent a node and all these lines they are representing a connection between these two nodes for example this edge is connecting node 4 and 25 so can we think of any real life example where the data might have connections in between certain objects of course yes if we talk about cities then cities are connected with each other through connections which we call as roads if we talk about a social media graph for example this is person a and he is connected with a person b and a is also connected with a c so we say b and c they are friends of a or a and b are connected a and c are connected if i talk about uh, this person d is it connected to a we say no the person a is not connected with d or d is not connected with a because there is no direct edge in between them so if i add a edge they also become direct connections so there can be many many applications in real life where graphs can play an important role so let us try to understand the applications first then we will dive deeper into the implementation and coding so graphs as i said they are used in many real life applications and they represent a network of nodes such a network of nodes can be a network of cities a network of places landmarks anything it can also be an electrical circuit when you use when you use your mobile phones it has something called as a, a circuit okay it has a, a motherboard on which you have certain elements certain small small embedded systems on it and there is a wire connecting these any elements so it is possible that we want to find out the most optimal route for the wire so that we can reduce the cost okay because it is a copper wiring it can be expensive it can be a graph algorithm can be used here to minimize the total length of the wire that can be used to connect all the components in this circuit and of course social media networks we have just discussed that facebook twitter linkedin all these networks they can represent graphs so let us go into the applications in little more detail the first example is an example of shortest paths we often use apps like google maps uber 
Ola and many other apps to compute to in our daily life. Okay, so these apps they try to figure out what is the shortest path between the set of nodes that are there and should I go from this route or should I go from this route? If you want to do such a calculation, okay, if you want to go from source to a destination, then what path would be best? Can be easily devised using a shortest path algorithm known as Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm. We will discuss that algorithm in this series. Then of course, if you want to book flights, okay, you want to say, okay, I have to go to this region. Maybe there is a flight which cost 80 and there is a flight which cost 20. Should I take this flight or should I take these three flights? So maybe they are cheaper, but they are taking more time. So there might be trade-offs. Again, you have to look at what you want. What is your requirement? Do you want to optimize for time or do you want to optimize for the total cost of travel? The social media networks I have discussed. So I will give you one more example. In some networks, when you connect with a person, for example, Facebook, so if a and B are friends, then this connection is bi-directional. That means A is connected with B, B is connected with A. But in some other networks, this connection is having a direction. For example, on Twitter, if A follows B, it does not mean B is also following A. So these edges, they can be bi-directional or they can be one directional. So we call such a graph as a directed graph or directed edges. Okay, so this graph has directed edges because A is following C and B, but B is not following this. So in such a case, this is called as a directed edge. And in example of Facebook, it is called as a undirected edge because there is no fixed direction. If A and B are friends, then B is a friend of A and A is also a friend of B, right? Now these kind of representations the graph like representation is important to build algorithms. If you want to find mutual friends, if you want to generate news feed so for A, it will see the post from B and C. If B is following someone, then this person's post will not be visible to A. So all these algorithms require graph like representation of the objects involved. Then there is also something called as shortest round trip. If you think of a traveling if you think of something called as uh, a school van okay what is the purpose of school van it will start from school and it will drop all the children on the way and it will come back to its location so in this case what is happening we are doing a cyclic tour we are coming to the source by covering all the points in the city where we need to drop the children now it, it is possible that multiple routes can be devised but we want to devise a route which costs minimum so such route design can be used in for amazon delivery vans for school vans and this is a very famous problem in graphs called as traveling salesman problem we will also discuss this problem in the coming series let us talk about one more application so when you are installing software you might have seen that the software is installing list of dependencies in a certain order for example you have to install a software x for X, you need something called as, let's say, uh, C. C is dependent upon something called as B. B is dependent upon A. And there is something called as D. X is dependent upon D. And D is also dependent upon A and B. Right? Now, in such a scenario, if I have to install the dependencies, what is the first thing I will install? Of course, I will install A. If I install A, then B and D, they do not have any dependency. So either I can go with B or I can go with D. So I can install B and D. If I have installed B and D, then X has only one dependency that is C. So I can install C and then I can install X. So if I install the dependencies in this order, right, my software will be installed correctly. So this kind of a graph, it is called as dependency graph. And it is an example of a directed acyclic graph. That means there is no cycle. It is directed. And from this graph, we need to figure out what is the correct order of installation of software, right? So it is often used while installing software on, on systems, on servers, on, when you're installing libraries and modules, they follow this particular order. And this dependency graph can be easily created using a graph algorithm called as topological sorting. We will learn about this algorithm 
in the coming series of videos okay so that is another application of graph so let us talk about one more application that is routing algorithms so bellman ford is a very popular graph algorithm that is also used in finding uh, shortest paths now this algorithm is also used in uh, routing algorithms so when you so you know the world has lot lot of routers right and these routers are continuously exchanging data packets so which data packet should go there and what is the shortest time in which it can reach to the desired location so all this routing is done using a distributed version of bellman ford algorithm which is again a very interesting algorithm in itself so let us talk about one more application so if some of you have done machine learning then you know in deep learning the deep learning models they do gradient computation which is a important step in training of the machine learning models okay so this these gradients are used in back propagation to adjust the model parameters and the way the, these libraries like tensorflow pytorch they have built they build a computation graph of these gradients so that the computation can be optimized so you do not need to worry about how the how to construct the graph the libraries like tensorflow pytorch they automatically do it for you again this is inspired from the idea of graphs itself and in traditional computer vision what happened image segmentation algorithms were used which were based upon the concept of network flow which is again a graph based algorithm so if you do not know what is image segmentation so image segmentation is basically extracting out uh, objects from an image it's like drawing a boundary on an object that is like one one entity in, in case of this example the car is one object the building is another object this footpath is another object the road is an, another object so this these kind of algorithms are often used in self driven cars but in today's world we have deep learning techniques for image segmentation but the traditional way of doing this segmentation was based upon a graph algorithm called network flow again let's do one more application in web crawler so basically when you want to build a web crawler for example you want to crawl amazon.com and you want to scrap the entire website so when you go to amazon.com what happens you load the code the code is loaded in the browser so in the code you will see it, it there are lot of products and with each product there is a hyperlink so you want to go and scrap all those products so what do you do you you build a web scraper that reads these links adds them into queue so maybe this is some tv button okay so you go to that page it opens up and then again there are many many links here so you can also use these links crawl further right so it's like a tree traversal so web crawlers use breadth first search to crawl the web so if you have built a web scraper you would have know that you often do a bfs like thing and you traverse the dom tree and a tree is also a graph okay a tree does not contain a cycle but it is also a graph example so let us do one more application so nowadays we also have databases that are inspired from the idea of graphs one such database is called neo4j so these kind of databases are used in recommendation engines fraud detection and many ai based applications apart from it there are lot of other applications of graphs such as in linguistics social sciences biology neuroscience atomic and molecular structure computer processing flood fill and more so what is this flood fill this is an interesting application i often cover in my course when you use a paint bucket tool like this and you drop it in an object it automatically fills the color till it hits the boundary like you you, you can see here right so this again is an example of graph and this matrix is an example of a 2d implicit it's a 2d matrix which is representing a implicit graph so we will discuss about what is an implicit graph and how do we build algorithms on implicit graph that will be covered as well so that's about the applications next we will dive into the more technical concepts and understand how a graph can actually be created and stored inside the memory next thing i want to talk about in graphs is classification of graphs though we have talked briefly about weighted and unweighted graphs let us try to understand with some more examples 
basically there are two criteria for classifying graphs one is weight of edges there can be graphs in which there is no weight associated with the edge that means each edge is treated equally each has a unit cost okay you can say okay it is a unweighted graph such a graph is called as unweighted graph but it can be scenario for example if you talk about roads so each road might have a length or it might have a time to travel from b to c right so some kind of weight or maybe some kind of fuel cost so we can say that in such a scenario each edge is having a different weight and we need to store that weight as well okay so earlier if i am representing a edge as a comma b in a unweighted graph now i have to represent edge as a comma b comma 10 that means the time to travel from a to b or the edge weight from a to b so this is a case of a weighted graph right that means in the implementation also we will have to store this weight associated with the each edge and then there is direction of edges now there can be scenarios where the edges are not having any specific direction for example talk about facebook friends if a and b are connected they are connected that means a is a friend of b b is a friend of a but edges can have a certain direction for example a twitter graph so if a is following b does not mean that b is also following a so in this case edge will have a certain direction that means a is following b and a is following c and b is following c something like this this is an example of a directed graph and weights so of this is an example of undirected graph let us look at some more examples okay so we have discussed graphs whose edges or paths can have values associated with them they will be called as weighted graphs edge, edge value can represent either the weight or some kind of cost or length of that path for example in roads it might be the distance in kilometers so directed and directed graph we have already dis discussed graph edges can have specific direction attached to them they're called as directed graphs okay now in such a scenario you might have two way edges for example from one to two there is an edge from two to one there can be edge as well and it is possible a different weight is associated with each of it edge for example we are going from delhi to bangalore via flight now this flight might cost you 4k but this flight might cost you 5k so this is an example of a directed and a weighted graph in an undirected graph there is no direction of the edge that means you can travel in both directions you can go from a to b you can go from b, b to a for example in roads okay so i hope you are under, able to understand through these examples so let us try to make a matrix and uh, let's summarize right so i can say graph can have weights weighted graphs or unweighted graph they can have direction or they can be undirected okay so what what would be an example of a directed and a weighted graph for example from a to b okay and there is a cost associated with it this can be your graph of different flights across cities because flights will have a cost and they will have a direction so if there is a flight from a to b it is possible that there is no flight from b to a or b to a flight has a different cost this will be a directed and a weighted graph let's look at an example of a directed and unweighted graph i talked about topological sorting in which we said that there are certain tasks and there are dependencies for example b is dependent upon a c is also dependent upon a and c is also dependent upon b so this is an example of a directed acyclic graph okay so this is an example of a dependency graph in this graph there is a direction but there is no weight so it is an example of directed and unweighted graph so an example is dependency graph okay then there is an example of undirected but weighted graph so i want a graph in which there is no direction but there is a weight maybe the road network i can say okay the roads are generally two way so there is there is a cost so there is a weight 
but there is no direction so 100 200 10 20 this is an example of a undirected and a weighted graph then undirected and unweighted graph so that means no direction and uh, no weights as well so it could be simple facebook graph in which you are representing who is connected with whom a and d they are friends so there is no weight so maybe facebook friends graph okay or facebook network so it is possible that it is unweighted but depending upon how facebook implements it this graph can also become weighted facebook might represent a score a friendship score on each edge how strong these two people are how strong their bond is so it is possible that this graph can be made as weighted also so i hope classification of graphs is clear through these examples and next we will dive into the implementation how to create a graph and store it on your run now the next question arises how do we actually create this data structure and how do we work with it so there are three common representations for graph one is called as edge list one is called as adjacency matrix and one is called as adjacency list we will go over all of them one by one each representation has its own set of advantages and disadvantages but in general this representation which is called adjacency list this is the most popular and most commonly used in many algorithms but this does not mean that edge list is useful or adjacency matrix is useless they are also useful they have their specific applications in certain type of algorithms so let us discuss edge list first and what is a edge list so in a edge list we represent graph in in terms of list of edges right so suppose we have vertices a b c d so we will make a list of vertices and if we have edges we will note down what edges we have we have a b so a b is an edge we have a c we store that we have a d we store that we have b c we store that we have c d we store that so right now i am assuming this is a undirected graph so when a b is an edge it also means b a edge is also there that means if you can go from a to b you can also go from b to a as well right similarly if you can go from a to c you can go from c to a as well right so in my code i will be storing two copies a d is there d a is there b c is there c b is there d c is there right I'll be storing it like this that will be more helpful because if I am at D and I want to look at what nodes I can visit so I can clearly look at this there is an edge from D to A and there is an edge from D to C right so I can look at this or you can say okay I'll iterate through the whole list of course you will have to iterate through the whole list and you have to look at what pairs contain D right from that you can get this information from D where you can go right but this kind of a representation is pretty, I would say, inefficient if you have to find whether there is an edge between, let's say, B and D. I want to see whether there is an edge from B to D. The answer is it is inefficient because you have to spend, you have to do a linear search over the whole list. So that means you have to spend order of E time looking for whether such an edge exists or not. Right? Similarly, if you have to do an operation like okay give me the neighbors immediate neighbors of b right this is now a very common operation in graph algorithms such as bfs dfs the extras we often need this operation right so neighbors of b so what are the neighbors of b so again you cannot tell directly you have to iterate over the whole edge list to find out what are the neighbors of b again this operation is going to be inefficient it is going to take order of a time right but one thing this edge list is good at for example suppose this was a this graph was a let's say a weighted graph let's say 10 5 2 1 6 right and i want to pick edges based upon their weight right so now in the, such a scenario i will be storing three things in an edge so i will be storing a b followed by 2 i will be storing a c followed by the weight right in case of a weighted graph i need to store three things right and so on maybe i want to pick edges based upon their weight so what i can do if I'm, i've stored all edges in the form of list i can easily do sorting on this list okay, i can do sorting on the list in like e log e time right e log e time and i can pick edges maybe based upon their weight right so, or according to some criteria right so maybe i want to do sorting on the list based upon weight of edges so this kind of 
algorithm is actually helpful when we deal with a topic that is called as minimum spanning tree right so when we are building a minimum spanning tree algorithm we actually need to pick edges based upon weight so in such an algorithm we will go with the edge list kind of a representation right so that means this representation is also useful but it depends upon the algorithm what kind of operation do we want do we want to get neighbors of a node or do we want to sort edges so if you want to sort edges then edge list is the representation that we will use so i hope you are able to understand edge list and now in the next video and now we will discuss the code of edge list so i am going to show you how we can create a graph using edge list so i am in my intellij id and i am going to create a class called as graph using edge list this class will be responsible for holding the data of the graph so effectively what i am going to do is i am going to keep things little simple i am going to fix number of nodes let's say number of nodes is given as input by the user let's say user says four nodes so i am not going to take input the names of nodes i am going to assume that the nodes are always numbered from 0 to n minus 1 so this is from 0 to 3 right this is something which is very common in many coding problems and we often use we make this assumption okay and you can also verify from the problem statement if this is not the case then we will discuss it separately right so number of nodes are 4 and let's say the graph looks like this 0 1 2 3 right so what is expected in the input that you will be given how many edges are there so number of edges will be input that is also 4 and then you will be given the names of edges so 0 comma 1 is one edge 0 comma 3 is another edge 1 comma 2 is another edge 2 comma 3 is another edge so you will be given these numbers input so what is our expectation that this graph should be able to hold these pair of edges so 0 comma 1 i want to hold 0 comma 3 i want to hold 1 comma 2 i want to hold and 2 comma 3 i want to hold right now if you look at this list can you visualize this graph of course yes right that means this information is sufficient to store this graph right so what i'm going to do in this graph class is i'm going to make a list which is able to hold a following edge right now it is possible that each edge might have a certain weight let's say some weight w1 w2 w3 w4 right so in such a scenario i can add w1 w2 w3 it will be list of edge where each edge object is a collection of three numbers in this case right so what we can do is we can define a class called as edge right we can define a class called as edge right and uh, in this class i can have three things one is maybe the source so i call it as u i have v and i have weight right so that means uh, the triplet so if there is an edge from u to v with a weight w i'm going to store a triplet u v w and i'm going to create an edge object out of it right then i can make a list of edges so i hope you understood the concept let us dive into coding so i need a constructor for the edge class so the constructor is going to ex expect u v and w right for one edge object so i can say this dot u equals u this dot v equals v this dot weight equals weight right so later on i want to print the edges so i might need a method to display an edge right so i can just use the two string method which is going to show me which is going to print which is going to return a string representation for this edge so this will be helpful when we are going to print the edge so if i want to do s out an edge i will see that the edge will be printed like this u equal to something v equal to something and weight equal to something right this overrides the default uh, two string method right and it is auto generated by the id for me right so i have the two string method with me right so this will be helpful if i am going to display the graph that means i am going to display this edge list in the output so i don't have to like i don't have to write for each edge i have i don't have to do this work because it this method will be called when i am going to print it so i can simply say s out some edge right so something like this we can do so now coming to this actual class right so let's make this class as public 
in this class what information it needs to hold it needs to hold how many nodes we have number of vertices number of edges is optional because it can be judged by the length of this list right the user is going to enter the edges and we are going to store them right so that is simple and uh, so let's have a constructor right so the construct and apart from it we need a list of edges right so list of the type edges l let's create the constructor graph using edge list so in this constructor i'm going to get number of vertices which i can initialize so this will be list of edge so i can say this dot v equal to v and i also need to create this list so l is a new list so it can be a link list or an array list and uh, i can say it is an empty list right so when a when a graph is created it knows how many vertices it has and it creates an empty link list okay now i want to add edges in this graph so maybe i need to create some method add edge u comma v and wait right i want to push an edge into this graph so i can simply say uh, if there is an edge from u to v so i can say um, l dot add what i should add i should add a new edge which goes from u to v and is having a following weight so i'm doing it for a directed graph right i'm going doing it for a directed graph so i think this implementation looks complete to me now let us test our implementation by going to main right so here what i need to do i need to create a graph object right so which i am doing right and uh, then i am saying that fine okay so here i have passed one more parameter which is going to tell whether the graph is directed graph or undirected graph so this is a optional thing if you want to accept that okay this is a directed graph then you can add just this edge but if it is a undirected graph you also need to do one more uh, line of code where you are adding the edge from u to v right so you are saying that okay a and b are connected that means a is a friend of b there is an edge from a to b but there is also an edge from b to a right so you can do this thing in case of a undirected graph so that can be handled by putting a if condition here but for now i am keeping things simple and i will modify this code a little bit earlier i did it for a undirected graph right so it's it's just a signal to the graph whether you want to add this edge like one time or two times right and now i want to display the graph i basically want to display the edge list right so i created a graph object using this class new graph i initialize the number of vertices which actually we are not using as of now but this might be helpful in future right for some other use case now if i want to display this edge list so i can say okay void display okay or let me see if i can do a two string thing here right so here i'm going to modify this right i'm going to or this is fine actually this is fine so it is going to return a list let's see what does it return right so i'm going to say s out graph show me the graph right so let's go and run this code okay so this graph says that okay i i know two things i have vertices which are four and i have a list of edges which is this list okay so there is an edge from 0 to 1 with weight 10 so 0 to 1 weight 10 0 to 2 weight 20 0 to 2 weight 20 1 to 2 weight 30 right so you can see this is completely fine and we are able to see uh, the edge list that we have implemented so that is the idea behind edge list now you can use this edge list to do sorting so right now i have hard coded values here but what you can do you can ask the number of edges put a for loop take input those edges and inside the loop you can call this function g dot add edge and this is going to add all the edges in your graph right so in generally i have discussed how the input is given number of nodes is given number of edges is given followed by list of edges is given right so pairs like 
zero comma one comma ten followed by next pair zero comma two comma twenty right this will be input you can scan it and call g dot add edge to add it in your graph line so i hope this representation is clear next we will discuss another implementation the next representation of a graph it is called as adjacency matrix so what is this it is a 2d matrix which is of the size v cross v where v is the number of vertices of the graph the number of elements in the matrix indicate whether pairs of the elements of the matrix actually not the number of elements the element of the matrix indicate whether pairs of vertices are adjacent or not so basically if there is an edge from 1 comma 2 right so what we will do we will have a adjacency matrix okay so in this case there are uh, five nodes so there is a five cross five matrix right and there is an edge from one comma two so what we are doing we are saying that matrix of one comma two will be true so if it is a unweighted graph there is no weight so i can simply set this edge as true so one comma two is true or it is one right and similarly if it is a undirected graph there is no direction so matrix of two comma one is also true right so this value is also true so this value 1 comma 5 this is 0 so it, this basically indicates there is no edge from 1 to 5 right so if there is an edge from x comma y then in in my matrix matrix of x comma y will be set to 1 and matrix of 1 comma y comma x will also be set to 1 that indicates that x and y they are connected right so this is pretty simple and the problem with this approach is that as your n grows right so if let's say you have 1000 nodes right your matrix will be of the size n square right so that means it will have 10 power 6 elements so if n is let's say 10 power 7 your matrix will be of the size 10 power 14 you won't be able to hold this big matrix in your memory right so it, it is not suitable for large number of nodes okay it is suitable for small number of nodes but again there are certain advantages and disadvantages for this right so one is one disadvantage is that you are going to waste a lot of space so in most of the graphs if you have n nodes you might not have n square edges that means lot of zeros will be there in the matrix which is leading to space wastage secondly if you want to find neighbors of one what nodes are connected with one there is no way you have to iterate over this whole list which is going to take order of uh, order of v time right because you, there are v vertices here you have to go to each vertex and check whether one is connected with it or not right that is again a problem we do not want to go to five because one is not connected with five but we are still iterating right so this is a major disadvantage that means you cannot get neighbors of a node in order to get neighbors of node you have to spend order of p time which is not very efficient operation right but there is one advantage as well so what is the advantage if I have to check if there is an edge between 1 comma 3 right so that check can be order 1 why because you just need to go to 1 comma 3 this index and check yes this value is 1 so you can check yes this value is 1 so that means I can figure out whether an edge is present between two nodes or not in just order one time right now you might ask what if the graph was a weighted graph 1 comma 2 was having let's say w weight in such a scenario instead of storing 0 or 1 here you will store 0 followed by weight right 0 and weight so 1 comma 2 has having w weight so 2 comma 1 is also having w weight right so you can store integer values 2 comma 5 has 8 weight so 2 comma 5 you can put this value as 8 and 5 comma 2 as also 8 right so depending upon the use case this matrix can be an integer matrix or it can be a boolean matrix right so I hope you understood the concept of adjacency matrix. Now let us look at the implementation of adjacency matrix. Let us implement graph using adjacency matrix. So again, I will have to keep number of vertices and I will have to keep a Boolean matrix. So I can say a Boolean some matrix, let's say called adjacency matrix. And uh, we will initialize this matrix in the constructor, right? So I have graph using adjacency matrix i'm getting the number of vertices this dot v equals v and adjacency matrix equals new boolean of the size v cross v right? so i hope 
this matrix this initialization is clear so by default i think all the values would be false and now we can write the add edge function right so i'm not going to uh, take the weighted graph because i've taken a boolean matrix so i will take only two parameters the edge from u to v and also i'm assuming the graph is a undirected graph right but if you have a directed graph then it is even easier right so if there is an edge from u to v what i need to do in the matrix for the u -th row and the v -th column i need to mark this as true so i can say adjacency matrix of u comma v will be marked as true rest everything is false right and adjacency matrix of v comma u this is also true right so the other way around we also have to do right so that's it now what we need to do we need to test our code right this adds an edge to our graph and now we can have a display method right that is going to display the matrix so i can add a two string method here which is going to display the vertices and the adjacency matrix let's go to main here and now i have to create a graph using adjacency matrix so i've added few edges and uh, now let us go and run this code and let's see what output do we get now we are getting okay in this graph object we have four vertices and now adjacency matrix is being displayed like this so this is actually how a 2d array is stored in java right so if i talk about a 2d array a 2d array is a 1d array of rows right and each row is actually point is storing the address of an array right this is how it is being done right this is how it is actually done 2d array is an array of rows and each row is let's say this row is 30c this is 97d right so what we are printing is we are printing the address of each row of the uh, array right so this is the address of a 1d array zero row, first row second row and third row if i want to handle this uh, in a correct manner right? so i have to say that we do not want to convert this 2d matrix into string directly we have to use a method called uh, deep to string that will actually iterate deeply into each row and then it will print the, uh, convert the contents into the string right so i'll do it like this this will actually give me the string like representation of the full 2d array right let's uh, go and run this code once again and see what do we get yeah this time i'm getting the correct adjacency matrix so i will draw it for you so what i did i give four vertices let's say 0 1 2 and 3 then i said 1 and 2 are connected fine 0 and 3 they are connected okay 1 and 3 are connected okay and 2 and 3 they are connected okay so this is how the graph looks like and then i have a 4 cross 4 matrix 0 1 2 3 0 1 2 3 so it is false 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 true so here i have a true here false false true true so here i have true true false true false true so true true then i have true 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 false t t t so if you look at this zero so zero is only connected with three so we have a true here then look at one one is connected with two and three so one is connected with two and three correct look at two two is connected with one and three two is connected with one and three correct look at three three is connected with zero one two so zero one and two yes this is a correct representation of the adjacency matrix for this graph so i hope you understood this concept pretty easy nothing fancy in it and you can easily to modify the code for a directed graph by making this as a integer matrix and putting the weight here right so that's all next we will discuss adjacency list now let us talk about one more implementation of graph that is called as adjacency list so this is the most widely and most common used representation in many graph algorithms so what do we do in this representation the adjacency list represents a graph as an array of linked lists the index of the array represents a node so we will try to understand now suppose i have one two two there is an edge right 
Uh, so what I really want to do is that with node one, I actually want to store all the neighbors of one. So one is connected with two, one is connected with three, one is connected with four, right? So basically there is a key value mapping. So key is one value is the list of nodes with which it is connected. One way to store it is that we create an array. Now, now suppose there are five nodes. So here they, they have assumed a one based indexing, but in our code, there will be a zero based indexing, right? What it is saying that it is a linked list, right? So if you talk about one, one is connected with two, three, four. Similarly, if you talk about two, two is connected with one, three, and five. So I know two is connected with one, three, and five. Three is connected with three is connected with four and two, right? So and one also. So it is connected with one, two, and four. Four is connected with one and three, and five is connected with two, right? So each of this is like a linked list. We can definitely add more to this linked list. For example, if five and six are connected, so I can say okay, in linked list of five, you can add six, and in six, at the sixth position, you can add five. Okay, so why we are using this linked list because it is easy to add into this. So we can easily do a add operation, right? But how many linked lists do we need? Do we need one linked list? No, we need an array of linked lists. So this data structure is an array of linked list, right? So right now it, we are assuming a one based in indexing, but it will be zero based indexing. If I talk about array of one, array of one is nothing but it is a list. What about array of two? Array of two is nothing but it is a list. And what does array of two denote? Array of two denotes a list containing neighbors of two, right? So if we implement this, right? So what we are going to store, we are going to store this, 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 and we are going to form an array out of it, right? So this is what an array of lists look like. Now some of you might ask what happens if nodes are not numbered one, two, three, suppose they are numbered as Delhi, Mumbai, Jaipur, in that case, in, instead of using an array of lists, you can also create a hash map right? where the key is a string and the value is a list of string that is also possible, right? That is also a way to implement a adjacency list. So in, in case of zero based numbering, it becomes easy because array indexes are numbers themselves. But if you have something complex like Delhi, Mumbai, Jaipur, Ahmedabad, you can also use a hash map in place of it, right? So I hope you are able to understand this concept. Now let us talk about advantages, advantages of this representation. So the ad first advantage is efficient storage. We are not wasting any space, unlike we did in adjacency matrix, right? So we are only storing the value of edges where the edges actually exist. So it is efficient in terms of storage, right? They are also useful for storing sparse graphs. That means, um, which have much lesser edges compared to like what will be a dense graph. So if you have five, edge, five vertices and you have, let's say V square edges in that case, that means every node is connected with everyone. In that case, adjacency matrix can be easily used, right? But if you have five vertices, seven edges, it's kind of a sparse graph, right? Number of edges is much less than V square, right? And the biggest advantage is efficient retrieval of neighbors. So as I told you that this is an important operation than we frequently do in algorithms like BFS and DFS, we can easily find neighbors of any node. So if I ask you, okay, find neighbors of three, what do you need to do? You need to go to array of three, which is an order one operation. And then you need to iterate on this list. So basically in order of neighbors time, if three has three neighbors out of hundred nodes, you can get those three neighbors in three units of time. You don't have to traverse the whole list of uh, nodes, right? So this is a very efficient operation because of these two reasons. It is a very widely used one is efficient storage. Second is efficient retrieval of neighbors. This makes adjacency list a popular choice for graph representation and is used in many algorithms such as BFS, DFS, shortest path algorithms and much more. Now let us discuss implementation of adjacency list. So let us start implementing graph using adjacency list. So we are discussing adjacency list implementation for the graph. 
वन थिंग वी नीड इज द नंबर ऑफ वर्ड इज इज नेक्स्ट वॉट डू वी नीड वी नीड एन एरे ऑफ लिंक लिस्ट तो हाउ डू आई क्रिएटेड आई कैन से लिस्ट ऑफ वॉट लिस्ट ऑफ इन टीचर्स इफ आई सिंपली राइट एट जैसे लिस्ट दिस मेक्स वन लिस्ट ऑब्जेक्ट बट आई नीड अ एरे राइट नाउ आई नीड टू इनिशलाइज दिस एरे इन साइड ओके दिस विल बी इन टीचर हेयर राइट बिकॉज माई कलेक्शन डज नॉट एक्सेप्ट प्रिमेटिव डेटा टाइप्स आई नीड टू इनिशलाइज दिस ऑब्जेक्ट इन द कंस्ट्रक्टर इट सेल्फ वॉट इज द साइज ऑफ दिस लिस्ट दैट विल बी नोन वेन वी आर क्रिएटिंग द ग्राफ ऑब्जेक्ट सो आई कैन गेट द नंबर ऑफ वर्टिस एंड आई कैन से दिस डॉट वी इक्वल्स वी एंड आई कैन से दिस डॉट एडजस्ट इन द लिस्ट दिस इज इक्वल टू न्यू लिंक लिस्ट ऑफ इंटीजर and how many objects i do, do i need i need b number of objects okay so i have created an array in which this adjacency list right but right now this object is not created right only an array is created so what i need to create i need to create a linked list at each index so how do i do it so i can say okay i will iterate over this I equal to zero. I less than v. I plus plus, right? So basically, when I say I'm creating this array, that means the array bucket can hold the address of a linked list. But right now, that is null, right? So what do I want? I want this bucket to hold the address of a linked list object. So how do I create this linked list object? I have to use new, right? I have to say adjacent to list of i. This is equal to new linked list. this actually creates an array in which each element is a linked list object right so this is the correct way of constructing a adjacent list now what do i need to do i need to add elements into the linked list right so i will have a function called void add edge so edges from u to v what do i do now i can say okay if there is an edge from u to v what should i will do and maybe i can accept is it a undirected graph right if it is true i will also add an edge from v to u right so i can say uh, adjacency list of u dot add v something like this and if it is a undirected graph i can say adjacency list of v so oh, it will be boolean right boolean is in c++ adjacency list of v dot add something like this basically what i'm saying that go and add an edge from 1 comma 2 so 0 1 2 3 2 so in first link list it will add 2 and in second list it will add 1 then i say okay go and add 1 comma 3 so in first list it will add 3 and in third list it will add 1 something like this basically if one is connected with 2 one is connected with 3 if i read this i see one's neighbors are 2 and 3 right so if i write it little more clearly so 2 and 3 they have been added into the linked list which is at the first position right so this is how the add edge function looks like then i can display the graph so i can write the two string method which is auto generated and here similar to the previous case normal two string will not work i want to iterate deeply into, into the data structure i will use deep to string method and this adjacency list will be converted into a string like representation that i can print now let us come to our main which is here and i have created a graph right i'm i'm trying to add edges in it and i'm trying to print it so this i have already written before so i'm just going to run this and you can see the graph class we have just constructed now right let us try to visualize this graph so one is connected with two fine undirected graph zero is connected with three okay one is connected with three and two is connected with three so this is how the graph looks like and now if you talk about the adjacency list so zero is connected with three okay one one is connected with two and three so one is connected with two and three that that's correct so list of one it is storing the neighbors of 1 list of 2 so 2 is connected with 1 and 3 absolutely correct what about 3 3 is connected with 
zero, one, and two. So three. It just sends a list of three storing neighbors of three. This is how this two D array. Okay, it's 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 not a two D array. It's a uh, it's a array of linked lists, right? Each linked list is denoting the neighbors of the ith node, right? That is the JSON list implementation. I hope you are able to understand this implementation. So pretty easy, nothing fancy, nothing difficult. And if you have uh, more complex data, as I told you, instead of having this, you can also have a hash map where key is your um, this this will become your key, and this will be added into the list corresponding to that key, right? That's all for uh, this implementation. Okay, so we have discussed the most commonly used implementations of the graph: adjacency list, adjacency matrix, edge list. There is one more representation that is sometimes convenient for certain type of problems. Okay, so sometimes we are given a graph in which we are saying, okay, there is a two D matrix, and it is given that each cell is connected with, let's say, the four neighbors, something like this. or each connect cell is connected in the four neighbors which are of the similar color right and you have to do something right so in this case what you have to do you do not need to construct a graph you can directly deal with the matrix right so if i say okay uh, what are the neighbors of this one either it will be four way connectivity it will be mentioned in the question then you can go in these directions or it can be eight way connectivity that means the diagonal directions are also included this kind of representation is helpful in some alg algorithms like flood fill right so what is happening in flood fill there is a 2d image which is uh, made up of some pixel values right so you are filling the color until you hit the black boundary and how are you finding the neighbors you are going in this four way connectivity or doing the eight way connectivity right so this is not possible for every type of graph but certain problems where graph could represent an image right or the neighbors have this kind of relationship where they can be represented using a 2d array right so we will deal with these kind of problems in the series and i hope you learned a lot of concepts from today's video so let us talk about graph traversal first what is actually is a graph traversal so graph traversal also known as graph search is a way or is a process of visiting each vertex in a graph such traversals as i told you are classified into two types one is bfs which stands for breadth first search and it is a iterative way to traverse the graph and second one is a recursive way called depth first search in this tutorial we'll focus on bfs and its applications so bfs actually has many applications and one of the most commonly used application is finding shortest paths in undirected graphs we'll also look at such applications in this tutorial so let us start talking about bfs so it is a technique for traversing a finite graph that means the number of nodes in the graph would be finite and the way it works is it visits the sibling nodes before visiting the child vertices so what does it means if you have something like a node a and it has children like b and c and then you have some children like d and e and so on the way it works is if you look at in the form of a tree suppose this graph is a tree now this is not a tree because i'm added one more edge here so the way it works is it will visit this node then it will come at b but it will visit sibling of b that is c next so it will visit bc then it will visit de fg and so on so in a way if you look at in the form of a tree tree like traversal it is like a level order traversal that we have done in a tree but in a graph it will be quite similar but there is one catch the catch is graph contains a cycle right so we have to make sure that we are not visiting a node which is already visited for example from this node 1 if you visit 2 and 2 is connected with 3 3 is connected with 1 so there is a cycle so if you say okay i will visit 1 i'll visit children of 1 that is 2 i'll visit 3 from 3 now you cannot go and visit 1 again right so this is something we have to make sure is handled properly by our algorithm so before i dive deep into the algorithm or into the code let us try to understand some applications of bfs so bfs is can be used to find all the vertices within a connected component so we want to see what parts of the gra graph are connected it is also used to finding shortest path between two vertices in case of a 
undirected graph that means all the edges sorry unweighted graph that means all the edges they have equal weight there is no weight assigned to any edge if the, it is a weighted graph then we have to use a different algorithm it can be used to check a graph for bipartiteness it can be used for cycle dete detection in undirected graphs it is also used in ford fulkerson algorithm for maximum flow it is also used in serialization deserialization of binary tree it is also used in maze generation algorithms and it can also be used in algorithms like flood fill so there are many many applications and that is why understanding this algorithm becomes very important so let us now dive deep into the algorithm now suppose a graph like this is given so what kind of graph it is in my case it is a unweighted graph and it is also a undirected graph that means edges don't have any specific direction if 0 and 2 are connected 2 and 0 are also connected so we can go both sides right so now in this algorithm what is the input the input is a source vertex that means you are given a starting point from the, that point you have to traverse the whole graph the starting point point could be zero it could be three it could be six it could be any node so just to keep things simple i'm going to take zero as my starting point right and let me also draw the adjacent list that could be possibly a uh, input for this algorithm so that means zero is connected with two and one one is connected with zero and four the so neighbors of one are zero and four neighbors of 2 are 0 3 and 4 so 0 3 and 4 neighbors of 3 they are 2 and 6 neighbors of 4 they are 1 6 5 so i'll write it as 1 5 6 then i have neighbors of uh, 5 which are only 4 and neighbors of 6 which are 3 and 4 right one thing i told you that if you start from this node right so what we need to do we need to we'll be using a queue in this algorithm you will understand why this queue is going to be very very helpful let me draw a data structure here which is a queue apart from it we will also need something to maintain whether a node has been visited or not right because the graph contains a cycle and it is possible that we are coming to the same node again and again right so this is a queue it is a empty queue as of now the queue you you know it has a fifo property first in first out property right it is a fifo queue here and apart from it i am making one more data structure which is going to denote whether a node has been visited or not so 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 i think this is sufficient we don't need so we will mark whether a node is visited or not so right now it is nothing is marked nothing is visited we'll start from this node that is the source node let's just assume the source node is zero we'll mark it and we will put it into the queue zero has been visited zero goes into the queue and i am going to mark it as visited so here the circle denotes the queue has been visited now what you will do next you will look at this adjacency list you will find out the neighbors of zero the neighbors of zero are two and one so you will pop this node out the node is zero you will look at neighbors of zero that is two and one you will mark them as visited and put put them put them into the queue so you from zero you can easily visit two and you can easily visit one so what i'm trying to do is i'm marking one and two as visited and i'm putting one and two into the queue so first i visited two and then i visited one both of them they are into the queue that means i have marked one and two as visited now what you will do next nothing you simply have to pop out a node from the queue every time and do the same process again so now you will remove two look at the neighbors of two which are zero three and four so now zero is already visited so you do not do any work at zero then three and four three is not visited you can visit three so mark three as visited put it into the queue and mark four as visited and put it into the queue okay now two is gone two has been removed next node you will get from the queue it is going to be one so you will remove one from the queue and you will mark neighbors of one as visited so neighbors of one zero and four 
तो लुक एट जीरो जीरो इज ऑलरेडी विजिटेड फोर फोर इज ऑल्सो नेबर फोर इज ऑलरेडी विजिटेड तो यू डू नॉट डू एनी वर्क तो यू डू नॉट डू एनी वर्क राइट तो इन द मीन वेल यू कैन प्रिंट द नोट दैट यू हैव सीन सो फार सो यू हैव सीन जीरो यू हैव सीन टू यू हैव सीन वन नेक्स्ट यू विल पॉप आउट थ्री तो रिमूव दिस नोट प्रिंट दिस नोट लुक एट द नेबर्स टू एंड सिक्स टू इज ऑलरेडी विजिटेड डू नथिंग एट टू सिक्स इज नॉट विजिटेड तो मार्क सिक्स एज विजिट पुट इट इन टू द क्यू तो यू हैव टू यू हैव ट्रेवर्स्ड सिक्स एज वेल तो सिक्स इज नाउ ऑल्सो इन टू द क्यू नेक्स्ट यू विल पॉप फोर तो प्रिंट फोर लुक एट नेबर्स ऑफ फोर फोर नेबर इज वन विच इज ऑलरेडी विजिटेड इट्स नेबर इज फाइव विच इज नॉट विजिटेड तो यू विल विजिट इट पुट इट इन टू द क्यू सिक्स इज ऑलरेडी विजिटेड नथिंग टू डू हेयर राइट नेक्स्ट यू विल गेट सिक्स फ्रॉम द क्यू रिमूव इट प्रिंट इट एंड नाउ लुक एट नेबर्स ऑफ सिक्स सिक्स नेबर इज ओनली थ्री एंड फोर राइट but both of them they are visited so you will not do any work so next you will remove 5 5 neighbor is 4 so this is also removed 4 is already visited hence you do not do any work and now what you can say is that your traversal is done right your traversal is done so what happened during this traversal so we visited each node once and in the worst case we are traveling through all edges Once, right? So what we have done, like we have traveled through 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 some edges, and we also checked that from four I can go to one. So we did check this edge, right? We did check this edge. One was already visited, so we did not mark anything here, right? So we did not mark it anything here. So what I'm trying to say is, when you are running this algorithm, each vertex is going into the queue once, and is it is coming out of the queue once, and when you are finding the neighbors of a node. You are traveling through all the edges, right? So all the edges are being covered at most twice. For example, neighbor of four is six, neighbor of six is four. So each edge is counted at most two times. So if I talk about the overall time complexity of this algorithm, it will be linear in terms of number of nodes and number of edges. This is what we are doing, right? So I hope you have understood the basic BFS idea. next we will look at the implementation and code this algorithm so let us discuss the implementation of bfs i already have the boiler plate code ready which uh, is basically adding edges into the graph so the bfs function is something that i am going to write now so return type is void we do not want to return anything the method name is bfs but what we we may expect as input is one source node from which we should start doing the bfs for this graph so this is the graph so i told you we will be needing two data structures one to maintain whether a node has been visited or not so i can maintain a boolean visited array and this will be a array of size v where v is the number of vertices in the graph next thing i will need would would be a data structure q so in java we have q as a interface so i'll create a linked list which provides me with the implementation of q as well so link list of integers we will just call it as q and i will say this is equal to new link list all right so that are the these are the data structures that we will be needing now let's start with the algorithm so in the first step what i will do i will start with the source node mark it as visited push it into the queue so i have to do three things mark it as visited so visited of source is going to be true so i will say okay this is going to be true and then i will traverse the neighbors of this node so first thing i will do is i will push this into the queue so i can say queue dot add last the node as source okay and second thing i will do is i will mark this as visited so visited of source this is going to be Now what can I do now? I can say while my queue is not empty, so I will stop once all the nodes have been popped out. So how do I add into the queue and remove from the queue? So you know, if you have to add something into the queue, that addition will happen from the ending. So add last, and if you have to remove something from the beginning, so we can call remove first method. So I can say okay, 
the node at the front of the queue so that is int node this is going to be queue dot remove first all right now what can i do i can say okay for this node the so node that i've removed from the queue is zero right so i need to traverse what are the neighbors of zero so zero's neighbors are there in adjacency list so they are one and two so what i need to do i need to traverse on these neighbors if the neighbors are not visited i will mark them as visited and i will push them into the queue so this is what i do so i can say okay for every neighbor okay so to get the neighbors what we can do we can use iterator so i can create a iterator of the type integer and call it something like iterate it and now i can say give me the neighbors of this particular node so if you know then uh, this is the adjacency list i so i want to iterate on this adjacency list of the node so i can say okay while it dot has next that means the next node is present basically it, it is a way to iterate on the adjacency list sorry you have to call a method called list iterator because we are iterating on the linked list so zeros zeros neighbors are one and two right so these are stored in a list which is which was a list object so adjacency list of node is a list we have to get the iterator using this method list iterator so it will iterate over these nodes until the list is uh, not finished so it will go over these neighbors now i want to get the node right so how do i get the node i can say okay the neighboring node is nothing but it dot next that is the neighboring node and now what i need to do if it is not visited if not visited neighbor what do i need to do i need to mark it as visited i can say visited of neighbor this is equal to true and i need to add it into the queue so i can say queue dot add last and the item is neighbor we are iterating over all the neighbors and if the neighbor is not visited we simply mark it as visited and we push it into the so i hope this should suffice and one more thing we can do in the while loop is we can print out the node we can see what output do we really get so i can say s out node now let us test our algorithm on the graph i have already constructed so let me show you in graph main i will go and this is the graph same as uh, this graph and now we are going to run bfs function on it so i can say g dot bfs let's say the source node is zero so let's go and run this code and see what output do we get we should get all the nodes from zero to six because we are doing a graph traversal let's see the output okay we got an error index six out of bounds for an array of length four okay so here we have to give uh, we have seven nodes actually input needs to be fixed okay so this is our adjacency list and we are getting zero one four three six five so we are getting all the nodes that means the graph traversal is correct now the exact output will also depend upon the way you have stored these nodes okay so you said okay zero's neighbors are one and two after zero it will print one and then two but if you say in my adjacent list i will store two and one first that means i will add this edge before this edge then the output will be zero to one and so on so right now our goal was to visit all the nodes which are which can be reached from node zero so we are getting zero one two four three six and five that means this output is correct we are able to reach all the seven nodes including zero now let us discuss one application of finding the shortest path from the source node to all other nodes okay so what we are going to do we are going to do shortest path from source to all other nodes in a undirected graph in a unweighted graph unweighted 
graph. So this graph is an example of an unweighted graph. So graph can be directed or undirected, but it must be an unweighted graph for the BFS algorithm to work for finding the shortest path. Right? So we are going to talk about BFS shortest path algorithm. So the algorithm is very simple and it is very similar to just doing BFS. So let us try to visualize what we are doing in BFS. We are starting from node 0 and we can mark the distance of 0 as 0 and from 0 we are visiting the nodes 1 and 2. Since we are visiting a node for the first time, we will be updating their distance and we will be saying this distance is 1 and this distance is also 1 because we are coming from 0 and 0's distance is 0. Next you know in the queue what you have done, you have said okay 0 is there, then you pushed 1 and you pushed 2 and so on. Right? Now next next item you will pick is 1 and you will update the neighbors of 1. Neighbors of 1 is let's say 4 and 0. 0 is already visited so you will not go there. So you will say okay since I am visiting 4 via 1 this distance must be 2. So distance of 4 I can say distance of uh, the neighbor is 1 more than the distance of the parent. So parent is 1. Okay. So distance of parent. Parent node is 1, child node is 4 or the neighbor node is 4. 4's distance is 1 more than the parent. So I will visit 4 and I will push 4 into the queue. So next I will remove 2. So 2's neighbors are 0 already visited. 3. 3 is not visited. So I can visit 3 and I can say okay this distance is going to be 2. So I will push 3 into the queue and 2's neighbors is also 4. But 4 is already visited so we will not update it. So it is not possible that you are reaching a node later which is already visited and the distance will get minimum. It's not possible in case of a unweighted graph. If it would have been weighted graph this was this could have been possible right. Now 4 is already visited and since you are reaching from 2 again node is already visited. So this distance will be either greater or equal to 2. So it is we will not update it. So we will not do anything at 4. So 2 is done. 2 has done its work. Next we will pop out 4 and 4 can now update its children. So 4 children are 6. So this distance is 3. So you push 6 and 4 can also update 5. So this distance is also you can push 5. Next you can pop out 3. Now 3 again it will try to visit 6 but 6 is already visited. So hence you don't do any work. Then you try to pop out uh, 6. So you can remove 6 easily but there are no nodes, no neighbors of 6 which are not visited. Then you pop out 5, there are no neighbors of 5 which are not visited. So if you look at these values, you will find that these are the shortest distances from 0 to all these nodes. These are the shortest distances from 0 to all these nodes. So that means distance of 0 is 0, distance of 1 is 1, distance of 2 is 1. Distance of 3 is 2, distance of 4 is 2, distance of 5 it is 3 and distance of 6 it is 3. So one observation we can make out from here is that BFS visits nodes in increasing order of their distance from the source node. This no distance was 0. These two distances were 1. These two distances were 2 and these two distances were 3. Right? So this is an observation. right? So when I said you can get any ordering so that means between these distances the ordering can change so bfs might produce an output like 0 to 1 it might produce 4 3 it might produce 3 4 5 6 might get 5 6 or 6 5 right so different orders but the distances of these nodes will be in 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 increasing order from the source node so that is how we can find shortest path from source to all other nodes in a unweighted graph by simply using the BFS. In the next part, we'll show you the code changes that we need to do for this algorithm. So it is very simple. Take a moment, pause the video and think what changes you will make into the code. All right. So let us discuss the code changes. Now, apart from the visited array, what you need to do? You need to maintain a distance array. The distance of each node from the source node. So you can say, okay, I need a distance array, which is uh, of size v and in the beginning you can say distance of source 
you can update that distance of source as zero and the rest is very simple as you are uh, visiting more and more nodes you need to update the distance so you can say okay i'm going to visit the neighboring node so when i'm visiting this neighboring node i can say distance of this neighboring node is one more than the distance of the node that is parent of this node so that node is nothing but this node so this node is distance of node so that's it now what we can do in the same function maybe we can either return the distance array or we can just print the distance array so here i can say uh, let's just iterate over the distance array for i equal to zero i less than v i plus plus i can show the node which is going to be i followed by the distance which is distance of i so let's go and run this code and we should see we are getting node 0 at distance 0 1 at 1 2 at 1 3 at 2 4 at 2 5 and 6 they are at distance 3 this is how easy it is to make changes in the code and now we have made shortest path algorithm using bfs now some of you might be wondering that okay we have figured out the shortest path but we have only figured out the distance actually what if i actually want to figure out the exact path from let's say 0 to some node 5 right maybe i want to find out what is the shortest path should i go like this or should i go like this or should i go like this what will be the shortest path from source to destination in a unweighted graph so again this thing is very simple so what we were doing we were doing bfs 0 was visiting 1 and 2 1 was visiting 4 2 was visiting 3 and 3 was visiting 6 no i think it was like this 4 was visiting 5 and 6 and then uh, 3 something like this fitted right so now again if you want to find out the shortest path to reach 5 you will know that okay 5 was visited from 4 4 was visited from 1 and 1 was visited from 0 right what you can get you can you can actually store the parent so you can store parent of 5 is 4 parent of 4 is 1 parent of 1 it's 0 and parent of 0 is let's say 0 or minus 1 and Any, anything you can put so what you can do you can store these parents for every node and then you can do trace back you can say okay i'll start from 5 and okay from where i should go so this is my destination node who is the parent of 5 how do we arrive at 5 we came from 4 so i can go to this node okay how do i came at 4 i came from 1 so i, I can go to this node how do i came at 0 I will go to zero okay how do i came at one i came from zero so i go to zero who is the parent of zero minus one that means we have uh, finished the entire path in this way you will be able to store five four one zero in an array or in an array list so this way you can also print the shortest path from the source node to the destination node so the only changes in the code you need to make is you need to create a parent array and when you are visiting from a node to, to a neighboring node so you can say okay parent of neighbor will be equal to node something like this and then you can simply put a while loop at the end once all the nodes have been updated your bfs has been done you can say okay while i don't get the source node let me travel back from the destination node so you will travel this way you will travel this way and you will eventually reach the source node so this is something you have to try you have to figure out you have to make the required code changes in the algorithm that we have discussed now we will discuss one application of bfs in solving a problem so we are given a snakes and letters board which looks like this and what we need to do is we need to find out the minimum number of moves that are required to go from source which is from cell 1 to destination which is cell number 36 so first of all we need to de decide whether it is a graph problem so if you look carefully you can analyze that we can clearly see there are 36 vertices there are 36 nodes where you can go so clearly we see vertices but how do we decide the edges right so basically it, it the question says there is a regular dice so on your dice you can throw any number of your choice from 1 2 3 4 5 6 right so the rules of the board are very simple whenever there is a ladder you can climb that ladder 
but whenever there is a snake you will be cut by the snake and you will reach the tail of the snake so for, you can cut down from head of the snake and you can reach the tail this position right so basically like in any snakes and let us go you have snakes which can cut you down and bring bring you down and there are ladders which you can climb and move to the top the question is how many minimum number of dice moves will be required to reach this destination so you can assume there is only one player it's not a two player game so the question is only about finding the minimum number of dice moves now we need to think carefully what kind of graph it is if you analyze carefully you will analyze that if we count the if you look at the dice moves so at one you can throw a one that means you can reach two but at two there is a ladder that means you will reach 15 so if i talk about this edge there is a edge from 1 to 15 in this graph then if at one if you throw a dice two you can reach three there is an edge from one to three also if you throw a three on dice you can reach four that means there is a edge to four as well and all of these edges are directed edges and then if you throw a four you will reach five but on five there is a ladder so that means the edge is from one to seven right and if you throw five you can reach six so that means there is an edge from one to six also right now if you throw six you can also reach seven that means it is the same edge we will not count that edge again again starting from two so two there is a letter so we do not need to do anything then you would go at three so from three again there are edges so there is an edge from three to four if, if you see carefully from three you can go to four and so on from three you can go to seven also from three to seven there is an edge and so on that means how many edges i have so i have approximately six edges starting from each vertex from approximately six edges from each vertex okay so if the vertex is v i can go to v plus 1 i can go to v plus 2 i can go to v plus 3 v plus 4 v plus 5 this would have been the case if there was no snake and no ladder but now what is happening is suppose i go to v plus 1 here there is a starting point of the ladder so that means i will reach at some other position so that means there might be a factor which will add up or which will be subtracted and that factor will come from if there is a ladder at that position or if there is a snake at that position right that is what i'm saying that it is an example of a directed graph it is an exam is, is it a weighted graph the answer is no it is an example of unweighted graph that means all edges are equal because the cost to cover in any edge is dice throw so it does not really depend what number you throw on the die each move is counted as one throw right so if you analyze carefully you will see it it becomes an example of a directed unweighted graph and if it is unweighted graph we can use the bfs shortest path algorithm to find out how do i reach this node right so in this case if i analyze little more carefully i will see from 1 i can go to 15 from 15 i can throw 3 and i can reach 18 18 there is a ladder i can reach 29 in order to reach 29 i just need two moves then I can throw 1 to reach 30 and then I can throw 6 to reach 36. So I guess in 4 moves I can easily finish this game. So I hope the problem statement is clear. Now it's your turn to figure out how do we construct such a graph, take input such a graph. So regarding input you will be given the number of vertices, the number of snakes, the number of ladders as well as the position of the ladder. For example. 2 to 15 there is a ladder 5 to 7 there is a ladder right similarly positions of snakes will be given as pairs 17 to 4 there is a pair right so take a moment to think how do you input such kind of a graph and how do you make your bfs algorithm run on it all right so let us discuss how we are going to build the algorithm so i have written some boilerplate code it's not the complete code so i am going to read some some inputs i'm going to ask enter the number of vertices source and the destination so i'm going to read these three things after that i will create a graph since i know the number of vertices right i can create a graph object or i can do it later on as well that's fine and i'm going to read the number of snakes and their positions so in our scenario we have one two three and four snakes number of snakes in my case are four and these are the positions of the snakes 17 to 4 
so i'm taking in this direction head to tail so that means 17 to 4 if there, there is a snake you look carefully 17 to 4 this is the snake similarly i'm reading the letters in this direction 5 to 7 there is a letter so 5 to 7 there is a letter now the question is how do we like handle this data what should i do with this data so first of all i need to read this and i need to make sure that this data is used in my construction of the graph earlier we were creating a hard coded graph so we'll not do that thing here right so we'll uh, create our own graph so first thing is here i'm just reading the number of snakes i'm not reading what snakes i have so i need to implement logic for that as well right this part i'm going to do it right now so let's try to understand how we will actually create a graph so we'll create a graph object c and we will of course we'll try to add edges to it add edge now in edge you need to know that from where the edge starts and where the edge ends right and it is a directed edge so it's not a uh, undirected graph so i will set this third parameter as false so now if if i talk about vertex 1 so i told you from 1 i can go to let's say vertex i i can go to i plus 1 i can go to i plus 2 i plus 3 i plus 4 i plus 5 i plus 6 and plus something right this value could be zero this value could be positive value this could be negative value what is this something going to be it will depend upon whether there is a snake or a letter starting from that position for example i plus one so at two i have a letter which gives me which actually takes me to 15 right which which is actually taking me to 15 that means i'm getting a jump of 13 right so for example if i is one i take a move of one i reach two and two there is a letter which is giving me a jump of 15 minus two right so basically there is a letter so the delta that is given by the letter right so if i go to let's say uh, i i plus three so there is no letter here so this delta will be zero this delta will be zero i plus four i reach five at five i actually reach seven so this delta is two how do i compute this delta this delta i have to compute and store it in an array i have to compute and store it in an array so that means in an edge this becomes a starting point and this becomes the ending point of the edge so this delta is very easy to compute for example you are given there there is a letter from 2 to 15 you can easily say okay i'm going to store it in some kind of array let's create a board array right so it's it's a 1d array of 36 positions and in each position i'm going to store a delta if someone says okay there is a letter from 2 to 15 that means at the second position in this array i can store 15 minus 2 that is 13 so at the second index in this array i can store 13 so if there is a snake at uh, let's say 32 which takes me at 30 so let us assume this index is 32 so at 32 i get a delta of minus 2 so if i reach 32 effectively i reach 30 so 32 minus 2 so this is how i am going to do it once all the edges have been inserted into the graph i can easily run bfs on it so let us try to insert all these edges in, into our graph so what i'm going to do i'm going to run a loop let's say for i equal to zero i less than snakes i plus plus i can say okay snake has a head and snake has a tail so i'm going to read these values so i can say head equal to um scanner dot next int tail equal to scanner dot next int and i'm also going to create a board array so the board array can be created here so int board and this is equal to new int how many so i'm going to do v plus one because it is a one based indexing here so i've created a board array oh i have to move this code here because v is not input yet so this board array will come here or you can do it like this that's fine that's fine board array is now created so now when when i'm reading the snakes right so i have to update the board array so i can say okay board of head so in case of snake the snake is going to bite from the head right the so board of head will store a value that is equal to because now it is giving you a decrement so from 17 you are going going at 4 right let's look look once again from 17 you are going at 4 the so board of 17 should say that my value is nothing but 4 minus 
17 so this value should be minus 13 so this is how it should be so it should be equal to tail minus head so tail is a small value head is a large value so this value needs to be negative this will update the board array for uh, snakes similarly we need to update the board array for letters and we will utilize this array while constructing the graph i will show you how make a similar loop i have the letters instead of snakes here i will have letters now the letters are given in this fashion bottom to top so letter also has a head and it also has a tail so tail is this number is smaller this number is bigger tail minus head would be a positive number here that is fine so i think board array looks fine so i can just display you the board array as well so i can say s out arrays dot two string and i can give the board array now i have this board array i have these delta increments again i need to figure out how do i insert all the edges now that thing is fairly simple you need to go to every vertex and create the next six edges that will start from that vertex for example if i start from five or if i start from i i can go to i plus one plus board of this position that you have reached if you do five plus let's say some number five or 5 plus 4 you reach 9 but 9 is not the end position you actually reach 27 right i plus 2 plus board of this position i plus 3 up to up to i plus 6 basically from ith node where i can go so here i'm going to use the board array to decide where i can actually go so this will be board of i plus 1 board of i plus 2 and so on so let's see here as well so let's create the graph now so i have graph g how many vertices i have i have v vertices so i'll just keep v plus one because it is one based so we we are also adding zero here this is equal to new graph new graph of v plus one vertices all right i have to add edges right so i can say okay for int let's say source which starts from or let's say I'm going to add edge from i to something. So i to some j. Okay. So if i goes from, I can start from source, which is one, the smallest node. I can go till less than destination. That is my last node, i plus plus. So I'm going at every node. Then I can throw a dice at every node. I can throw one, two, three, four, five, six. So I can throw a dice. So dice can take a value one. The maximum value dice can take is 6 and I can say dice plus plus. So what is the node that where I am reaching? The, the jth node is uh, i plus dice. right? But this is not final. I also have to add delta. So I can say okay, j equal to uh, j plus board of j. So in this value, what I am saying is from i you throw a die, you reach i plus dice. Now at this position, it is possible that there is a ladder. The ladder gives you a jump of 13. So you have to add this factor also that is stored in board of J. But if there is a snake that takes you down, so you have to decrement this value also. That addition subtraction is already handled in the board array. Now if J is less than equal to destination, that means I do not want to add any edge that goes out of the board. So I can say G dot add edge. So U is my I. B is my J and uh, it is a, it is not an undirected graph. So this value is going to be set to be, so this completes the graph creation process. Now what we need to do, we need to run BFS algorithm on it. So we, as you know, we have already implemented the BFS algorithm. So I'll just copy this code and tweak it a little bit so that we can do it for this particular problem. So I can say BFS dot S path. So in this case, I am getting source. I am also getting the destination. So if the user is interested in finding out uh, the minimum number of moves, so you do not need to print distance at every node. You can simply return the distance of destination, and you can change the return type to integer. This can be done. 
now one thing might ask is user might ask you to give the path also so as i discussed with you along with the visited array you can create a parent array as well and you can say okay this is equal to new new integer of v and here you can say okay for first node that is my source node the parent is let's say minus one so parent of source this is minus one or you can set this is the source itself something like this so that you can know right so right now i can I, i'm just saying this is going to be minus one and whenever you visit a node you can set the parent parent of neighbor is going to be the node now as i told you you can backtrack and you can find out the complete path as well so let us discuss that thing as well if you want to do the path printing that is fairly simple you can start from the destination node let's say 36 now 36 nodes from where i was visited so maybe the parent of 36 is 30 right so i can start from this node reach this node again ask the parent go back go back and so on i can trace the path until i hit one or minus one something like that so i can say fine uh, i take a temporary value which is destination and i can say while parent of destination or while parent of temp is not equal to minus one what do i do i say okay fine i will print out the destination i will print out the temporary node so basically what i'm saying is the temporary node is this temporary node is 36 i will print it out and i will go here this will become the new temporary node but how do i update this temporary node so be fairly simple temp equal to parent of temp at every node i take it back to the parent so this is basically going back to the previous node in the path how it was discovered then i'm saying return the distance of the destination now let us go and run this code i think it should be fine yeah it, it seems fine so let us try to execute the code so i've given the input i've just combined the input and i'm giving it but now i'm getting an error actually i'll tell you what what is the error so it is saying exception in thread main index 38 out of bounds so in main they, this is the array so this is going out of bounds why this is happening because if you add something to let's say node 35 you say okay i, can, I will take a jump of 3 you will actually reach 38 so actually i'm checking it here so instead this check should be done here right so when I'm doing this value, J, when I'm computing this J, so I should do this thing here. If J is less than equal to destination, then I should do J equal to board of J. And again, I should check if J is, you can do it here. Yeah, that is fine. So if J is now less than equal to destination, then you can actually add that edge. I think this would be okay. Or you can do uh, two conditions here, right? So you, you need to check that see what is happening is i added something here i said okay 35 plus 2 or 35 or let's say 33 plus 2 okay and suppose there was a letter here right it might it's not going to take you out but what i'm checking is that when i'm adding this value board of j j must be less than destination and when i'm adding the edge that edge must be less than destination let me run the code okay so i think i commented out the shortest path Let's rerun this code and uh, it should be good to go now. So we do not need to print each and every node while traversal, right? One more attempt and then we should be good to go. So we are doing BFS. We are printing the output of traversal, which we don't want. So let's paste the code. And here we are getting, yes, this is the correct output. So we are getting the path and we are getting the shortest length that is going to be 4 if i show you this is the path that we are getting from 1 we went to 15 29 30 and 36 and it took four number of moves four moves were required to cover this you can verify also 1 15 29 30 36 from 1 we went to 15 then we went to 29 then we went to 30 and then we went to 36 yes these are the four moves that were used so I really hope you understood this algorithm really well 
and the application of VFS we have seen through this problem. Let's try to understand this algorithm called depth first search or sometimes called as depth first traversal. So it's an algorithm for traversing the graph or searching the graph. It can be used on tree. So on tree, the pre-order traversal that you have done, it's actually a depth first search. The algorithm starts at root node. So in, in case of graph, there is no root node. So you can arbitrarily you can select any node as the root node and or you can have a, some specific node and you have to explore as far as possible along each branch before doing the backtracking. So we'll try to understand this through an example. And of course, this algorithm, since you are doing it recursively, uses extra memory, which is usually a stack. So if you're using a stack in case of recursion, it will be created automatically. Even if you are doing this algorithm iteratively, you can maintain a stack like data structure and do the work, which is needed to keep track of nodes discovered so far along a specific branch, which helps in the backtracking in the graph. We'll understand this concept while, when we are running through the algorithm. And this DFS has many applications. Some of the applications I've listed down here. It is used in finding out connected components. You can also use BFS here. Basically you want to look at what components of the graph they are connected. So for example, if this is a graph, this whole thing is one graph. It has two connected components. So you can do a traversal from this node, which will actually visit this whole component. And you can do a traversal from maybe this node, which will visit this whole component. So we'll do a separate tutorial on connected components, topological sorting, it can be used. It, it is also used in finding out bridges in a graph. Cycle detection, it can be used. We'll look at cycle detection in this tutorial. Strongly connected components is a different concept which is used in directed graphs. So DFS again is used there and it can be used to solve puzzles with only one solution such as mazes. Maybe you want to find out a path in a maze. Maybe there is only one solution. So you can easily use DFS along with backtracking to find out that particular path. It can be used in maze generation with the randomized DFS algorithm and it can also be used in finding by connectivity in graphs. So let us try to understand the algorithm next. So DFS can also be used on a tree. So if you have this tree, so what this DFS will do, will it will start from let's say root node. It will go in this direction here, here, here. Then it will backtrack and it will enter into these branches. So it's just like a pre-order traversal that we have done on trees. But in case of graphs, the situation is little different. Why? Because graphs can contain a cycle. So we have to see what to do in case of a graph. Let us try to understand with the help of this graph, how DFS will actually work. Let me draw the adjacency list as well. That will be input. And that is how the graph is actually stored. With zero, we have the neighbors which are one and two. With one, we have the neighbors zero and four. With two, we have the neighbors zero, three and four. With three, we have the neighbors two and six. With four, we have the neighbors one, two and six. Five, we have only one neighbor that is four. With six, we have two neighbors that are three and four. So this is how the adjacent list of the graph will look like. Now we need to understand how this DFS is actually going to work. So we are going to start from this node. It can be any node. So I'm going to take zero as the starting node from the source node. And now since the graph can, can contain a cycle, I need to maintain a visited array. So I'm just drawing it here. So initially nothing is visited. So this is a visited array. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So I need this much array, right? I'll, I'll call it visited. This will help me to ensure that I do not visit the same node again. If it is already visited, we'll just backtrack. We'll go back. So I start with zero. I said, fine. I will mark this as visited. And since it's going to be recursive algorithm, so this node is in the stack. Now zero can say, okay, what are my neighbors? Neighbor of zero is one. So it will pick this node, the first node. I will try to iterate, but first I picked one. And I will make a DFS recursive call on one. So I will go to this node. So I'll mark one as visited. So one is in the stack also. And now from one, I can go to some neighbors, right? So one's neighbors are zero. So zero is already visited. So I'll not go here. I will, if I go, I just come back, right? So I, I say, okay, this 
or I will not go. So this node is not visited. This zero is already visited. So I will not make a call. But what about four? Four is visited. So I'm iterating on this list. So four is visited, right? So I make a four is not visited. I make a call on four. So I go and visit this node four. So four is marked as visited and four goes into the stack. So I think on the diagram, you should also see a zero here right? before one. You have a zero, right? So this, this portion got little cropped out from the screen So zero one four. This is how the stack looks like at the moment at four. I again do the same work. I look at what are the neighbors of four. The neighbor of four is one, which is visited. So don't do any work. The neighbor is two, which is not yet visited. Now what four will do four will visit two. I'll go and visit this node. So two is visited and two is now part of the stack. Now at two, I look at what are the neighbors? The neighbor is zero, which is visited. The neighbor is three, which is not yet visited. So I go to three, this node. So I mark this three as visited and I come to three. So what are neighbors of three? So it is two and six. So two is visited. I don't do any work. Six is not visited. So I go and visit six. I go here. So six is marked as visited. So three is, three is in the stack. Six is in the stack. Right? Now at six, I look at the neighbors. The neighbors is three, which is visited. Don't do any work. Another neighbor is four, which is also visited. So don't do any work. Now what I can do. So six is already visited and six does not have a neighbor, which is not yet visited. Right? So what you will do, you will go back. This is important. So this is backtracking. So you come back at three. So from six, you are now coming back at three. So six is popped from the stack. Now at three, you look at, I was running a loop. I was trying to traverse the neighbors and I already went and explored six. So this is over. So from three, I cannot go anywhere else. This list is over. So I will just go back. I will backtrack. I will come back at two. So at two, I see, okay, I was at, I went to three, three is visited. Can I go to four? Four is also visited. So I cannot go to four So two's neighbor have been visited so I can say, okay, just let's just go back from two. I go back to the previous node. So before two, I, I came from four. So I come back at four. So this is backtracking. Now at four, I can say, okay, I went to two. So two is visited. What about six? Oh, sorry. What about five? So this neighbor is five. Actually four has a neighbor that is five. Four has neighbors one, two, six and five. Five and six actually four neighbors. It has one, two, three, four. Yeah. Four has four neighbors. So it will look at five. Can I visit five? The answer is yes. I can visit five. So four will make a call at five and five will say, okay, I'm visited now. So if I talk about the order, right? So it, it was like zero, one, two, three, six, and then uh, sorry, zero, one, zero, one, four, two, three, zero, one, four two, three, six. And now you are actually visiting five, right? You're now visiting five from six. You come back three, you come back to two, you come back to four. And now four will say, okay, four has a neighbor that is five. It is not yet visited. It will go and visit it. And five will say, okay, I can only go to four, but four is visited. Hence I will go back. So it will simply return. I, I go back to four. Now four says, okay, five is visited. What about six? Six is also visited. Six is not visited by four, but it is visited by three. So it will not go to six also. Now four says, okay, all my neighbors have been done. I will go back. It will come back at now one, right? So here after four, you went to five, five is over, four is over. Now you come back at one, one says, okay, all my neighbors have been visited. Now I will just pop. I will come back at zero. Now in the stack. You are in this function zero zero says fine. All my neighbors one is visited. Now zero looks at two, two is also marked visited in this array. So it says, okay, my list is also finished. So I'll just go back. So this is also popped off from the call stack. This is how the DFS algorithm works. And given this adjacency list, this will be the output that we will get. So the idea was to traverse all the nodes and this is what we will get by traversing all the nodes. Okay. So I hope you understood the algorithm fairly simple. If the graph has multiple different components, then we will see 
that you need to initiate DFS from one node in each component. Okay, so this is something easy that can be done later on. But first of all, we'll focus on this simple DFS algorithm where we are assuming there is only one component. Okay, so we are assuming one component in the graph as of now. So let us code this algorithm next. Let us look at the implementation of DFS in Java. So I already have the graph class which is implemented in the previous tutorials. So in this, I'm going to add a DFS method and this is going to accept the source node from where I'm going to start the DFS. So I'm assuming there is a single component in the graph. So what I need to do. So firstly, I need to build a visited array. That is the data structure we will be needed. So we can keep things simple. We can create a Boolean visited array and this is going to be of size V that is the number of vertices in the graph. So initially everything will be set to false and in Java by default, a Boolean array is false. Now I actually want to do this traversal recursively. So I cannot make this as a recursive function because I cannot create this array again and again in the recursive function. So what I want, I want this array to be shared across all the function calls that I'm making so for that is why I need to create another function which is going to help this DFS I can call that as DFS helper and here I'm going to get the source node or the node the current node where I am and the boolean visited array so this array will be passed and it will be shared across all the function calls right so I can simply make call to DFS helper and I can give source node and the visited array as input to this function right now here what I need to do as soon as I come to a node the first thing I will do is I will mark that node as visited so I can say okay I can print out that node that is fine and I can say visited of that node this is equal to true that yes I have visited this node let us take a small example. Let's say I have one, two, three and four and five. Let's say this is the graph. So if I start from this node, so I will mark this as visited. And now I will look at neighbors of one. So one's neighbors will be, let's say two and four. So I'll iterate on this list and I will go to the neighbor, which is not yet visited. So right now two is not visited. So I'll make a call to two. Okay, so how do I do it? So iterate on this list, we need to create a list iterator. I think this part was not visible. So I'll just hide myself. What I'm saying is that one has neighbors two and four. So I'll make a call at two first. So how do I get that? For that, I need to create a list iterator first. So I can say fine. Let us create a iterator. Iterator of the type integer. Let's call it IT, which is the iterator to iterate on this list. So I can say, okay, it's just in the list of this node, which is let's say zero source in my case dot list iterator. So using this iterator, we can easily iterate. So while I have items in this list, while IT dot as next, what to do? I can say, okay, give me the neighboring node. So the neighboring node, this is given by it dot next. So I will now check is two not visited. Yes, two is not visited. So how do I check? I check from the array. So two is not visited neighbor. Then what to do? I have to make a recursive call. So I can make a call to DFS helper. Give it the node. The node is neighbor and give it the visited array. Right? I'll show you what's going to happen in this scenario. So I have this, let's say one, two, three, four, five. So generally in, in the code, the indexing is assumed to be zero based, but in the example, I took it one based, but hopefully you will understand that part. So I check one is connected with two and four. So two is not yet visited. So one is visited. So as soon as I come to one, I mark one as visited. Then I iterate over the neighbors of one. I check two is not visited. So I make a function call on two. So two is now visited. Now I look at neighbors of two. So two has neighbors, which is one and three. Out of 
this one is already visited so i don't do any work so i'll make a call at 3 so as soon as i come to 3 3 is visited and 3 has neighbors again 2 and 4 so 3 looks at okay 2 is visited so i'll make a call at 4 at 4 i have again neighbors which are 1 and 5 so 4 says okay 1 is visited don't do any work make a call at 5 so 4 visits 5 so 5 is now visited now 5 has only one neighbor 4 which is visited so this loop will not run for 5 because it will iterate on 4 and 4 is already visited so this if will not execute and while will not do any work so you will simply return right so from here we will come back so you come back here right? now at 4 you see 5 is done so list of 4 is also finished so this loop is over 4 goes back to 3 so 3 says okay i can go to 4 this is also done so 3 this loop is also over you go back at 2 so at 2 you have gone to 3 that's also done now suppose there was a node 6 here right so what will happen now 2 will say okay yes i can go to 6 so 2 will go to 6 and 6 will get visited and you will come back right and of course these nodes are also marked visited this loop is also now over now at 2 you will say okay my list is done i will go back so it will go back here now 1 will look at okay can i go to 4 but 4 is already visited hence you do not go you do not make a call at 4 so this edge is not considered and at 1 you can say okay this list is done because 4 is also visited and hence i go back this is how it will go back into the main so in this case the output would look like 1 2 3 4 5 and then you have gone to 6 as well right this is how the dfs is going to get performed using this code now let us test our code is, does it work fine or does it work as expected you have understood dfs on graphs next thing we will learn is how do we do cycle detection on graphs basically we will do this algorithm of cycle detection on two types of graphs one is on undirected graph which is given here and secondly we will do it on directed graphs in which the algorithm will change a little bit so this graph is an example of a undirected graph so now how do i detect a cycle in this so i can use bfs or dfs right so if you remember the fundamental difference between a tree and a graph is that a tree is always not containing a cycle a tree does not contain a cycle but every tree is also a graph basically if you have a cycle in a tree it becomes a graph right and every tree is also a graph so if i give you an example let's say this is node a it is connected with b and it is also connected with c so right now it is a tree right and it is also a graph but if i add this edge it definitely becomes a graph right it is not a tree now because it contains a cycle right so now what is the significance of cycle or how do we detect a cycle so it, it is pretty easy let's say i start traversing this using any algorithm let's say bfs or dfs let's say i start with a and i make a dfs call on its child that is b at b i make a dfs call on its child c and c will now look at its neighbors so it will see okay i discovered a neighbor right now c has two neighbors so one of the neighbor is let's say b right so if c looks at b right b is already visited but is it really a cycle the answer is no i cannot say that this edge is going to create a cycle the answer is no right let's say there is one more edge from c to d c makes a call at d and it visits d is this edge causing a cycle basically the answer is again no right so what is the difference between this edge this edge right so basically before visiting d d was undiscovered d was not visited but b was discovered b was discovered now suppose i create one more edge which is this edge right so if i now c makes a dfs call on let's say a right but as soon as i make this call i see okay i'm landing at a node which is visited and i can say it is a cycle right it is a cycle right so basically what i'm trying to say is that b was also visited d was not visited so here there, we are sure there is no cycle but here the answer is no because b was discovered but it was 
parent of C. It was parent of C. It was parent of C. Whereas from C, when you go to A, A was already visited and A was not the parent of C. A was not the parent of C in the DFS call. So this is the condition that if we encounter a node which is already visited and it is not the parent of the current node, then we can definitely say yes, there is a cycle that is present, right? So let me dry run this algorithm on this graph. So let us create a adjacency list. So zero is connected with let's say one and two. One is connected with zero and four. Two is connected with zero, three and four. Then three is connected with two and six. Then four is connected with one, two and six. Then five is connected with just four and six is connected with three and five, right? Now suppose I start doing a DFS from node zero and I want to check if there is a cycle or not. So I start from this node zero. I said, okay, go and make a call at its neighbor. So one is the neighbor. It is not visited. So right now my goal is to iterate on this, but I make a DFS call on the first node that is not visited. So one is not visited. I go here. Now at one, I look at the neighbors. The neighbor is zero. But if you look at zero, zero is already visited. Zero is visited, but zero is also the parent of one. So hence we have to skip this node. We will not do anything at zero. What about four? Four is not yet visited. So I go and make a DFS call at four, right? Now we come at four. Four is now marked as, marked as visited. One is visited. Zero is visited. Four's neighbor is one. So I will not do any work like C's neighbor is B, B is visited, 4 is, 1 is visited but 1 is parent, so we will skip it. What about 2? Two? 2 is not yet visited, so I can go at this node and I can mark it as visited, right? Now look at 2. Now 2 has a neighbor that is 0. Now this is an interesting case, okay? So 2 has a neighbor that is 0, so I will draw this edge separately. So I'm going to mark this edge in red. So 2 says, can I go to 0? Now what is the condition at zero? Zero is already visited, right? And zero is not the parent of two, right? So basically you are hitting this edge. We will call this edge as a kind of a back edge, right? So it is taking us back in the same path from where we started or to one of the ancestor nodes, okay? So it is an edge from the current node to some ancestor node. Why ancestor? Because if you look at the path that we have traced is zero, one, 4, 2 and then from 2 we are going back, we are going at 0. This is like a back edge, right? Now, as soon as I get this edge, it will be the terminating case, right? So at this point I can directly say without looking at the rest of the graph, yes, there is, there is a cycle. So this is going to return true. Okay, so I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to return a true from this node 2. So this true will be told back to four. Okay. So two will say, okay, that yes, I found a cycle. Okay. So what four would have said that, okay, I do not see a cycle in my, I am not seeing the cycle as of now, but let me call a neighbor and check if it can discover a cycle So two discovered a cycle. So that true is returned to four. Four will also return true. One will also return true and zero will also return true, right? Because it's going to be a stack based algorithm. So this true will be propagated back to the main in this manner, right? So there will be a base case. There will be a recursive case. So let us try to write the code and understand this algorithm in little more detail. So let us write the code for cycle detection. So I'm going to make a Boolean method, which is let's say detect cycle. And here I need to give some source node from where I want to start, right? or you can take zero as well, right? So we are assuming that the nodes are numbered from zero and uh, we can ignore this source. We can directly give zero as well, right? So now, since it's going to be a recursive function like DFS, right? So one thing we did in DFS was we maintained a visited array. So we here, we also need to maintain a visited array that will tell whether a node has been visited or not. 
तो बुलियन विजिटेड दिस इज इक्वल टू न्यू बुलियन एंड द साइज इज लेट्स ए वी राइट सो बाय डिफॉल्ट दिस विजिटेड एरे सेट टू फॉल्स इन जावा सो आई एम नॉट एक्सप्लिसिटली सेटिंग इट एंड हेयर आई कैन से ओके आई एम गोइंग टू क्रिएट अ हेल्पर मेथड डिटेक्ट साइकिल हेल्पर एंड आई एम गोइंग टू गिव इट अ नोड लेट्स अ जीरो एंड आई एम गोइंग टू गिव इट द विजिटेड एरे राइट सो दिस इज this method is just like a wrapper function because we need to create we the visited array and this needs to be shared across all function calls so we are going to make a helper method boolean detect cycle helper it's going to accept the node and second thing it's going to accept is the boolean visited array so now here we will return some true or false right so let's see how this is going to be so first of all when you are encountering a node for the first time so definitely you should mark that node as visited so visited of node this is equal to true next thing you will do is you will iterate over the adjacency list of that node and you will make recursive dfs calls right so let's see how we can do it so just like before we have done here right so i'll show you So you will create a iterator to iterate on that node, right? Or like in DFS, right? Something similar we will do, right? So I'll just copy this node code, and I'll show you what modifications you need to make in the DFS code, right? So here we go. So we have created an iterator to iterate over the adjacency list of the given node, and then what I'm saying, I'm finding out the neighbor, right? so if the neighbor is not visited now here the call will be different okay so if the neighbor is not visited i will go and visit that neighbor and i will also store the result what that neighbor is saying for example let's say one is connected with 2 2 is connected with 3 3 is connected with 4 and 4 is again let's say connected with 1 right so i will make a call at 2 that is the neighbor now this 2 is supposed to return some result back to 1 right So that result can be true or it can be false. So two might have called three, three might have called four, four might have called one. Oh, and here it saw yes, there is a cycle. So true, true, true. That will get propagated back, right? So if the neighbor is not visited, definitely we have to go and check that. Okay, yes, is there a cycle at that node or not? I can say okay, boolean. I can say uh, cycle found. It's something like this. So did it find a cycle in few in 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 that part of the graph right so here i can make a call to detect cycle helper and here i can give the node which is going to be the neighbor and i'm going to give the visited array right now this is like a recursive case you called some node that node said yes i found the cycle so if the answer is true if cycle found is true you can directly return true from this point without iterating on the remaining adjacency list of the current node right and there is one more scenario that can happen outside this if right outside this if so it's it's like a recursive case i have written here so this is like a recursive case there can also be a base case right so base case would be that you are hitting a node which is already visited right so i can say else if visited of neighbor this is true right this is true right and there is one more condition right so i am basically saying something like this one is connected with two two is connected with three three is connected with four and now you said okay i i came to this node i came to this node i came to this node now from four to one there is an edge so as soon as you discover this edge that fine i am going to a neighbor which is already visited and this one is not the parent of four okay so four's neighbor is also three but three is the parent of four so you cannot say about cycle at this node okay but you can say about cycle at because of this edge the four is taking me to the one which is the which is not the parent right so you can say the neighbor that we have discovered is not equal to parent of four but how do we get parent of four that is a question okay, so this is this is the neighbor right so that means and this is the parent so we want that this neighbor that we are discovering should not be same as parent because four's neighbor is also three right if it is three then we cannot say anything right we 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 have to skip this but this neighbor if it is not same as parent 
then yes definitely there is a cycle but how do i find the parent of current node right so that is a question this parent we will have to maintain in the function call by passing one more parameter right so parent and uh, here we have to so when you discovered this neighbor right the parent of this neighbor is going to be the current node right so this will be node so i'm setting the parent here so if neighbor is not equal to parent then i can say return to right since i'm using a else if condition here right so this else if will be only executed if the node is already visited right so if it is not visited it will go here but if it is visited it will come here so that means writing this part is optional so i can just remove this and i can just simplify the condition to be only this neighbor is not equal to parent i'm going to return to but if i come outside the while loop that means i could not detect any back edge right so this is actually the point where we are detecting the back edge back edge and this is actually the recursive case this if condition is a recursive call that's it right so this is kind of a base case that we found a back edge right otherwise if we could not find any back edge we are going to return false from that node. so i think this function looks uh, good to me now we have to give a parent here as well the parent of the source node we can just set it to minus one no parent right and let us dry run this code and let us also test the functionality first so here in the main i have uh, this file so i have created a graph i have done the dfs simple dfs works but now i want to s out uh, about the cycle detection so if g dot detect cycle you can just see out s out yes there is a cycle else you can say s out there is no cycle let's go and run this code so let's see what output do we get so it says yes there is a cycle so i'll show you uh, this is the same graph that we have in the figure so yes it contains a cycle so let me dry run this code for you once again i'll do it on a smaller graph let's say the graph looks like this 0 1 2 3 4 and let's say this is the edge right so you start from 0 so parent is minus 1 so you look at neighbors of 0 right so you said okay visited of node this is true so this is marked as visited then you iterate over the neighbors so neighbors of 0 are 1 to uh, 1 and 3 first we will go to 1 1 is not visited so we may make a recursive call and ask did you find a cycle so 1 is now marked as visited and when i marked 1 so i said the parent of 1 as the node so this was the node this was the neighbor so neighbor's parent is going to be the node so parent is 0 so once parent is marked as 0 and again same story repeats at 1 what do i do i make a recursive call so i ask neighbor of 1 right now 1 has two neighbors one of the neighbor is 0 so 0 is visited but what happens here is this condition true what is the neighbor neighbor of 1 is 0 what is parent of 1 that is also 0 so we do not execute this else if block so we basically ignore this case okay we do not do any work here then we look at the second neighbor so one has neighbors that are 0 and 2 right so nothing happens here what about 2 so 2 is not visited so we make a recursive call right so we go to this node we make a recursive call now 2 is marked as visited parent of 2 is 1 now 2 also has two neighbors 2 has a neighbor that is 1 and it has a neighbor 3 so i do not if i look at 1 1 is already visited right so i come into this else if okay if it is not visited i go here but if it is visited i come here so what is the neighbor of 2 that is 1 what is parent of 2 that is also 1 so this condition is also not true so i do not do anything here so nothing happens here we talk about this edge 2 to 3 so i go to 3 
Now at 3, what happens? 3 has two neighbors, 0 and 4. So I go to 0. Is 0 visited? Yes, 0 is visited. So I do not go into this if block, I come into this else block. What is the neighbor, right? So what is now the neighbor of 3? So the neighbor of 3 that I am considering here is because of this edge that is 0. What is the parent of 3? The parent of 3 is actually 2, right? So they are not equal, yes. 0 and 2, they are not equal. That means yes, return true. So without looking at this part of the graph, 3 returns are true, right? Now 2 got to know, yes, there is a cycle found. So 2 also returns are true. It goes back. 1 also gets to know, yes, there is a cycle found. So as soon as it gets a true, it returns a true. 0 gets to know, yes, there is a cycle, it returns a true back to the main. So this is how uh, this algorithm is working and I hope you understood it. Now we will talk about cycle detection in case of directed graph. So in case of directed graphs, not just the structure of the graph, but the direction of edges also decide whether there is a cycle or not. If you look at this example, the edges are like this. And if you start from A, you can go to B, you can go to C, but from C, you are not able to go to A, right? And of course, there is no loop present here, right? So hence, there is no cycle. But if I change the uh, direction of this, just this edge, I reverse it, right? I can go from A to B, B to C, and from C, I can again go back to a node. I can go in a cycle. So hence, yes, there is a cycle, right? So now, I will tell you, if you use the same algorithm, which you used on undirected graphs, what is the problem you're going to face, right? It's not going to work in the same manner. So let me take up one more example. Let's say the graph is like this. Let's say A. Uh, from here we have B. Let's say C, D, E, F. And let's say this is connected like this. And let's say I have G. And it is connected with let's say C, right? Now suppose you start doing DFS from A and you say if I hit a node which is already visited, I will say there is a cycle. This this is the logic we did in the undirected graph. So let's say you started doing DFS, you started from A, you went to C, okay, from C you went to D, from D you went to E, from E you went to F and from F you cannot go anywhere else. So you come back and you say okay, no, there is no cycle. So you're, you come back, you return false, right? And from E again, you come back, D, you again come back at C and again, you come back at A and from A, you come back at B. Now you go to V, B is not visited, right? From B, you go to G and from G, you go to C and now you see that I am going to a node that is already visited, this edge, right? And it is C, C is not the parent of G. That means I'm going back in the path. But is it really a cycle? My question to you is, is it really a cycle? The answer is no. If you start traveling from A, you can come to C and you can not get stuck into cycle. From C, you can go to E, right? So this is not a cycle or you can go to D, right? Then th go this way. So this is a again a case of non-cyclic graph, right? But if you run the previous algorithm that we executed on a directed graph, it is going to say yes, there is a cycle because from G you discovered a node which is already visited, right? Hence, we need to fix this algorithm, right? So we need to fix the algorithm for directed graph. For directed. Now the question is, how do we fix, right? So thing is, we need to again detect back edges correctly. So from G to C, this is not a back edge. Right? I will tell you what is a back edge in case of a directed graph. The so back edge is an edge that takes you back to from one of the node to some of to some ancestor node in the same path, right? From the current node to some ancestor, right? Ancestor. So let us take take another example inspired from this graph only. Let's say I have A, I have C, I have F, I have D, and I have E, and I have F. Then I have, let's say B, then I have, let's say G, 
and then I'm pointing to let's say C and let me add one more edge in this graph. So this graph, this edge maybe looks like this. Let's say the edge is like this. Do you see a cycle here? The answer is yes, there is a cycle, right? Or let me add two more nodes, right? Let me add a node, let's say H and let me add a node that's it let's say one more node i have added right now in this part of the graph there is no cycle but yes in this part of the graph there is a cycle because you can revolve in this path again and again right so let us try to see what is a back edge in this scenario right so let's say we started doing dfs from a i went to c from c i went to d i went to e from e i went to f from F, I cannot go anywhere, so I will just come back, right? So what is the state of the call stack? The call stack has A, it has C, it has D, it has E, it has F. Now if F says I cannot go anywhere, so I'm go just going to return false. So false is propagated back. Then E says, okay, I cannot go anywhere else, I will come back. D says I cannot go anywhere else, I'll come back. D says I cannot go anywhere else, I come back to A. Now A says, okay, let us go to B. So B goes into the stack. B says let's go to G. G goes into the stack. Now from G I can go to C. C is already visited. But is it a back edge? The answer is still no, right? Because in the current path, right? So if G is giving giving me an edge that is pointing back to one of the ancestor in this call stack, only then it will form a cycle, right? So the answer still here is no. So I will not take this edge. So can I go anywhere else? Okay, so basically what is the condition I'm going to check here. So when I'm checking G to C, C is visited. C is visited, but C is not in the stack. C is not in the stack. That means I came to G via path which does not include C. Okay, it is not in the stack. That is the important condition, right? Now G can say, okay, I, let me go to H. H is not visited, fine. H goes into the stack. Now H says I can go to A. So what is what happens here? We are going to a node that is visited and that is also in the current path, right? That means from H I can go to A. From A if you A again you can go to H. A B G H. So that means these nodes will form a cycle. A B G H, right? What is the condition to detect a back edge? So I will say, okay, in this DFS traversal, this edge from H to A, this is forming a back edge, right? Because I'm going back to one of the ancestor nodes, right? So the condition is from the current node to some ancestor, which is in the stack. We have to check two things. We have to check that this node A is visited and a is also present in the stack a is in the stack right? if both of the conditions are met we can say yes there is a cycle and recursively h will propagate back so h knows yes there is a cycle g knows yes there is a cycle b says yes there is a cycle and a also tells back yes there is a cycle so this is propagated back there is a cycle so again this can be implemented recursively but how do you check whether A is in the stack, right? So we cannot directly look at the recursive stack. So what you have to do is you have to maintain another data structure. Either you can maintain a hash map or you can simply maintain a array, right? So whenever you are hitting a node, you mark it as visited. Okay, so when I hit A, so these nodes will remain visited, right? But when you're going back, okay, when the nodes are getting popped from the stack, you can remove that node from the stack array also, right? So I can simply create an array called in stack. So if you are visiting a node, next you can mark that yes it is visited but when you are going back, you are backtracking for example when you went back from C, you can say yes this node is not in the stack right. So you have to maintain two boolean arrays, one for visited, one for stack while backtracking you will unmark from the un stack array right. So I will write the code first then we will do the dry run but, but I hope you understood the concept. But here, just being visited is not sufficient. We also have to check whether the node is in the stack or not, right? So this is the main tweak that we will use in this algorithm.